Değerli misafirlerimiz, programımız başlamak üzeredir. Hepinizi salonumuza davet ediyoruz. Dear valuable guests, our program is starting within few minutes. We are inviting you to the hall. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome all. Uh, welcome to day three and session eight, halal products in daily life. I would like to invite our respected speakers. Uh, firstly, Professor Dr. Hasan Yetim from Sabahattin Zayim University, Turkey. Can we have you on the stage, please? Our second speaker is Associate Professor Aydoğan uh, Soygüden from RGS University, Turkey. Uh, Associate Professor Serap Kılıç Altun from Harran University, Turkey. Ms. Yas Yasemin Şefika Küçükata, Research Scholar from Istanbul Sabahattin Zayim University, Turkey. Dr. Mian Riyaz, Texas A&M University from USA. I would like to invite our first speaker, Professor Dr. Hasan Yetim from Sabahattin Zayim University, Turkey, to make his speech on properties of kombucha tea and its halal status. The stage is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the audiences, uh, the early morning coming and uh, to listen us. Uh, and also I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving us the opportunity to present our uh, studies in here. Uh, today's uh, lecture, today's uh, subject is the properties of kombucha tea and its uh, halal status. This subject was uh, one of my students' uh, uh, research subject. She could not come here and uh, present her study. Then uh, I will present for her uh, as much as I can. 
And uh, today, uh, what we are going to talk about is that the, what is the kombucha and the chemical composition of that, uh, microbiological uh, properties, and the aim of the research of the study, and the uh, materials, method, and the results and discussion, uh, we are going to give information about that. So what is the kombucha? Kombucha is a beverage produced by fermentation in aerobic conditions. After adding a symbiotic cultures, in, which is uh, composed of uh, bacteria and the yeast, in some cases some fungus, uh, to the solution prepared with the uh, tea and sugar. Uh, the symbiotic culture is called sukubi according to the references, or uh, kombucha culture, kombucha mother, same as the vinegar system. There are many sources of the substrate consumed by the therapeutic purposes with the fungus, uh, and they use as a uh, medicinal uh, with the uh, sensory, different sensory properties. What is the kombucha? It is a uh, Chinese origin beverage, generally consumed as a fermented beverage produced with green tea or black tea or some other uh, components that uh, used for infusion. Kombucha is not a single organism. It is a colony of several bacteria and the yeast. Uh, they are growing in a symbiotic culture and it makes the kombucha uh, a complicated system. The infusion prepared uh, with the tea and sugar uh, to produce the kombucha, this is, this is the main uh, factor in here is that the uh, starter culture, uh, we call it the scooby, uh, it is a symbiotic uh, bacteria and the yeast growing together inside the uh, media and producing the uh, beneficial uh, components. It is directly placed into the freshly prepared infusion that start the fermentation and oxidation. Uh, the duration for the fermentation, it, it's about uh, three to 60 days uh, after the placing into the uh, media prepared uh, before the fermentation. The kombucha has a medicinal properties with a high nutritional value. These properties are occurred by the cultivation of kombucha culture with infusion of uh, tea and some other uh, herbs that used for this purpose. Also, should we include the sugar uh, for the fermentation uh, purposes. In here, that's the, uh, some research uh, has been done uh, about the raw materials and the uh, beneficial com components of the uh, kombucha. Uh, as we see that the, after the fermenta fermentation, uh, these microorganisms are producing uh, different kinds of uh, vitamins, minerals, uh, organic acids, and other uh, valuable components that are uh, beneficial for the human body. That's the reason that uh, in the Far East they are using as a uh, medicinal uh, beverage. From the chemical analysis uh, we searched from the literature, that uh, the kombucha contains numerous organic acids, like uh, acetic, gluconic, gluconic, uh, glucuronic, citric, lactic, malic, tartaric. Yeah, all types of uh, organic acids might be found in the kombucha tea. Also sugars, different uh, uh, sugars and vitamins, and 14 different amino acids, pigments, lipids, uh, proteins, uh, amines, 
uh, hydrolytic enzymes, ethanol. The purpose of in here that we are uh, presenting the paper, uh, it's related with the uh, ethanol content of the product. So the uh, starter cultures, uh, some of the yeast are producing alcohol. Uh, it, it seems to be it's a medicinal uh, beverage, but it, when it's contained the uh, ethanol, it comes to uh, halalness. Uh, it's questioned for the halalness. And the yeast and acetic bacteria, the major organisms responsible from the fermentation. And uh, the several yeast uh, genus or the species uh, in the wide variety found in the uh, kombucha tea. Uh, as we see in here, that's the Zygora, uh, Saccharomyces, Candia, Hanseniospora, Torolopsis, Pichia, Saccharomyces, Lancia, Saccharomyces, uh, uh, Saccharomyces, Clovermyces, you know, different type of uh, uh, yeast and fungus are found in the Sukubo. So my students uh, made a research uh, how we uh, decrease the ethanol content of the product that it is uh, beneficial uh, for the humans. Due to the fermentation step in the kombucha, some alcohol may be produced uh, depending on the conditions. As the level of alcohol rises uh, with the uh, duration time of uh, fermentation, the halalness uh, of the product comes to, comes to the mind that uh, how can we uh, decrease or remove the uh, ethanol content of the product. However, uh, not many studies has been done uh, alcoholic content and the halalness uh, of the product that is being used for as a uh, medicine. According to the studies in the literature, uh, sucrose, sweetened black, and or the green tea extracts is being used as a traditionally uh, for the production of kombucha drinks. In this study, uh, our students made uh, two different kombucha tea they prepared with black tea and the sugar, uh, with the hibiscus and the honey. People are concerned about the halalness, uh, so the ethyl alcohol and the methyl alcohol content of the beverages uh, were analyzed at the end of the uh, fermentation. The comparison with the similar co commercial products in terms of some other quality parameters uh, measured at the end of the uh, research. As a material, as a methods, uh, black tea, hibiscus, sucrose, and honey is you, was used for the research. And what happened? And uh, first they brewed uh, tea or the hibiscus and add some uh, sugar and inoculated with the scoby. You know that uh, scoby is a uh, mother kombucha mother or kombucha culture, we call it. And uh, after the four days fermentation, uh, the sample uh, was ready uh, for the drink or uh, analysis in this uh, study. In the results and discussion, pH of the results uh, compared to the uh, commercial ones, uh, the our uh, hibiscus containing the samples had a lower pH content compared to the uh, commercial ones. Again, the uh, black tea infusion kombucha prepared, uh, they were similar uh, almost with the commercial products. Uh, the, the reason for these changes, the uh, we used the 
uh, honey as a carbon source, uh, which is a complex sugar. Uh, it has a fructose, glucose, and other inverted uh, sugars. Uh, there, there might be the possibility that uh, they might be broken down faster than the other uh, sugars. Sir, you have two minutes left. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, going to finish in a few minutes. And the acidity, uh, we analyzed that the, we looked at the uh, lactic acid and the acetic acid contents. Uh, when we compare to the uh, commercial one, our samples in the black tea, uh, it's almost uh, similar in terms of uh, lactic acids and the hibiscus a uh, little bit uh, higher. And uh, the, in terms of acetic acid, uh, there is uh, some differences, but almost same. Uh, they might come from uh, the uh, formulation uh, differences. Sugar content is, uh, there is a uh, much differences uh, because of the uh, commercial uh, products, they may have lower uh, sugar content compared to the ours. Uh, probably uh, we look at it, some recipes uh, ordered us that the higher content of uh, sugar uh, we found it. The most important content is that the alcoholic contents of the kombucha uh, as we analyzed in the uh, gas chromatography AF FID detector, uh, the alcohol contents of the kombucha samples uh, measured is an ethyl and the methyl alcohol. Kombucha produced with the black tea and the sucrose had an uh, 0.08% of uh, ethyl alcohol, and there was no uh, methyl alcohol according to the results. Uh, neither ethyl alcohol nor methyl alcohol was detected in the kombucha tea uh, prepared with the hibiscus. Although the kombucha products have functional benefits uh, began to attract the health conscious consumers, not many studies and publications found uh, about the halalness of the product. So, the much research is needed uh, on this subject. Hibiscus and honey might be a good starting combination uh, as neither alcohol, uh, ethyl alcohol, nor methyl alcohol was detected in our samples prepared with the honey. And the bioactive properties of the honey and the hibiscus containing samples needed also to be studied uh, further to find out the, their properties. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the listening my uh, presentation. Assalamu alaikum. Aydoğan Soygiden from RGS University, Turkey, to speak on examination of halal status of sports supplements. The stage is yours, sir. Everyone, uh, welcome to Halal Submit. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to present examination of Heral status of sports supplements. And uh, Heral sector uh, continues to grow rapidly around the world. One of the most important issues is in the halal sector is halal food. Uh, recently, consumers prefer foods with halal food certificate. Uh, in the sport industry, uh, sports sub, uh, support products are used by professional, amateur, and at least and other people doing sport for health. 
The uh, availability and use of supplements as, as ergogenic aids have risen uh, dramatically in the past decade. Despite over 50 years of research, the fields of sport nutrition continues to grow and in rapid rate. Some survey have indicated that approximately 50% of the general population, 76% of college uh, athletes, and other 100% of the bodybuilders take supplements. The products appear on the market every week, but evidence about their effects on performance is limited or not clear. Although the energy needs of athletes vary, uh, vary according to age, gender, physical activity level, and amount of energy consumed, the basic elements that all athletes should pay attention in their diet. To ensure uh, adequate consumption of energy and nutrition for the continuum of health and performance, uh, creating continuity in the body fat and lean mass percentage specific to, to the branch, optimal uh, recovery after training, and it is maintain the fluid balance. Athletes spend most of their time trained to improve their performance. Indeed, great efforts are made to train. Correct nutrition is uh, great importance in order, order not to waste this effort and provide high level efficiency in training. In addition, the use of ergonomic aids has become widespread in recent years among athletes of different levels of increased performance and achieve success more easily. The use of some uh, materials, methods, and uh, other than natural ability and training to increase sport performance is called ergogenic assistance. Uh, the importance of the research in the study, it is important to determine halal status of sports supplements and to make an awareness in halal sports supplement consumer. Uh, purpose of the research, this study purpose was to examine the ingredients Containing in sports supplement and halal uh, certification status. Uh, method of the research in the study, necessary literature study on the subject has been carried out. Halal certification status of sports supplements products sold on the internet website and market has been investigated. In this study, only Turkish sports supplements market were researched. The study includes only companies that sell online sports supplement in Turkey. Uh, in table one, examining the halal status of website, 25 different companies, and 68% of online sites no mention halal or not. There is uh, sports supplements selling on the market, but 68% of them didn't mention halal or not. 25% of online sites has figure no pork, no pork item included. And 0.4% uh, of online site, halal logo included, but no halal certification. And also, company has, uh, only one company has own, com uh, own product and halal certification. Uh, in table two, uh, research result made in the title of Herald Sport Supplements products in four major internet si sales sites, the sport online sales in Turkey are giving. Uh, I only take four uh, major market, and only one product, uh, protein powder, is selling uh, with halal certification. I mean, when I do my research, I put halal uh, certification protein powder or halal certification sport supplement, I put on the, uh, their website. But only one products, protein powder, uh, three of them, the same company, Heartline, the name of the company, has uh, halal certification, and only protein powder and, uh, be become a result. Uh, halal certification is yes. Halal logo, there is no halal logo on the products. Uh, only it is written on the product that it is a halal. Uh, 
Uh, one of the study made in, in Turkey in uh, 2014, uh, the result of the questionnaire on the use of sports supplements product applied to sports science faculty students. In this study, 92% of the students state that they use sports supplements products. Also, study state that 100% of those who use sports supplements product state that they use protein powder. The rate of those using amino acid was 31%. Uh, glutamine, 17%, Li, uh, L, carnitine, 15%, BCAA, uh, 13%, CLA, 8%, caffeine, 6%, nitric acid, 6%, arginine, 4%, creatine, 3%, steroid, and other similar, uh, 3%, uh, it, it showed on the study. This study made on 2014. There is many uh, research uh, on the market, but this is the closest time. That's why I put it here. Also, uh, this is the uh, internet sales sites. They are all individual company. All of the names up, up there. Uh, according to the study, 18 sports supplement website sales companies were mentioned on the website, didn't mention halal. According to the study, Seven sports supplement websites, sales companies were mentioned on the website. Uh, only no pork product included. According to the study, only one sports supplement website sales company had Helal certification. And only one sports supplements website sales company had Helal logo, but no Helal certification. This is the uh, list of the sports supplement sales in Turkey many different products. Almost 100% of the sport products, sport supplement, imported from USA, Germany, Poland, and other countries. Almost 100% from uh, different country. There is the only company, the Heartline, uh, they have Helal certification. I only find on the website in Turkey. Uh, Uh, with almost 20 years of experience, Kavi Gıda has established in Turkey Heartline Nutrition in 2003. And this is, uh, I got this information from their uh, website. We are the only sport nutrition brand in Turkey having halal products. Uh, the raw materials, we occur, are screened uh, meticulously to ensure they are in line with Islamic rules and international standards with regard to their microbiological, physical, and chemical composition. They also, uh, they got some quality and safety uh, license. And also uh, on the last page, uh, the halal criteria of our product are inspected by Kaskert, which is accredited to Jakim, Malaysia, one of the most reliable halal food certification institution in the world. And uh, I mean, when I see this, uh, one question comes come to in my mind. There is a, in Turkish also halal certification company, I just wonder uh, why they don't, they don't take from in Turkish Helal certification uh, company. There is a CIMIC, there is also Helal uh, HEC, Helal accreditation organization, but they got from Malaysia. Uh, in the sport nutrition industry, there are certain ingredients that carry in the risk of violating Islamic rules. Uh, this is also uh, company website information. Uh, in the same way, our amino acid products are obtained from plants and have halal certification as well. And initially, the gelatin used in our capsule products are obtained from halal kettle and do not contain pork-related ingredients. And there is uh, more information is here. This is the uh, company uh, all license. I got this from uh, company website. Sorry, you, is, sorry is, you have two minutes left. Okay. Thank you. This is also uh, products. When I see the day, Heartline products, I didn't see any Helal logo. There is only uh, mention uh, in the website, it is Helal certification program, but I don't see any uh, halal logo, but should be halal logo with there. Uh, 
Okay, this is the, all the supplements uh, in the world, the selling uh, companies. This is the all sports supplement. This is the uh, Helal Trust, one of the other Helal certification uh, organization. Uh, I got this also, this information from their website. This is the uh, products they give Helal certification. Okay, uh, this is the, uh, some of information like this is creatine halal. Creatine is organic acid of nitrogenous base found in the muscle of animal and also uh, uh, precursor of gelican uh, glycine amino acid. It is halal only if obtained from halal zabiha animals. It could be from pork or beef muscle. Uh, and also other question, are supplements is halal? Uh, vitamin and dietary supplements contain ingredients that may not be halal. Gelatin is very common ingredients used to make capsule. Halal amino acid, generally speaking, as you are not likely to be intoxicated by the amino acid produced, many amino acid supplements such as BCA, EAA, and single amino acid supplements are considered to halal. And also I want to mention that the logo, this is a no pork item, uh, in Turkish consumer, that is misunderstanding. Usually people, when they see that sign, people thinking that is halal, but it's not true. That is also misunderstanding in Turkey. Uh, this is also uh, whey protein. Uh, many uh, sport athletes and other people using protein powder. Uh, whey is actually by product of cheese, which may or may not be halal because of the use of Rennet in uh, cheese making. Muslims think that if there is a milk-based ingredients, then it has to be halal, but this is not true. Muslim consumer group, I, I, they also I, I found out on the internet, consider lactose halal only if it's halal certificate. Uh, this is the uh, another uh, misunderstanding when I do my research on the website. Uh, some product mentioned about that approved from the Republic of Turkey Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. Uh, some people, I mean, some company put that uh, uh, leather in the products. That is, uh, they also Turkish consumer misunderstanding that uh, mention. Uh, people thinking when they see that that is halal, but it's not true. The approved from Turkish Republic of Turkey Ministry, that's only, uh, there is no, uh, I mean, the food products is good for the health. I mean, there is no anything chemical or other uh, uh, stuff in the product. That's not meaning is halal. That's also mis misunderstanding. This is the uh, table is growing how the sports supplements to using around the world is grow uh, very rapidly. And in uh, academic studies in Turkey, at least nutrition appear to be high use, considering the studies 80% of the professional at least use at least nutrition supplements. The primary purpose of at least is using nutrition supplement is to increase their sport performance. However, at least do not know much about the contents of nutrition. At least nutrition general consists of products produced abroad. In this study, only one sport supplement producing company in Turkey is seen to be seem to have the halal certification. And in Turkey, more sports supplement producing companies should be established. These companies are recommended to take part in the sports supplement produce sector by producing the substance in the sports supplements product in accordance with the halal standard. It is uh, recommended to reduce the dependence of sports supplements pro uh, product sector to up approach. Okay, this is another uh, research. And thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Aydoğan Soygudan. Now we would like to uh, invite Associate Professor Serap Kılıç Altun from Haran University, Turkey, to talk about analysis of e-coded food additives in delicatessen products labels within the status of halal food. Ms. Sarab, the stage is yours. 
much. And first of all, I'd like to thank to all organization committee. Uh, it's a great honor uh, for me to present in World Halal uh, Summit. And uh, I want to say welcome all our participants uh, to Turkey. Uh, my presentation title is Analyzes of E-coded Food Product Levels uh, Within the Status of Halal Food. Um, my name is Serap Kılıçaltun. I'm an academician in Haran University. And this is my contact details. Uh, let me start my presentation. The increasing need for food uh, due to the rapid rapid increase of the world population, the development of technology. Pardon. Sunum formatına getirirseniz. There is a technical problem, I think. Ee, sağ alt köşedeki slide. Sağ alt köşedeki. Ben de öyle şu anda. E, o zaman şey, biz... Ama... Oldu mu şimdi? Yok, Efendim? olmadı. E... Serap Hanım, sağ alt köşedeki slide işaretini bir daha tıklayabilirsek. Evet. Okay. Yok olmadı. Çift ekran varsa diğer ekranı da gösterin. Is it okay? No. E, durdurup tekrar stop share and share screen. Let me do again. Is it okay? No, uh, no. If you want, we can share from here. Evet, biz... I couldn't see the uh, slides. You can see from Zoom.
I would like to thank our listeners for being patient. We are facing some technical, pro technical problems right now. It's going to take a few minutes. The development of technology and the increase in the tendency of people to ready and long lasting foods with the change of food demand have increased the use of food additives. Food additives are defined by the Codex Alimentarius Commission as follows, uh, which is not used as a food alone, whether it has nutritive value or not, is added to foods for technological purposes in manufacturing, processing, preparation, application, packaging, transportation, storage, or which become a direct or indirect components uh, in the food uh, characteristics. Next uh, slide, please. We can classify the food additives uh, as antioxidants, uh, uh, forming agents, preservatives, and etc. There are a lot of uh, food additives uh, according to their uh, purpose of usage in the foods. Uh, yes, next uh, slide, please. Uh, the source of food additives and the way they are obtained are questioned by people primarily for religious reasons. Muslim societies do not consume certain foods and additives added to them due to their religious beliefs. And the uncertainty of which raw materials the food is produced from poses an important problem for consumers with religious sensitivity. Especially the food additives should be uh, checked religiously. Next, please. Uh, the word halal is an Arabic origin word, which means not contrary to the rules of religion, uh, not prohibited in terms of religion in the Dictionary of Turkish Language Association. Halal food refers to foods that are allowed to be eaten and drunk in Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, the purpose of these restrictions on nutrition brought by the Quran to Muslims is to protect people's health. Consumption of food products that will endanger people's health is considered as non-halal or haram according to Islamic religious rules. Next. The halal and uh, haram are understandable in among two of them are doubtful. Food additives are considered halal as long as they do not affect human health negatively, as long as they are herbal or if they are obtained from animals uh, that are halal to be eaten in accordance with religious rules, according to Islamic methods. It must not have been obtained from the prohibited substances mentioned in the Quran and Hadith Sharifs and must not be uh, genetically modified. The word uh, halal on food additives and foods has become a reason of preference for non-Muslim consumers in terms of hygiene and health. For all these reasons, it's very important to have a halal certification to inspect food companies by an impartial institution to confirm that they are produced in accordance with halal standards and uh, to provide a certificate of halal. The official international standards by the Standards and Meteorology Institute for the Islamic Countries, SEMIC, the Affiliated Institutional Organization of Islamic Cooperation, have released a standard general requirements for food additives and other added chemicals to halal food in 2020. The halal status of some food additives was determined in the standard uh, in general the requirements. Next. Aim of this, uh, my uh, study is to identify those suspected to be halal, uh, doubtful or non-halal among e-coded additives on uh, meat product levels. Next. Uh, in the material and metal section, 
my research is an observational descriptive study and in the study the food group to be included in the research was determined the labels of the products in the determined food group were examined the e codes on the food labels were listed and whether these e coded additives are halal or not are classified uh, within the scope of the study, the label information on meat products on sale in five different markets in the city center of Şanlıurfa were examined. Food levels of 122 products from different brands were examined. The names of the brands whose levels are examined were not included in the study due to the ethical principles. In this figure, we can see the distribution of samples by product groups. In totally, uh, 122 samples levels were examined, and the samples are uh, sujuk, uh, salami, sausage, uh, meatball, uh, and the other seafoods, and etc. The next slide, please. In the results, uh, we can see the distribution uh, in the table. Please, next slide. Uh, in this table, we can see the number of products with doubtful E codes. The most common food additive is uh, E250. Uh, and, uh, okay, E250, it is in. Uh, 86 products. The second most common food additive is E300 uh, in uh, 60 levels. The third most common food additive is E301. Uh, uh, it is in 33 levels. Uh, then uh, sodium lactate E325 in uh, 23 uh, levels. Sodium diacetate in 23 levels, carrageenan in 12 levels, capsicum bell pepper extract in 5 levels, sodium citrate in 5 levels, glucono delta lactone in 4 levels, guar gum in 2 levels, uh, sodium bicarbonate in 2 levels, xanthangum in 2 levels, and the non-halal food additive E120 carmine uh, in 11 uh, levels. Uh, and uh, in this graphic, we can see the frequency of doubtful food additives in beef meat products. The most common is 250 uh, in 52 products. Next, please. Uh, in uh, chicken meat, uh, the most common food additive is 252 in 19 products. And the next, please. Uh, in Turkey meat products, E150 most common two in 15 products. Uh, the next, please. The most common uh, E100, uh, E250 sodium nitrate coated uh, food additive uh, is widely used as a preservative in meat products because it combines with the myoglobin in the meat and provides the formation of a bright pink uh, red color specific to processed meats and the protection of this color. It also prevents the growth of Clostridium botulinum bacteria, which is very dangerous for human health Besides this, it also has functions to prevent spoilage and stabilize the structure of the product. Unfortunately, many scientific studies have been carried out on sodium nitrate, its carcinogenic effect, and its use has been prohibited in uh, many countries. Next, please. Ascorbic acid with the code E300 which is the most common in beef meats, is used as an acidity regulator in meat products. But synthetically produced ascorbic acid is dangerous for human health. E301, the sodium salt or ascorbic acid, also prevents nitrosamine formation in meat and is also used as an antioxidant. 
but its synthetic production is risky uh, for public health too. In this graphic, uh, we can see the frequency of doubtful and non-halal food additives in fish meat products. The most common uh, doubtful food additive is 160 in three uh, fish meat uh, products levels. Uh, next, please. E160C, paprika extract, is the most common additive in seafood in our study, and it's obtained from the kernels and seeds of red peppers, uh, but it can be mixed with gelatin. For this reason, its use as a food additive is uh, prohibited in Australia, uh, but not uh, the other countries in the other countries. Uh, in Turkey, we are using E160C2. Uh, next, please. Ma'am, you have two minutes left. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, please. E120 uh, Carmi, uh, non halal uh, food additive, which is frequently used in meat and delicatessen products, is a controversial substance. Carmine derived from insects, so it's a food additive or animal origin since it's produced. It is free to use in Turkish food legislation and is considered non-halal according to the SMIC. In addition, this additive is stated on the Halal Malaysia site to be non-halal only for those in Hanafi Fika and doubtful uh, for others. Next, please. In conclusion, uh, the use of food additives, which may adversely affect human health as a result of the analysis of international food organizations and reliable laboratories, uh, should be prohibited by the governments. Uh, this should be done for the purpose of protecting public health and not just only for religious reasons. Food additive lists of various institutions and organizations that issue halal certification around the world should be uniform. And for this reason, food scientists and religious authorities should do more scientific work on the standardization of halal additives using systems such as listing and uh, coding, uh, for example, QR coding companies with halal food certification by the certification institutions, whether the manufacturers have the certificate should be made clearly visible to the to the consumers. Uh, it is not uh, only for Muslim societies, but only uh, for human health too. Thank you for very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, our respected speaker, for uh, being on World Halal Summit stage today. Now, I would like to invite Ms. Yasemin Shafika Küçükata, research scholar from Sabahattin Zayim University, Turkey. Welcome. Stage is yours. Firstly, I want to thank to the organization for giving us this opportunity to share our study. And also I want to thank to my dear Professor Hasan Yetim for his support for this work and for being the best teacher. Today I will talk about uh, traditional fermented coffees and their halal status, kopiluvak and black ivory. Coffee is one of the most appreciated non-alcoholic drinks consumed in the world. It is considered the most important process product after petroleum with an annual turnover of Six, uh, 362.6 million US dollars. Its leading production region is Brazil. Coffee is an important agricultural pro product in the world with a 950 million tons production per annum. 
Among all the species, coffee arabica, also called arabica coffee, and coffee canafora, also called robusta coffee, species are the largest part of the world's production. Arabica and robusta coffees have some differences from each other that are those. Uh, Arabica coffee can grow on high altitudes while robusta can grow low altitudes. Uh, coffee Arabica has sweet, fruity aroma while coffee canafora has cocoa flavor. And in total production, Arabica coffee accounts for approximately 60%. Robusta coffee accounts for approximately 40% of the total production. production. The main producing countries of Arabica coffee are Brazil, Ethiopia, Southern Sudan, and Kenya. The main countries of Robusta coffee are uh, West Africa, Uganda, and the Republic of Congo. However, it has also been reported that the coffee is being produced in nearly 70 countries around the world now. Coffee Arabica is used usually for filtered coffee, Coffee Robusta is used for espresso coffees. Coffee production techniques are classified by the methods used to separate uh, outer layers surrounding coffee bean. In order to obtain green coffee beans, coffee fruits are first subjected to pulping and then drying stages. The green coffee beans then subject to the ripening process, which is up to a total of 12 weeks. Coffee bean has seven layers, and to get the green bean, at least four of the layers should be removed. Coffee beans uh, are obtained by one of the three main processes. Beans are cold after the methods that is used. The coffee beans are produced by the dry process method are called natural coffee. Wet process beans are called washed coffee. The alternative method of the semi-dry process method is used as a mixture of both other process methods. The beans of Brazilian Arabica coffee and West African Robusta coffee are generally processed in dry process. The coffee beans are separated mechanically or manually according to their size and then roasted in a cooking chamber. Then the roasted beans are ground to the desired size. Once harvested, the coffee beans are referred to as green coffee beans because of their color that appears during the drying. Immature seeds create a bitter taste in the final product. For this reason, after the coffee beans are harvested, immature beans are removed and then the coffee beans are classified according to, according to their size. The classification steps also determines quality of the coffee. The chemical composition of coffee beans varies according to the type and agricultural practices. The most important compounds in the coffee beans are chlorogenic acid and acids and their isomers. Caffeine, the main stimulant co component of coffee, is a powerful, addictive, and active ingredient. Its concentration in coffee pulp and shell is around 1%. 0.3%. Trigonelline is another important coffee alkaloid and it is responsible for strong coffee odors such as pridin and pyrrhos. The aroma of coffee comes from also Maillard reactions, caramelization and some other thermal reactions. As in other agricultural products, the microbiota of coffee fruits consists of various bacteria, yeast and molds. The fermentation is a natural process that occurs spontaneously regardless of the process method that is applied. One of the important biochemical reactions that take place during the fermentation of the coffee beans is the degradation of the mucilage by some microorganisms. Fermentation has a great role in formation and development of aroma and flavor as well as removing, removing mucilage. Surprisingly, coffee consumption continues to increase all over the world with different production and processing systems. Some fermentation and drying techniques are developed to improve the quality and market value of the coffees. One of these techniques is bioprocess with the digestive system of some animals. The most known bioprocess coffees are Kopilovak and Black Ivory coffees that are produced by using live animals. Kopilovak is also called civet coffee, is produced from the gastrointestinal tract of musk cats in Indonesia. And 
Black ivory is obtained with the same way from the elephant's gastrointestinal system in Thailand. In this study, we aim to emphasize on ethical and health status these two local coffees fermented in the gastrointestinal tract of some animals. These two coffees uh, are the most expensive in the world. One kilogram of civet coffee is $600, while one kilogram of black ivory is $1,100. The coffee beans consumed by these animals cannot be digested in the alimentary tract, but they acquire a unique taste and aroma as a result of the various reactions in the intestinal system. It has been reported that the fermentation process carried out by the hydrolysis of proteins in the digestive system, which reduce bitterness in the beans and create a more aromatic coffee with low acidity. As with Kopiluwak coffee in black ivory, the coffee beans the, that leave the gastrointestinal tract of those animals are separated from the feces and then cleaned and roasted after drying. Other than the ethical and hygienic concerns that have been highly controversial, it is not easy to control the fermentation naturally takes place in the gastrointestinal tract of animals. Halal and ethical studies of coffee is originating from the digestive system. In Islam, there are some rules to regulate edible and drinkable matters for the Muslim consumers. For example, the words halal and haram are the Islamic terminology used in the Quran to designate the categories of lawful and unlawful, unlawful affairs or things. Especially for Muslim consumers, a food or drink produced under these conditions brings great concerns in terms of Islamic rules. Food and drinks that come from a non-halal source or that are produced by adding haram ingredients are religiously considered as haram. Any contamination of something that is impure according to Islamic rules makes that clean thing questionable. In the verses 168 and 172 of the Surah Al-Baqarah in Quran, Allah commands us to choose the ones that are pure and clean from sustenance that Allah created. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. O people, eat the lawful and pure things in the earth and follow not in the footstep of Satan, for surely he is your open enemy. And in the 172, Allah commands us, believers, eat of the pure things wherewith we have provided you for sustenance and give thanks to Allah if it is him that you serve. In addition, in Islamic sources, halal and haram are obvious. There are some suspicious things between the two that are not exactly halal or haram. There is a hadith about that says, both halal and haram things are obvious, and in between them there are doubtful. So whoever forsakes those doubtful things, lest he may commit a sin, will definitely avoid what is clearly illegal. And whoever indulges in those doubtful things bravely is likely to commit what is clearly illegal. If one or more of the production stages of the food have scientifically proven negative effects on human health, the consumption of this food is also against the Islamic rules. These negative effects can seriously impact people's spirituality and their body as well. In addition to hygienic uh, and ethical concerns, the coffee beans obtained from the feces of animals may give consumers some feeling of disgust. Other than those mentioned earlier, these fecal coffees bring many other questions. For example, the authenticity and certification. It is known that 80% of Kopilovak coffees sold in the market is imitated. Another issue for Kopilovak coffees, which are considered to be original, is that sweat cats are exposed to living in condition, conditions that may violate animal rights by the coffee producers. The production of these coffees is considered unethical since these wild animals are captured, detained in a cage, separated from their ecosystem, and forced to eat only coffee beans. Again, it is important to discuss 
and evaluate these issues in ethic committees. In conclusion, it cannot be said that the coffees harvested from animal feces such as Kopilovak and Black Ivory coffee are strictly halal or haram, but they are doubtful. It is known that they are produced using the digestive system of some wild animals. Although they are cleaned before consumption, it doesn't make those coffee beans completely safe to consume by Muslims. New methods in fermented coffee production should be researched and sensitivity of the believers and ethical concerns need to be observed. Because those wild animals are captured, detained in a cage separating from their ecosystem and forced to eat only one food is considered unethical. Hence, imitation alternatives of these types of regional coffees might be produced to police, philotherians and Muslim coffee addicts. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much for your valuable speech, Ms. Yasemin. Now, uh, we are connecting to the USA. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Mian Riaz from Texas A&M University. Doctor, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Let me open up the presentation and I will be ready in one second. Just give me a few minutes. Okay, I assume you can hear me and you can see my slides. Yes? Yes, we can see. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, first of all, thank you very much, uh, organization committee for the invitation. And uh, it is 2 a.m. in Texas. Assalamu alaikum, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'll be giving an overview about food additives in the halal food production. And here is my contact information in case anybody want to contact via emails or WhatsApp. The outlines are basically what are the food additives? I heard quite a few talks this uh, morning. What are the source of food additives? And then what is the market? Why we use food additives? Are all the food additives are halal? Are they are not halal? Some of the example of the food additive which may be used as a hidden sources. And of course, what are the control for the halal food additives? How can we make sure that our food is halal? First about uh, the use of food additives have become very, very prominent since we see a lot of foods uh, in the grocery items, which you can see here are already been processed, convenience. Consumer want the food which has been prepared for long-term use. And that's why we see a lot of uh, uh, food additive being used in the food industry. The what to the FDA, Food Drug and Administrations, any substances that we use to provide a technical effect in the food. And then what is the technical effect? That may be that we are trying to preserve the flavor, that maybe we are trying to improve with taste, nutrition value, appearance, freshness, and safety. It could be these additives of some of the chemicals. They can improve the texture, the color, and consistency. And we heard yesterday and we day for yesterday, we heard again today, there are more than 3000 food additives. And there are data books, books on books on the food additives that are being used in the food industry. And therefore to make it easy, the food industry have grouped them in different categories like we have here, anti-caking agents, bulking agents, emulsifier agents, you know, can see a sweetener, stabilizer, thickeners, flavors, flavor enhancers, anti-forming agents, acids. If you can see the different groups that we, you would find easily different classification. And if you look in the market, the reason I want to show you that, that food additive is going to grow. It's not going to have less uses in the future, it's going to have more uses in the future. If you can see here in 2024, it's going to be 115 billion US dollar market. And you can see that 
35 billion is going to be only in the bakery and confectionery. And you can see also here in this case, you have a lot of uh, people are using in Asia, in Europe, using it also in North America. Therefore, there are quite a few different uh, places that people are using them. And therefore, this is going to basically grow that one. Therefore, we need to pay attention. And where is the growth? The most of the growth is going to be, if you can see here, in the beverage industry, it's going to be in the bakery industry, in the dairy, in the snack, or in the meat, or some other miscellaneous food. Therefore, my point here is that there will be more uses of food additives all over the world, and we need to make sure that we are using it halal food additives. Are all the food additives are synthetics? No. There are some natural, there are some nature identicals, and there are some called a synthetic. Nature addi uh, natural additives are basically that we extract something from the nature. For example, we have a beet root. We can extract the juice and we use that color and that color will be used in different foods such as sweets and some of the dessert. Then we have a nature identicals. That means that we find them in the nature, we become synthetically like acid that we can use that ourselves. Then we have 100% artificial additives. Example is acetylcarbonamides. It's a flower improvers that we use that in that bread industry all the times. That's 100% artificial. Therefore, to make it easy, there are natural, there are natural identicals, and there are artificials. Therefore, don't take it granted that the natural will be halal, or artificial will be halal, or nature identical will be halal. We need to see their source, how they're being made, and where they are coming from. As a consumer, have no idea when they buy this food, the, what kind of additives are being used, and why they are being used. I mean, I'm sure I talk and teach food science students. Even the food science students have no idea why these additives have been added. An ordinary consumer have no idea that why they have been adding so many additives in it. Once again, because they provide a very specific function. A food, to buy the food which can last us for a week. If they help us to increase the shelf life the growth, they change the appearance of or the taste, and they help in processing and binding. We saw very first day an example of Brother Muhammad Ali Sheikh. He showed the peanut butter that if you make it at home, if you make it with that, uh, some additives in it, it will be much smoother textures. It has a much, much better taste. And also, people use additives to make their food more attractive. They make look like more fresher and a lot of, uh, they provide the attractiveness on all the candies, all the gummy bears, you see that, that make attractive. But at the same times, there are the food industry in different parts of the world, they abuse these additives. They use these additives to color something. They use these additives to make the fake meat. I'm sure everybody seen this news some time ago that there was a pork, by adding the additives, they turned into beef, therefore, these things will happen. And then of course, we have again, we just heard it. We heard also on the very first day from Sheikh uh, Muhammad Ali, there's controversial additives such as carmines, uh, because this is the carmine which give you very deep color in the food. It is uh, obtained from the cochinels. It is still controversial. Almost 80% of the halal certified bodies are accepting this one. And I heard from a brother uh, on first day, the CIMIC has also revising their standards. I'm not sure if they're going to revise the carmine as well or not, but I heard that they just updated their standards. They are revising it so they can make sure that it can be used or not. All these food additives are safe, or they are not. Some of the food additives are banned just because they have some safety issues. They may cause cancer. They may cause obesity. And with the increased use of the additives, you will see it every single day in the food. There is a lot of level of safety. And there are a lot of legislators in different countries 
who regulate their uses, how much they can use it. In the United States, we have a call generally gross list, generally safe. Therefore, they will put the additives in that gross list, which can be used, which cannot be used. If you can see here, we had a beet juice, anatos, beef, beet powders, I mean, it's lactic acids, size salts, flavor enhancers, natural uh, sweeteners, pectins, vitamins, all they are in generally recognized safe list. And we can use that one, but you have to be very careful. We just heard previous speaker also, there are some issues for the safety and for the health of different people. And also this is to give you some details why we use them. Uh, we have anti-caking agents such as sodium aluminum silicate used in typical in salt. We have bleaching agents we use in the flour. We have chelating agent we use in the dressing mayonnaise. We have clarifying agents we use it in the fruit juices. We have conditioning agents we use in the flour. We use emulsifier in the ice cream and the mayonnaise. We have a labeling we use in the bakery product. We have moisture controls uh, we use in the marshmallow, pH and stabilizing and thickening agents. We use that all in different application. Therefore, we cannot make a food like very nice and attractive as here you can see a fresh, unless you use these additives. Therefore, there is no reason not to use it as long as they are halal or they are not halal. What are the source if they pose any safety issue or not? Then of course, we heard again in the EU uh, because of different languages, they have an E number status. And of course, uh, they have grouped them in different numbers. And uh, you can see here all different classification because of the times I will not go through there, but you see all these here are uh, different classification and you see that they have classified that. Therefore, the question come is, are all the food additives are halal? Some of them are halal. Some of them are not halal at all. And some of them are dog food. Therefore, if you have this bowl of cereals, there are so many E numbers, consumer have no idea which one is halal and which one is not halal. How do we know that? We have to figure that one out. And then of course, we do have a halal certified. Uh, also where you will find a proper halal logo and you find a proper halal certification for that. And then of course, we have some example of, again, more example of doubtful food additives. Uh, for example, we have L-cysteine that is most commonly used in the bakery industry as a food additives. And basically this is made from, of course, either human hairs, we heard that are the duck feathers. And this is a use in the dough conditioner, but we have this one also as an artificial and it is halal certified. Therefore we need to figure it out what uh, things we're going to use it if they are halal source uh, if they are certified halal, uh, where they're coming from. Then in this complex world, in globalized world, we have so many hidden ingredients, hidden food additives that laws tell us that we do not have to label them. Okay. And because of it's very hard, a traceability where it was processed, how it was processed, because we have so much haram material in this world that we can use that haram materials to make all kinds of additives that we need it. Therefore, how do we know that? How do we trace that? How do we go back and find out what is the source? If they've been used from a, some kind of a human-based materials, are L-cysteine being used? Are they using a, some of the Hummer materials, or some of the pig materials, or some of the non-slaughter animals, where they have used, how they have got that one, because this, universe is full with the materials that are being used in the food industry. And sometimes we get fooled because we get the chemicals and we think these chemicals are 100% halal because you never know what are the sources. Maybe they have used the enzyme from the pig and that enzyme have been used in the industry and then has been processed. And then of course being cultured and you make a hundreds or hundreds of different chemicals, their status is doubtful. We do not know how they are processed. You will find it most commonly in the bakery industry. Sir, they you have two minutes releasing left. Agents. Sir, you have two minutes left. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. They have releasing agents. They use it, which is hidden. They have anti-foaming agents. They have bleaching compounds. They have food grade lubricants. 
they have you spray that all the times all they contain some additives we have a flavor enhancers how a comparison will know that we have enzyme as a processing aid and there's a lot of enzyme we use is from the pork we have some edible coating that may contain some additives we have gum base gum base may contain some additives but a lot tells us you can only put their word called gum base we have packaging materials in some of the packaging materials we have maybe additive used in the plastic bags we have using some of the coating so we have some waxes and coating that applied into the plastic bags there are a lot of hidden additives we have natural flavors yeast extract you can see the samples here uh, example here because they tell you what is there but they don't tell you what are the flavor enhancers are uh, here is another example you can see the herb extract yeast extract flavor enhancer what are the source this label tells us natural flavors yeast extract spice extract what is the sources therefore what is the solution the solution is that we want to make sure all our additives uh, not only which is comes uh, very clearly but all the hidden one especially the releasing agent foaming agent filtering agent bleaching compound flavoring enhancer packaging material greases has to be halal certified and recently smic has released their gender requirement for the food additives and other food additive chemicals in 2020 in july and the purpose of this smic is that we have to guide the food industry which food halal additive can be used as a chemicals as uh, this cannot be used there and the only solution i see that we have required detailed specific information from there we need to get them make sure they are not doubtful and also it is also we need to find that if they are halal certified or not therefore to summarize that uh, i will say that several food additives can pose an issue for the halal halal certification for all these additives is a must that's the only solution uh, we need to work on these issues so that all the muslim make sure they eating the halal food with that thank you very much appreciate your time and if there's any question i will be happy to answer that thank you very much thank you so much doctor for being here at world halal summit stage today and now i would like to have a short question answer session if you have any questions If there is no questions, then I would like to invite Mr. Zafer, Zafer Soylu, the chairman of Halal Accreditation, Halal Accreditation Agency, Turkey. Uh, can we have you on stage, please, sir? Now we have a plug giving award. I would like to invite our speakers. Thank you, uh, Yasemin, Mr. Yasemin Shafika Kichukata, for being here on World Halal Summit stage today. We would like to thank Associate Professor Aydoğan Soydugan from RGS University. Thank you for being here today at World Halal Summit stage. And it's an honor for us to have you, Professor Dr. Hasan Yetim from Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University. Thank you so much to our speakers and thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are giving a short break now for 15 minutes and we will be back with session 9. So uh, see you after a while.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to session 9, Halal Pharmaceuticals. For this session, I would like to call our speaker's name one by one, starting from Dr. Mo uh, Dr. Mohammed Ali Al Sheikh Weiss from SMIC, Mr. Fazal Rahim, Executive Assistant from Sanha Halal Associates Pakistan, Associate Professor Dr. Aldin Dugonic, CEO of, CEO of Center of Halal Quality Certification, Croatia, Ms. Rozaitul Akmam Osman, CPA, Halal Subject Matter Expert from Malaysia, Professor Dr. Zari Ismail from University Science, Malaysia. Welcome on stage, sir. Now I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Mohammed Ali Al Sheikh Weiss from SMIC, to make his speech on halal pharmaceuticals. How many standards are needed to regulate the many different types of pharmaceuticals? Welcome, sir. The stage is yours. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Halal Pharmaceutical Session. Uh, my name is Muhammad Ali. I am a doctor in, in uh, clinical pharmacy, working in CIMIC in the last three years. So as you know, uh, CIMIC established Halal Pharmaceutical Technical Committee uh, almost uh, one year and a half ago, and uh, this technical committee responsible to produce uh, halal standard. And until now, we didn't produce anyone. It's in process. So uh, I will try to speak about this committee and how many standards we can produce and uh, how many standards we need to regulate halal pharmaceuticals. So to tell you the truth, I don't know how many standards we need to produce. And I don't know how many standards to regulate all of these uh, halal pharmaceuticals. But we need to answer some question. I will tell you some question. We, uh, uh, we, we meet this question during the working group discussion for producing this standard. Who will take the medicine? For example, human or animals. As you know, uh, veterinary uh, medicine is part of uh, pharmaceuticals. And a lot of animals is taking uh, antibiotics and vaccine. Shall we consider this thing as halal pharmaceutical? We discuss this point in the technical committee. Is it necessary? Because there is different category of, of medicine. There is pres prescribed medicine, which is prescribed by a doctor, and this one, have an uh, important role in saving the life. And there is some OTC drug, over-the-counter drug. And this drug is, uh, anyone can buy. Uh, there is a uh, dietary supplement, which is less need than uh, usual medicines. So the fiqh opinion, according to different uh, need, will be different. Uh, is it food or medicine? Um, as you know, there is medicine and there is dietary supplement. There is another uh, term, nutra nutraceuticals, uh, the things which, uh, natural things would have some effect on our uh, body like medicine. And also, uh, in every country, there is regulation, uh, regulator bodies responsible for uh, giving the license. So who will give the license? The Ministry of Health or Ministry of Trade, uh, Agriculture Ministry, all of this is different from one country to another country according to this product. And also, if we are going to discuss this standard in CIMIC, we will discuss in TC1 or TC16, in the halal food issues or in the halal pharmaceutical issues. This is also another question. Uh, how about this product, different kind of product? For example, uh, medical gases, medical devices, uh, sutures, we use it in, in the operation, 
the medical sponge that we use it in the operation, all of these products contain some doubtful material sometimes. So who will regulate this one? It will be under Halal Pharmaceutical or Medical Devices a New Committee? This is also, this question still discussed until now in, in the Technical Committee. So I will give you now general uh, information about the current situation of pharmaceuticals around the world. Not halal pharmaceutical, pharmaceuticals. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is one of the highly regulated industry in the world. That means there is many license, many regulation the company should take it before produce anything. This is to save the health of the people and the well-being of the public. Usually, you cannot produce any uh, pharmaceutical product without GMB certificate. And when this product is herbal, you have certain kind of standard. When it's medicine, it's higher standard. When it's biotechnology, it's higher standard. When it's vaccine, it's very high standard. So is it unified around the world? Is all halal pharma, uh, all, is all, uh, all pharmaceutical unified around the world? All standard unified around the world? There is three organization try to unify the standard around the world. The ICH, you can see the long name, International Council of Harmonization of Technical Requirement for Pharmaceutical for Human Use, ICH. These people, they are working in the QSEM, Quality, Safety, Efficacy, they have some guideline for this one, and they have member from all over the world. For example, the Turkey is member in this one. Uh, Malaysia is observer in this committee, so they have member in from all over the world. Uh, there is the BICS uh, scheme, pharmaceutical inspection cooperation scheme. It's another organization focus more on the GMB guideline. Also, they are covering another part in their guidelines. There is many other organization. They have international effect on the, uh, on the pharmaceutical regulation. For example, uh, the World Health Organization, European Medicine uh, Agency. We have the Pharmacopia, the USB Pharmacopia, the Bridge Pharmacopia, and also the Food and Drug Agency in uh, US since it's the bigger uh, producer in the world, so uh, their rules usually apply by other countries. So, how about ISO? Is there any ISO standards related to pharmaceutical? ISO is not working that much in, in pharmaceuticals. Until now, the most important ISO standard related to pharmaceutical is the ISO IDMB identification of medicinal products. Uh, this is standard published in 2016, and it's become compulsory in Europe and some other countries. Uh, for example, uh, it's uh, give information about substances, pharmaceutical dose form, units of presentation, rules of administration and packaging, units of measurement, uh, regulated medicinal uh, products information, and also for pharmaceutical product information. Okay. So until now, there is no unified international pharmaceutical guideline. There is some organization working on this one. Let's come to the halal pharmaceutical. Uh, if we try to categorize uh, pharmaceuticals, we will have these categories. Um, all of these pharmaceuticals, biological blood, uh, blood uh, products, cosmetics, dietary supplements, uh, medical devices, radio pharmaceutical, herbal medicine, and veterinary drugs. This is the, the part that we study when we go to pharmaceuticals. All of these products, there is hundreds of products or thousands of products under each category. So the most critical one in the red color, the biotechnology product and the blood product. They have many non-halal and doubtful material inside it, and it's need to be checked uh, from the halal certifier, and it's not easy to check all of these uh, things. In the second uh, part, there's dietary supplement excipients, and others also they have doubtful material inside it, but it's less comparing to this complicated one. 
uh, from point of view of the dosage form. The dosage form is how you take the medicine, not what inside the medicine, how you take the medicine, cream, ointment, subsidiaries, uh, uh, elixir. So this is a list of some uh, high halal critical uh, dosage form. For example, when you buy cream, capsule, or gel, there is more chance to have non-halal uh, product or doubtful product inside it. In the next uh, level, there is elixir, shampoo, and substitutes. And the other types of dosage form have less uh, non-halal product inside it. So let's speak now about the available uh, regulation in OIC countries. We should speak about our organization and give you how the situation now, how uh, TC16 will work, and what's the difficulty with TC16. Uh, now we have four countries. They have halal pharmaceutical standard. Malaysia, Brunei, uh, Pakistan, and Indonesia. We have three countries which have regulation for borsine in, food, uh, in, in medicine. They don't have a standard, but they have some regulation that they should check if there is borsine in, in some product, like Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, we have five countries which they have their own pharmacopoeia. Pharmacopoeia is a book contain all standards related to uh, pharmacy. So we don't have uh, publish standard one by one. We publish all of them in one book. For example, U.S. pharmacopoeia is around 4,000 medicine standard in one book. British pharmacopoeia is around 3,200 uh, uh, pharmaceutical standard in, in one book. So for Islamic countries, we have only five countries. They have their own pharmacopoeia. Uh, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, uh, Iran, Egypt, Turkey, and Pakistan. Unfortunately, these uh, pharmacopoeia are not updated for a long time. For example, the Pakistani and uh, the Egyptian one not updated for more than 15 years. The Turkish one is, uh, is almost translation for the European pharmacopoeia. They don't have many details about halal uh, pharmaceuticals. Sir, you have two minutes left. Thank two you. Two minutes, okay. Okay, and we have <clears throat> country with vaccine industry, OIC country with vaccine industry, 11 countries. They have uh, one factory or more for vaccine. But to tell you the truth, all of these uh, vaccine uh, manufacturers produce one vaccine or two vaccine maximum. We have only one country with many vaccine producers, which is in Indonesia. Okay. So what's the problem we have it in TC16? Uh, the first problem is the regulation body is different than CIMIC member body. In Indonesia, for example, Indonesia FDA Baden Bom is responsible for food, uh, for uh, pharmaceutical regulation. But our member is BSN, Malaysia, uh, Indonesian Standard Body. Uh, in Malaysia, this uh, body, in Turkey, the Turkey Elaj Vetub Jihaz Koromo. But our member in Turkey is TSC. So our member should contact this organization and they nominate someone to attend the technical committee and they give their opinion because our member is not the responsible one in, in his country to give the opinion. Unfortunately, some members, some member countries, they don't have good relationship or not good connection with their government bodies, so it takes long time to get uh, this uh, communication. So how CIMIC trying to solve this, this problem? Uh, CIMIC involved in the international, uh, first international meeting of the head of national medicine, medicine, medicine regulatory authorities uh, of OIC countries. This is two years ago in, in 2018. And also we involved in the workshop uh, done at the beginning of this month. So in general, CIMIC try uh, to be involved in the meeting of the national uh, medicine regulatory bodies in OIC countries. And also, every time we ask our member uh, to communicate their uh, responsible body, uh, government body, to join the expert in the technical committees. 
The second problem we meet it in TC16, uh, that's medicine manufacturer and the expert are not involved in the committee discussion. Uh, our member, they send their uh, staff, not the expert people, and usually they are not from the industry. And in Halal Pharmaceutical, we should bring the industry people to the uh, meeting. So how we do solution for this one? Uh, now, Mr. Ihsanovot, in, in the last a uh, few meetings, he announced every time that we should do mirror committee in each country. So the mirror committee, uh, they discuss the issue, they discuss with the factory in this country, and they send us to the committee the result. So this is the collective uh, opinion of this country. And also the liaison. Any organization want to cooperate with CIMIC, they can rule, uh, read our rules about liaison and they can apply officially to be a member in the committee if they uh, fulfill the criteria. For example, some organization like a university, uh, a non-profit organization in this field, they can join a CIMIC committee as, uh, as an observer and they can give their opinion. And the last thing, the lack of expert and expertise. Uh, because we need a lot of uh, expert people in fiqh and also in the technical things. Uh, anyone who tell you that he is expert in this thing in all pharmacy, don't believe him. If you are expert in vaccine, you are not expert in dietary supplement. If you are expert in this field, you cannot cover all field of uh, vaccine, of uh, pharmaceutical. So we need experts from, from these countries. And there is a lot of experts from Muslim countries. For example, the one who invent the uh, COVID vaccine now is a Turkish guy living in, in uh, Germany. So we have Muslim experts, but we need to contact them and the government should uh, bring these names to us. So we welcome anyone to join our working group. And this is the time where CIMIC uh, give more important to the working group of expert working room, not officer working group. So what's the answer for the first question? As you see, there are many difficulties we have it in TC16. Uh, this industry is very big industry and need a lot of standard to be produced. We invite all our members and all experts to contact CIMIC officially to work on this field, inshallah. Hopefully at the end we will have some good book like this one, the Pharmacopoeia uh, for Halal Pharmaceutical. And Prof. Zahari, he will have a special speech at the end of this session about Halal Pharmaceutical. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Doctor, for your valuable speech. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Fazalur Rahim, Executive Assistant from Sanha Halal Associates, Pakistan, on his speech, Ethanol. Halal Industrial Guidelines and the Acceptable Limits in Halal Products. The stage is yours, sir. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah waliyihi wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathiran kathira. Honorable Chair, distinguished guests, esteemed participants, ladies and gentlemen from around the globe attending this event through online medium, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is indeed an occasion of joy and a matter of pleasure and privilege for me to be a part of this honorable, dignified, learned and mannered gathering. Such kind of activities not only enhance our knowledge, but more importantly, provide us the opportunities to understand the different scholarly opinions from the global scholars and to understand the difference of opinions from amongst the scholars, which is supposed to be a roadmap towards a common destination. And then particularly in the present atmosphere and circumstances which are surrounded 
and clouded by the uncertainty due to the COVID-19 to organize such an event is no doubt a glorious success. Therefore, I would like to thank, congratulate, and appreciate the organizers of this event, particularly the dynamic leadership and the management of OIC CIMIC. Ladies and gentlemen, since intoxication is one of the main reasons and causes of strict and absolute prohibition in Islamic jurisprudence. Therefore, whenever the subject and talk comes around this subject, it attracts the attention of the people. Today, we are going to explore this subject by the brief history of human consumption of alcoholic beverages so that we come to know that how long human being is consuming the alcoholic beverages beside the fact that the divine religions have banned it in every era of human life. And then the brief history of the discovery of ethanol so that we come to know that ethanol as the principal intoxicating agent in the alcoholic beverages was discovered after a long, long time. And then, no doubt, the divine principles and rulings in the shape of Islamic jurisprudence laid to us in the light of Quran and Sunnah, and then the multiple uses of ethyl alcohol, particularly its use as food additive, and then the most important portion of this uh, presentation, the blood alcoholic concentration on which the uh, permiss permissible content of alcohol in halal products is dependent. And then, ladies and gentlemen, we will be concluded this presentation. So, from the Mesopotamian civilization, which is supposed to be the civilization of 10,000 BC, the Western civilization, the Western Asian civilization, the very, very old and far away human civilization lied in the deep roots of human society, of humankind. So from them to the Egyptian civilization, to the American civilization, to the Greek civilization, and to the Roman civilization, and then particularly to the Asian civilization. And in the Asian civilization, the Indus Valley civilization, the Maya civilization, the Maunju Daru civilization, every civilization contains, unfortunately, the consumption of alcoholic beverages. Now, the point is to be noted that in all this ancient era, human being was ignorant of the ethyl alcohol being the principal agent, uh, uh, the intoxicating principal agent in the alcoholic beverages. Now, what was the major sources at that time? Among the cereals, barley and wheat for the beer production, and amongst the fruits, grapes and dates and palm for the wine production. Ladies and gentlemen, ethanol was discovered by the grace of distillation process, particularly in the 12th century. And in the discovery of ethanol, the Muslim scientists like Jabir bin Hayyan and Razi have a magnificent role, magnificent and rich contribution in discovering the ethyl alcohol as the principal agent in the alcoholic beverages. And at that time, ethyl alcohol was used for the medication purposes. So Jabir bin Hayyan, he invented the equipment known as alembic. This was, at that time, the equipment used for the distillation purposes. And following his footsteps, Arazi and then Al-Kundi and then their students, they kept on going the footsteps of Jabir bin Hayyan and they discovered and the ethyl alcohol as the principal intoxicating agent. So they contributed in this regard. That was the golden era of Muslim scientists, the golden era of the Muslim ummah, and the golden past of Muslim ummah. Ladies and gentlemen, now, up comes the divine injunctions. The religion of Islam strictly banned, absolutely banned, the consumption of alcoholic beverages. 
द लास्ट इंस्ट्रक्शन कमांड एंड इंजंक्शन लेड थ्रू द लास्ट डिवाइन बुक कुरान करीम थ्रू द लास्ट प्रॉफिट हजरत मोहम्मद सल्लाम टू द ह्यूमन काइंड अल्लाह सुबहान तोक्लेम्स इन चैप्टर फाइव थ्रू वर्स नंबर नाइन्टी आरूजिल्लाजीम बिस्मिल्लाजीमीन फशतन The translation has been exhibited before you, and it has been taken from the renowned English translator Pictal. Now, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has used the term "khamr" for the prohibition. Now the question arises that what is meant by khamr? It has been discussed among the Islamic jurists, and they have their different views. on this subject let's have a look on them first of all we are looking the opinion from abu hanifa nu'man bin sabit rahimahullah he is of the view that the word khamar is referred to the alcoholic beverage made of grapes and dates so this is his principal stance on the terminology of khamar and his argument construction is based upon the hadith exhibited before you and also the linguistic reference to this word khamar linguistic usage at that time in the time of arab when this revelation was revealed to the last prophet blessed prophet muhammad peace be upon him so this is his point of view let's have a look on the others the view of maliki shafi and humbly schools of thought they are of the view that the word khamar is a general term for any intoxicating beverage made either from grapes dates i mean they are of the view that regardless of the source every intoxicant is khamar and since every intoxicant is khamar therefore every intoxicant is haram and najis both so this is the view point of these schools of thought and i my kiram rahimahumullah rahmatan wasi'a now from the shia ulama from the ulama of ahl at-tashayyu they are of the view that every liquid intoxicant they are almost in line with the maliki shafi and humbly schools of thought when they say that every liquid intoxicant is both haram and najis haram for internal use and najis for the external use then they are seem to be absolutely in line with the schools of thought maliki shafi and humbly rahimahumullah now ladies and gentlemen let us have a look on the crux of these view points let us look have on the summary of these view points according to abu hanifa alcoholic beverages made of grapes or dates is khamar and when it is khamar it is absolutely haram forbidden for the internal intake and najis absolutely filthy for the external touch and the alcoholic beverages derived other than these two is haram for internal use as long as intoxicate someone and not najis for the external use the other view point is the strictest one they say that every intoxicating beverage every intoxicant is khamar and since every intoxicant is khamar therefore every intoxicant is haram and najis haram for the internal intake najis for the external intake i would like to draw your attention here today as a feed additive ethyl alcohol is vastly used in the halal food industry and after some slides we will be discussing the bac level and the permissible alcoholic content level in the end food product that concept is actually based upon the view point of abu hanifa nu'man bin sabit rahimahullah that he gave us 1400 almost 1400 years ago and that is beneficial even today we are benefiting by that view point today in our halal industry because when we permit ethyl alcohol because 
what is the status of alcoholic beverage is same is the status of ethanol because ethanol is actually the principal intoxicating agent in the alcoholic beverages so what will be the status of alcoholic beverages same would be the status of ethyl alcohol uh, with these uh, islamic scholars so this is the crux of the point of views that have been laid down by these uh, uh, prominent islamic scholars and the islamic jurists now ladies and gentlemen uses of ethanol we are uh, concerned more concerned with the use of ethanol as food additive because we are going to allow and simic in its standard in food additive standard has already allowed with some strict conditions the limit of 0.5 to be used uh, and uh, to be traced in the end product so we are concerned with this the OIC CIMIC in its general requirements for food additives and other added chemicals to halal food allows the use of alcohol in dissolving some food additives with three strict conditions. First of all, there must not be any alternative, there must not be any substitute for ethyl alcohol. The usage of ethyl alcohol will be, would be necessary, so you, can, will be, you will be using the ethyl alcohol. Then, it would be used in the minimum amount required to dissolve the chemical. And number three, the alcohol amount shall not cause euphoria to the person who consumes it. I mean, the blood alcohol concentration level must be, must not exceed 0 0.05 and the content of alcohol in the end product must not exceed 0 0.5. So these are the three strictest conditions with which CIMIC standard in its uh, clause allows the use of ethyl alcohol as food additive in the end product. And then, as I, as I already said, that this concept, the concept of permission, is based upon the viewpoint of Abu Hanifa Norman bin Sabit. Here again, the CIMIC standard clearly says, clearly proclaims that the standard, that it also must not be from the source of grapes or dates. I mean, the, the permitted alcohol which has been permitted must be from the sources other than grapes and dates, not from the grapes and dates. And uh, the GSO is all, has also done some work on it uh, as far as the uh, natural alcohol in the food product is concerned. And uh, their work is uh, almost, uh, I mean, um, is being considered by the CIMIC under TC and the work is going on. This is their work for uh, the different food types, different uh, ethyl alcohol uh, limit has been exhibited here for the grape vinegar 1%, for the other 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0 0.5. You can see that almost the maximum uh, alcoholic content level is 0 0.5 apart from the grape vinegar where it is 1% but it is being considered by the CIMIC uh, TC and uh, soon uh, some uh, conclusion will be done inshallah. BAC, the blood alcoholic concentration, it is actually the presence of alcohol in the blood streams of humankind. Uh, highly a technical topic to understand and highly a technical topic to address and to present. But one thing we can remember very easily that 0 0.05 is the level of blood alcoholic concentration on which con uh, intoxication is not possible, on which intoxication can be avoided by the human being. So blood alcoholic concentration can be varied from the person to person depending upon multiple things, just like the age, like the weight, like the sex, like the liver functions, like the type of food he intakes with alcohol, and like the time since he drinks, I mean the intervals between the drinks. So blood alcoholic concentration, uh, this point is to be noted that 0 0.05 level of blood alcoholic concentration uh, on this level, intoxication is not possible. Sir, you have two minutes left. This, Thank you. Okay. This is the formula given by the Windmark formula, and uh, this, is, this formula is that blood alcoholic concentration is equal to 
the uh, is equal to the number of onuses of the ethyl alcohol uh, taken by men or women multiply by a constant for men it is 4.75 for women for men it is 3.75 and for women it is 4.7 multiplied by uh, divided by the weight of the person so from sober from so sobriety to the death these are the multiple stages of the blood alcoholic concentration i mean we can say that on sobriety level the blood alcoholic concentration is less than 0.05 which we already mentioned and this is the point which we can relate also with the drinking of nabis as well that has been narrated by the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his multiple narration in one narration he quoted one night and the other narration the blessed prophet narrated three nights so the food scientist and the related scientists can relate these things with the geographical changes with the weather change and these kind of things so the point is to be noted that on sobriety level the blood alcoholic concentration is less than 0.05 and then it increases from euphoria to excitement to confusion to stupor on stupor level one will start stupid things under the effect of intoxication and one can die also can go to the coma also as the blood alcoholic concentration will increase these things will be happening the same thing in this slide as well you can see sobriety it is 0.05 0.05 as i already mentioned that at this level intoxication is not possible and then this slide is also very important you can see above 0.05 blood alcoholic concentration level and it can be achieved uh, if a glass of 270 ml 900 glasses are taken with the alcoholic content of 0.01 then you can you will be reaching the blood alcoholic concentration of 0.05 which is almost impossible because you cannot take 900 glasses same you cannot take 200 glasses same you cannot take 90 glasses so same you cannot take 19 glasses look at the 19 glasses 0.5 so this way we prove that 0.5 ethyl alcohol content in the food product is safe as far as the intoxication is concerned and ladies and gentlemen we are going to conclude it uh, with with this conclusion that first of all 0.5 is Uh, allowed allowed by the semic standard and is safe as far as the intoxication is concerned and secondly as we mentioned earlier the view point of abu hanifa noman bin sabit that he is of the view that other than grapes and dates other than grapes and dates if the alcoholic if the ethyl alcohol has been derived from other than grapes and dates then that will be disallowed from the level if it intoxicates and above the level and below the level it is not disallowed so the muslim scientists can come forward can experiment in their labs and can relax this uh, uh, this level uh, 0.5 uh, furthermore i thank you all ladies and gentlemen for your patience and for your toleration thank you very much assalamu thank you so much mr fazal rahim for your valuable speech Now we are connecting to Croatia. I would like to invite Assistant Professor Dr. Aldin Duganić, CEO of Center of Halal Quality Certification Croatia, on his speech, How did we forget halal as a universal medicine? Dr. Aldin, uh, the stage is yours. Assalamu alaikum, do we hear? Everything is okay. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Welcome on stage. Okay, thank you, dear ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings from sunny Zagreb, from Croatia. Unfortunately, due to the restrictive measurements, we couldn't travel to Istanbul, and I was so very sad. But inshallah, next year we will all come and share 
our experience. Of course, I also want to congratulate to the organizer of Sixth World Health Summit with all these measurements that we have and restrictive. It's very hard to organize something, but in this way, we are trying to, to do something around the, the world. Also, special thanks to the project team, especially Ms. Dilek, who is coordinating all of us, of our speakers, and God bless us all. So my topic that I want to present today, which I called how did we forget how as universal medicine is not actually something new. It's something that all Muslims around the world actually knows. But the problem is that we are forgetting the things and uh, the problem is, are we really implementing that in our life? These are the, some things that we always need to think about. So the only fact that we all know is that we are going to die. That's the only fact that we know other facts actually we, didn't, we don't know. We are trying to investigate or, or do, do something. So we actually should start living. So this is the, the most important thing if we are waking up every day that we need to be satisfied and trying to do our best in our life. These days, you know, too much, too often is telling to us that we are living in some kind of new normal. Actually, what is that new normal? Who defined that new normal? Uh, did we ask ourselves, is it maybe that before that we are living, is that was normal or is it this normal? So these are the things that are always making some confusion to the people. Even the scientists are giving us many opinions and uh, People are very confused uh, today, which is actually normal in big crisis like we're having now. So for me, this new normal means that we need to take more of our health, more making prayers, taking care of the people that need our help, and that we re-examine our life, our goals, our targets. Uh, for the Muslims, there's many answers in, in, in the Holy Quran or other sources of, of Islam. I just mentioned this uh, verses from Sula al Bakr, but very showing us that we are going to, through all our life, we are going to have some things that we need to take care of it and see what are the best possible uh, solutions. And as we know, as a Muslims, our imperative in Quran is Ikra Bismirabiki, so that we always need to learn something new, making some research and trying to find the, the best uh, solutions. Actually, when we uh, analyze Islamic uh, regulation, especially the terms uh, of halal, we will see that there's uh, many things which are actually preventive for our health, for, for our life. And always it's the things are in the prevention. So we don't need any kind of pharmaceuticals if we are doing uh, many things in prevention. So today, uh, the most things also, which is very important if you are a believer is to believe. If you're not believing, what, what is going to happen uh, with you. We saw many examples, especially in medicine, when we are giving the, the placebo, that we having some kind of miracle, miracles recovery from the people who get the placebo. What is actually happening? Because he was believing that he's uh, taking some pharmaceutical or some medicine, he is cured. How is he cured? Because he was believing. Today we know that if we are believing that our cells are working totally different and that is everything is our uh, perception in, uh, to our human body and to our be behavior. Actually, the, we always can help ourselves in, in the best possible way. So very important things is actually how do we live and what do we believe? Because people today are believing in, in many things. Second is prayer. If you are just observing the, the prayer to, to its psychical requirements, we will see that we are having 25 di different movements and that we are having this psychical movement. Also, also, if we are praying, especially in the morning prayer, we need to get up earlier. So we go uh, to sleeping earlier, which is very important for us because today we don't know there's uh, much scientific evidence. If we are sleeping well, that we are repairing ourselves. So our body is prepared 
and this is the way how we are re repairing. So it's calling repair mode. If you are not sleeping well, then something is not good with you. If you are not uh, getting up, that you are not rest and that you are, cannot take care of your day, then something is not good with you. You need to uh, go to check your blood, blood and other things. Third, which is very important, is also patient summer. I don't know how do we forget on, on this, because in more than 70 times it was mentioned in the Holy Quran. I think that we are living in time today that we are always afraid that we are going to miss something. Even the attendants on this conference are now looking, many of them are looking on their mobile phones because they are afraid that they will miss something. So this is the, the things that we actually we need to change if we want to be more in reality, not in virtuality. So the patient is very, very important in our life, especially if we are having some illness. The fourth is hygiene. You know, when this pandemic starts, they are trying to teach us how we need to actually wash our hands. So if you are just looking on evolution, we will see that, that we are washing so, so the the, the things that is that is uh, need to be watched. The fifth is fasting, especially in the month of Ramadan. Even if we know in the practice of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was other uh, fasting things. Today we know that it's self cleaning, but unfortunately, just in 2016, the world became aware of what is really fasting when the. Japanese scientists get the Nobel Prize for it, for, for the process of autophagy, or he called it the, the self-cleaning. So this is the also very important things to clean ourselves and to fast when whenever we can we can do it. And the sixth is halal food and the, the nutrition, because as we see that it is the most important thing is also what are we eating and how are we eating. To then scientific evidence is we have more than 70 70 percent is uh, halal food and halal nutrition is very important for for for our health. So we can see that in halal food and nutrition is defined actually what we eat, how we eat, when we eat, how much we eat, with who we eat, where we eat, how we treat the rest, and everything. So in the preventive things. If you are consuming the halal food, you, you don't actually need to worry about that you're going to be infected with some disease which can be from, from animals. As a conclusion, halal is a guide to the Muslims and to all, all, all other people who want to follow it. It's proactive and preventive in relationship to, to our human health. The disease and treatment must be viewed holistically not just taking a magic pill and that you're expecting that you're going to be a cure. And the end, I'm asking myself and all of you, how did we forget about all of these things? Why, did, why don't we have more research about this? Why we are just expecting that we are going to have some vaccine for this pandemic? Because in the future, we can expect more and more uh, pandemics because of the way uh, we are living today. Why we don't have research about more about black seed, about vitamin D, and what are other things which are especially important uh, for for our immune system? Because even we have the vaccine today. If you are not having a good uh, immune system, we will see there are so many side effects that can actually harm to you. So I was uh, very fast in this presentation, trying to be in this uh, 12, 15 minutes that they told to us. I'm open for any question and thank you for your attention. Actually, it took less than 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Huwala. Um, I would like to invite Ms. Rosia Tul Akmam Osman, CPA, Halal Subject Matter Expert from Malaysia. Ms. Rosia Tul Akmam, Salamat Datang. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you once again for your kind introduction. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala sadina muhammadin ashrafi al-anbiya wa al-salim. Wa ala alim wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi zidni ilma. 
Oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. First of all, thank you very much uh, to SMIC and the, for organizing this Wuhanas Summit 2020 and the organizing committee too, for accepting uh, my paper uh, and inviting me to this virtual conference. I've got uh, 15 years experience in uh, halal, but alhamdulillah, before that, years exposure on accounting accountants that we have 24 seven with us, I use the professionalism uh, to further strengthen my uh, halal capabilities and uh, share it within the industry to strengthen its integrity. Alhamdulillah, during this journey too, I managed to uh, network with a lot of people and um, all learned or knowledgeable and I gain wealth of knowledge from them and I'd like to acknowledge and appreciate Jazakam Bahai. One of them is my former boss, uh, Mr. Leonard Arif, which I got the opportunity to interview in a talk show somewhere in July this year. He mentioned about respecting, uh, that manufacturers should respect us as patients, respect our belief so that we can take their drugs long term. So with that, um, it gave me an idea to write this paper of stakeholders' role in instilling respect towards informed decision on halal pharma. A mouthful? <laughs> yeah. So I outlined it in this manner so that um, we can have a better, a clearer understanding of this part. But first of all, these four words are well known. They are originating from foreign languages and um, non-English, but they give good vibes whenever we mention them. Halal is also a non-English word, but as for me, I get mixed reaction whenever I first mention it to anyone, be they Muslim or non-Muslim. And this make it harder or when I was given the task to spearhead halal for my former company and inevitably Malaysia, because as I shared in uh, my presentation in 2018, halal pharmaceuticals has this imbalance impact as shown in the graph. You have the stronger fear, panic, opposition, and rejection about um, medicines because it's perceived as non-halal or haram. Uh, but on the other side, you have the lacodicetal attitude. A uh, study has found that um, people doesn't want to take halal pharma. Uh, why? Why should they take? So because of this imbalance, it's still persistence. We can see it um, happening even this year when this COVID-19 uh, vaccine starts to be in the picture, which makes me wonder, where did we go wrong uh, in understanding halal? So I'd like to go back Halal 101 because I feel that we need to learn and learn and relearn halal a bit, just a bit. My favorite ayat, Al-Ma'idah verse 88. Most of us, has already been familiar with the word halal and toiban in this ayat, which means lawful and permissible. And alhamdulillah, through these uh, past uh, sessions, I noted that a number has already uh, acknowledged the coined word toiban, that means safe, effective, quality, and hygienic. I introduced this term in the 2018 um, seminar, and uh, is now widely used, alhamdulillah. And the word uh, that the Arabic term is uh, generally uh, translated is eat. But I like the word consume. I prefer the word consume because it's wider. It covers eat, drink, ingest, and buying goods or services. So that's why now our halalan toiban uh, atmosphere has expanded beyond food and beverages. Another point of this ayat is that Allah has provided all this for our sustenance, meaning we need to be strong and healthy. So uh, Prof. Eldin has mentioned a few uh, points just now, which I totally agree. 
goes back to eating halal halal and toyiban food first before we look into medicine. But all these are for one purpose, preservation of life, which is in line with our makasit sharia. So, short um, overview about the halal certification um, is that I learned um, it has three key bases, subject, source, and process. And this um, infographic by our uh, Prof. Yaakob Cikman slowly depict uh, about being able to certify and ensure have assurance right from the source of origin up till it reaches the consumer. Are the sources halal and toyban? But another part that we should take heed of is that whether there's any halal risk of contamination, cross-contamination, adulteration, counterfeit. A simple case study, bottled water. People were wondering why uh, Malaysia give a halal cert on bottled water when they're Allah's creation is already halal. The source is already halal. But has it got the approval from Ministry of Health? Is it approved um, source by the local water authority? You legally, legally obtain the, the water? That's Toyiban, right? So in the process, there's also element that um, can be made from non-halal materials, such as the filters. The second ayat, uh, the second part of the ayat clearly shows that everybody in the ecosystem, we call it the stakeholders, which I also ex explained in 2018, has to be performing with integrity and excellence. So there you have it, a complete halalan toyiban ecosystem as decreed by Allah in one ayat. So, how does it apply to halal pharmaceuticals? Do you need, really, really need halal certified pharmaceuticals? First of all, pharmaceuticals are substances we are, which are taken into the body. So anything that's taken into the body needs to be halal. So medicines are produced in a very complicated uh, value chain. And some of the elements that I learned uh, during my uh, tenure in halal pharmaceuticals is that there are similar elements of uh, halal and pharma. One, highly regulated, they have GMP, and they also apply pharmaceutical quality system. Another common word uh, in halal is alcohol. Uh, Mufti has mentioned about it uh, a lot just now, but <laughs> I think we need to find another word for that because even the non-Muslim got confused with alcohol, and you see this headline, it's... Um, from US, four people dead and three blind after drinking hand sanitizer. Why? Because in the hand sanitizer, there's supposed to be alcohol. Well, I've totally unlearned this word from uh, Prof. Zol uh, when he presented this in 2011. Alhamdulillah. Other words or other elements that are beneficial for halal certification, of course, is pharmacopoeia, which uh, Dr. Ali has mentioned earlier, and Prof. Zari will elaborate further later. And one more element, which is called pharmaceutical quality by design. That means built in. This term, Alhamdulillah, Prof. Zari has uh, introduced it way back in 2016. Hala built in, not tested for. And Alhamdulillah is being incorporated into the uh, Hala Malaysian Standard Revision 2019 in the food, uh, cosmetic, pharmaceuticals, and the new B medical devices. So it involves not only the halal certificate holder and the halal certifier, but also other, com uh, other entities such as the approval and licensing uh, agencies. It has the technical terms, um, technical uh, references, technical documents that you need to uh, use to refer to so that it's highly professional. Alhamdulillah, last night uh, in Malaysia, uh, yesterday evening, uh, we heard about some technological advances that can further increase the integrity and excellence in HALA certification. I feel that um, from the uh, introduction of this HALA built-in, the incorpor incorporation of it involving a load, whole load of uh, 
ecosystem, you know, slowly things are being weeding out, you know, like the counterfeits and all those. Halal, but not necessarily halal certifiable. These are some of the terms that are being uh, quoted uh, in the halal vaccine news. I won't dis deliberate on it further, but I give you an example. Um, this one was in 2008, where um, we had an uh, issue about vitamins, uh, oil-based vitamins. So my colleague, Dr. Azizi Ayub, did uh, an analysis and come up with this uh, infographic. So, you know, there is possibility of non-halal element being introduced into a halal source. So in Malaysia, halal certified pharmaceuticals um, give a double assurance to uh, the consumers because it has the toyaban aspect being a, a vouched by the uh, ministry, Ministry of Health, and then other government agencies, Jakim, gives the approval for halal. And in Malaysia also, you can't apply for halal certification if you don't pass the toyaban site. Double assurance. And therefore, if pharmaceutical quality system is value added with halal assurance system, you get halal pharmaceutical, halal certified pharmaceuticals. But um, it can uh, be. And, uh, Tuan Rosie, kamu yeah. awak dua minutes. Okay. <laughs> Terima kasih. Um, yeah, thank you. So, uh, it's a Kaizen, uh, change for good. But I don't feel it. Uh, not many people are buying it, buying the concept. Why? Uh, it's not as a, uh, as a booming as the food or tourism before COVID and the food fashion industry. So maybe informed decision can help. What's the concept of informed decision? Informed means having a lot of knowledge about something and decision is a choice that you make after sim some, uh, about something after thinking about the alternatives. So. My staff and I came up with this infographic about how to uh, a decision tree on the um, uh, informed decision that you need to be aware of availability of choices. You need to consult experts' advice and experts is not only on Sharia but should be science and technology. And then you apply Makasih Sharia to make your informed decision. I hope that from this informed decision concept, it can bring uh, this uh, phenomena, this uh, situation to a more balanced one as prescribed by our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what's the way forward? Apart from this informed decision tree, we need to converge the minds of Sharia, science, technology and business because you can't work alone. No one has uh, the, the, the, the knowledge alone. Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, our leaders in Malaysia noted this and so scientists were appointed by the king and rulers of uh, Malaysia. Uh, they were appointed to the Malaysian Fatwa Council to be members of the Malaysian Fatwa Council uh, for since I think 10, 20 years ago. Because this decision affects life and livelihood. Livelihood, as you see, has a domino effect now from the COVID-19. But can NGO do it? These are the criteria that uh, I have put in. I don't think they can do it from scratch. Uh, it's impossible when there is an urgency to have such an entity. I hope SMIC can do it because from my analysis, they have all the matching points and hopefully with their connections they can also facilitate public private partnership and coordinate halal compliance in the value chain the members should be comprising from knowledgeable experts with good experience credible influencers common understanding of the halal and taliban concept which you know from smith from the standards you know they already have a common understanding they also have a shared goal of instilling respect towards our obligation to consume halal toyban products and most of all sincere intention to benefit humankind what are the initiatives that can be implemented implemented 
halal pharmacopoeia, of course. Prof. Zari, the stage is yours later to talk more about this. Halal pharmaceutical framework. This is something that um, General Halim and myself has proposed to the Malaysian government through HDC, but I believe it can be applied throughout the OIC member countries. Strategic dissemination of the informed choice decision concept. Capacity building, a must. We must produce skillful, competent, exemplary talents, professionals, because we are in a pharmaceuticals is highly professional, highly technical. We need all the experts in this. Pool of experience, qualified, certified trainers also are important. Now, because the professionals are non May, may not everyone be in uh, uh, Islamic uh, strong, like me. I'd like to propose the Sharia and Arabic for halal pharmaceuticals and perhaps expand it to the whole halal industry so that we, you know, it's similar to English for Business. I think those who attend English as a normal course and attend the English for Business course can see the difference. And I'd like that to be implemented for Arabic and the Sharia concept for halal. Because patience stem from knowledge, and with knowledge, you get respect. Thank you so much. All of us stakeholders are important, um, but we are of uh, what do you call that uh, argumentative lot. But we matter, and hopefully, we can for a good work towards our last pleasure. Thank you very much. My apologies for spend, extending my time a bit. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum salam. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you on World Halal Summit stage. Now I would like to invite Professor Dr. Zari Ismail from University of Science in Malaysia. Professor, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and alhamdulillah, I think uh, I'm very fortunate to be with uh, in this session, although even though due to various constraints. But anyway, I'm going to deliver a very, sub very important subject matter that will uh, determine the survival of the halal pharmaceutical industry. And what I'm going to talk is about the halal pharmacopoeia. And basically, uh, the halal pharmacopoeia, can we have the slides, please? <clears throat> can the secretary uh, turn on the slides? Well, I, I, I think I'll start off with the introduction. Uh, as was mentioned by, by the, one of the speakers, Dr. Muhammad Ali, medicines and healthcare products are highly regulated and to conform to established scientific and technical descriptions and parameters related to quality, safety and efficacy. And the current increase in awareness of halal has gone beyond food and beverages, encompassing areas especially related to healthcare products. And the regulatory description and procedures are found in the monographs of the pharmacopoeia as official documents for regulatory purposes. And basically, halal aspects are not considered and therefore create difficulties in determining the status of halal of the product in question. This major issue can only be resolved with the establishment of the halal pharmacopoeia. There is a compilation of monographs of halal materials used in the pharmaceutical and healthcare industries. And regulatory agencies worldwide rely on the pharmacopoeia monographs, description and procedures to check on authenticity, quality, safety of the item during the registration process. Uh, next. Why do we need to uh, have this thing, this halal pharmacopoeia? 
generally, can they uh, uh, make the screen bigger? Uh, generally, there is no comprehensive list of ingredients of in pharmaceutical and healthcare uh, consumer products. This classifying and uh, and discriminating the nature of the halal of halal and non-halal uh, sources and to to have a comprehensive list of the health of the standards uh, regarding uh, the sources and i think next can you have the next next okay uh, this is the reason why we have we should have the halal pharmacopoeia and i think the, there's a whole reason that i've given here and I think I'm not going to read one one by one. Next, in the whole pharma, halal pharmaceutical scene, next, efforts by world industry players to, to adapt to halal uh, requirements. And the global, global Islamic economy report states that uh, countries like UAE, Malaysia, Singapore, Jordan, and Egypt has begun this call for this halal aspect on medicines and other countries are also looking forward turkey indonesia thailand japan and korea especially especially related to health government and uh, the, in health and government must set the standards yeah. and then of course there's an absence or lack of entrepreneurs in the halal farm school and healthcare industry which I think will uh, make this thing quite difficult. Next, in the World Halal Summit 2018, there is the Istanbul De Declaration. There was emphasized, it was emphasized that the importance on, of authenticity tests and testing methods be made one of the reasons why this should be declared important. And it promotes innovation in the production of halal pharmaceutical vaccines, biological products, excipients, and enzymes. And then by taking into consideration the government rule in putting rules, reg regulating importing, importing and producing halal pharmaceutical. And one of the declaration also states that it promotes the development of halal pharmaceutical university curriculum and also halal pharmacopoeia as basic blocks to the halal farm school field. Because uh, this area of uh, farm school is very highly technical and highly controlled, and they need specialized uh, specialist people to, to be in charge of the various aspects of the, of the farm schools. Next. In trying to define halal farm school, uh, we have this MS2424 that was uh, the latest revision in 2019 that states that uh, what we meant by halal pharmaceuticals is nearly the same as what we meant by halal food, except for the fact that in halal pharmaceuticals, we also use some materials which are not allowed in food, but it is allowed in pharmaceuticals, uh, but they must be uh, control using prescribed dosage. So uh, the rest are all the same. Eh? And uh, for the rationale of halal pharmacopoeia, next, uh, it is a must have reference, eh? reference document for the full implementation of the halal built in or halal by design principle as stipulated in the Malaysian standard 2424 and the rest. And uh, the absence of halal ingredients references for stakeholders in pharmaceutical and healthcare sector is a stumbling block for us to produce more, uh, what you call more halal medicine. And in the halal pharmacopoeia, we select and single out the critical non-halal pharmaceutical ingredients to prioritize the R&D and innovation for halal alternatives. 
and then of course uh, Smith and OIC can spearhead and champion the halal healthcare and farm school industry sector as a global agenda with halal pharmacopoeia. And countries having their own pharmacopoeia, for example, Indonesia, Pakistan, Turkey, Iran, and Egypt, I think for them is rather easier for them to have, it's an advantage for them. Uh, they could convert whatever they have in their uh, monographs of their pharmacopoeia and turn it to the halal uh, monographs. And then non-OIC countries having national pharmacopoeia could also consider a, a halal pharmacopoeia version to facilitate the halal pharmaceutical ecosystem. Because we have got uh, requests from some countries having pharmacopoeia uh, to help them uh, produce a version of the halal pharmacopoeia for that country. Uh, next, objectives of halal pharmacopoeia is to establish the world's first halal pharmacopoeia and the compilation and publication of uh, the halal pharmacopoeia index based on the green list, the halal list, the red list, the haram list, and the gray list, the masbo, which is uncertain, as the color codes. And compilation of the monographs is based on the latest established world pharmacopoeia, namely British pharmacopoeia, US pharmacopoeia, Chinese pharmacopoeia, Japanese pharmacopoeia, and the Indian pharmacopoeia. And uh, we will like to develop the local international expertise, professional services, and enterprise entrepreneurs catering to the needs of the international halal pharma pharmaceutical and healthcare industries. And we also like to build databases and formation system to facilitate the development and growth of the new generation of unique halal built-in halal by design products with high income growth potential. And then the next next slide is on the what is meant by pharmacopoeia and also the halal pharmacopoeia. Uh, pharmacopoeia is a compilation of standards and quality specifications for medicines, including starting materials, excipients, intermediates, and uh, finished pro pharmaceutical products. And they describe uh, the appropriate tests to confirm uh, the the integrity, the the purity of the product, and ascertain the strength for the amount of active substance and if required performance characteristics. So these are the examples of the of the pharmacopoeia that we are trying to uh, use. Yeah. Next, we have made. Uh, a list uh, and and compile it into a, what we call as halal index, and these are the potential ingredients from porcine source from pig source, and you can find here about nearly sixty items eh, from the pig, that is from the adrenal glands, from the brain, from the blood, from the various parts of the body, that is now currently being extracted out to become medicines and. Uh, to be formalized in the pharmacopoeia. So, so these are the items that we single out as the red list uh, to be changed. And next, uh, we will give an example. For example, stearic acid is a very common item. And in the British pharmacopoeia, for example, and also found in the, Euro in the European pharmacopoeia, uh, they describe the acid as a mixture consisting of the steric and also palmitic acids uh, obtained from fats or oils of vegetable or animal origin and this is the issue so of course we would like the this material which is uh, highly used in various products to only uh, come from the uh, uh, plant origin not the animal origin Next. Professor, and, you have two minutes left. Thank you. Okay. And next, we have uh, the example of the kosher magnesium stearate. Kosher is the Jewish uh, standards, whereby they em emphasize the fact that they, for them to have a kosher stearate, they must make, that, make sure that the stearate comes from uh, not non-animal source, 
So they have already complied to the various pharmacopoeia standards in in the world. Eh? And uh, I think these are the sort of thing that we intend to do in our pharmacopoeia monograph. So since time is chasing up, I'm, I'm going to skip some of the things. Uh, so in terms of the expected outcome, next. Next. Uh, we expect, next, the global halal pharmacopoeia uh, to be established. And it is a must have reference for us to uh, make sure that our products are made from ingredients that have complied to the halal from copia monographs. And uh, of course, uh, they need to be officially uh, sanctioned. And uh, halal standards references have to be uh, made known to especially the YC countries. And then we can also develop entrepreneurs and then put professionals and expertise in this area. And of and it is an extension of the teaching and learning materials in the universities. Next. Okay, uh, as you can see here, we have, we have the green list. Uh, the green list are the halal list. And then we have the red list and also the gray list. In our work, and I think uh, this work has been done mainly by Dr. Muhammad Ali, and I'm very grateful for him when he was doing his PhD. And uh, we found that uh, it, the red list and the gray list is about 10% yeah, of the total volume. So it is not an uh, impossible work, a task to, to achieve. So it is a matter of uh, whether we commit it or not. Next. And then uh, who is going to em embark on this thing? Uh, well, I think uh, since we have mentioned it and and we are trying to make sure that in our TC16 on halal pharmaceutical issues, the halal pharmacopoeia is a uh, important, uh, what do you call, project for us to, to work on. And of course, with the contribution of people from Smith and also OIC countries. And then I think the, met, the next one is on how and who are to realize it. Uh, these are the things that we have mentioned uh, in, the, in the presentation. And then the target users, the clientele. And uh, these are the things that we need to, next, eh? we need to mention uh, the people who are going to use this thing. Because until unless you have a common reference of halal uh, monographs of the materials that is to be used and made into the products, then I think there is always a big debate on whether it is halal or not. Because the way we uh, check on the halal medicine is not through looking to the, uh, what you call fragments or ex uh, ingredients that are not in compliance. Eh? For example, we are looking for DNA, foreign DNA and so on. So what we have done is that we have to make sure that the halal is already built in that have satisfied the monographs of the halal pharmacopoeia. And what we need to do is to confirm the analysis, whether it's true or not, as, com as found in the own monographs. And then we manufacture it. And at the end, there's no need for us to check on the halal because it's already built in halal. And I think the next is, of course, we next, uh, we need to uh, make sure that when and where to begin, and we are now looking for funding actually to make sure that we can start off this project. And next, the benefits for the Ummah, I think when, when we say about this halal pharmacopoeia, it is a must have item for us to start producing halal pharmacopoeia and whereby the regulatory agencies, when they check for halal, they have already got the specifications and the standards in place for them to do the control. And in conclusion, next, uh, the initiative and faci uh, to facilitate this production of halal farm school and healthcare products, where the concept of halal built-in or halal by design 
is embedded in the standards uh, operating procedures of the Malaysian standard, for example. And this is uh, have to be complemented by the presence of, of this halal pharmacopoeia because of the aspect of quality built in rather than tested for. Uh, and we have changed it to halal quality built in rather than testing for non-halal. So I think with that, I conclude my presentation and I'm looking forward for any explanation or any questions in hand. Thank you. Terry Makasi, Professor, thank you so much. It was a please, uh, pleasure to have you on this stage today. Um, now we are moving to uh, plaque giving award. I would like to invite Mr. Zafar Soylu if he is around. If possible. He was just here. Mr. Zafar Soylu, we would like to have you on the stage for plaque giving award ceremony. Thank you. We would like to thank our speakers who made a valuable speech for Session 9, Halal Pharmaceuticals. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fazalur Rahim. And thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad Ali Al Sheikh Weiss from SMIC. You honored us uh, with your presence on the stage of World Halal Summit today. I would like to uh, thank our valuable guests and participants. Now this session ended and after uh, we will be continuing with two more sessions during the afternoon. Uh, we, we are giving a break now. See you.
Selamun Aleyküm and welcome back. We are starting with session 10, Halal Testing. For this session, I would like to invite our valuable speakers on stage. I would like to invite Dr. Shoje Alibadi from Faruk Life Sciences, Life Sciences Research Laboratory from Iran. Mr. Salih Şengezer, High Board of Religious Affairs, Presidency of Religious Affairs, Turkey. Professor Dr. Abdullah Öksüz, Necmettin Erbakan University, Turkey. Professor Dr. Murat Şimşek, Karabük, Karabük University, Turkey. Dr. Muhammed Şirvan Abdullah Sani, from International Islamic University of Malaysia. Welcome. I would like to invite our first speaker on stage, Dr. Shoje Alibadi from Faruk Life Sciences Research Laboratory from Iran. Sir, the stage is yours. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah al mutajalli wa jamale wa al muhtajib wa jalale wa salawat ala Muhammad wa ala. Um, today I would like to discuss an issue of gelatin speciation by a fast method of ATR and Fourier transfer infrared spectroscopy. Um, this is me. You, you, if you want, you know, uh, you can get a copy of my slide. And the outline of uh, discussion today is we will talk about general information of gelatin. We will discuss about the global gelatin productions and also the, the production uh, process steps. We will talk about animal glue and recycled uh, gelatin uh, capsules, both soft and hard gel. We talk about the animal glue uh, processing steps and also the gelatin speciation, material methods, results, and conclusion. Uh, gelatin, it's 99% of gelatin comes from two species. They are either from porcine, which it is the majority, and or bovine. And then it comes from the hide, which again is the majority, comes from the hide, and the, the, the minority comes from the bone. The rest of production of the gelatin, which it is mainly fish gelatin, uh, it's a, it accounted for almost 1% of the total gelatin. We have also a small amount of um, uh, gelatin from uh, donkey, which it is uh, medicinal, and which, by the way, it is the most, uh, the highest uh, priced uh, gelatin. It's more than $300 per kilo, therefore, we are not going to discuss that. Um, it's a widely used in industry. Today we, we, we, we heard uh, about Dr. Riaz, uh, about the food additives. One of the hidden ingredients, it would be gelatin, for clarification of uh, um, fruit juices, they will, they will use that. Um, <clears throat> If you want to look at the production, the, the distribution at the global stage, what you will see that the majority is in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and uh, North America and Latin America. And then the only 39% goes for the, the rest of the world, which Muslim countries are there. <clears throat> and about the amount of halal gelatin, what if we believe everybody says halal is halal, we don't need uh, any credible matter, its maximum would be 4%. For, uh, that is the big problem. If you look at the number of the Muslims, which are between 20 to 25%, uh, you will see that the, that's showing that the majority of Muslims wouldn't use the halal gelatin. It's impossible. <clears throat> It is a, a complex and multi-stage process, the process of gelatin. It's, um, we need the um, raw materials, which, the, which it is the connective tissue of pigs, cattle, and, and fish. Uh, we use the bone and skin. 
There is a pretreatment, there is a hydrolysis of uh, gelatin, which the collagen, which it is the most abundant protein of the all mammals. You know, this part of you know, our hands, it's which you, if you press, uh, you, you know, you, the, the um, pressure of your finger will remain, that is collagen. For collagen is in all of our bodies, in all mammalian species. Before, but if we hydrolyze them, uh, we will change the uh, uh, characteristic of them in a way that they are now soluble in water and all the good, uh, good things which it goes for gelatin, which it is actually doesn't have anything. Uh, means that gelatin doesn't have any taste, doesn't have any color, and, and, and that's, that means that if you, you can add anything to it or if you add to something, it wouldn't change the taste or color of that. And then there is extraction, purification, thickening, and drying. Therefore, we have the pretreatment that you know the bone should change to, to bone chips, which it is the uh, demineralized uh, uh, bone. And then uh, for the skin, you will change them to split leather. Uh, we have three types of uh, hydrolysis. One, it is acid hydrolysis, which they call it type A. And then we have uh, alkali hydrolysis type B. And we have a enzymatic hydrolysis, which you might call it type E. Type A is mainly used for uh, skin of uh, porcine. Uh, because the porcine connective tissue, it's loosely uh, interconnected, it's less densely uh, interconnected, therefore there is a less uh, cross-link. Uh, they will preheat it, you know, with the acid solution for one day, maybe even sometimes uh, maximum goes to uh, 48 hours. And this will uh, allow us, the, the, this will be followed by neutralization and rinsing the salt. However, bovine, uh, it's, uh, the connective tissue is densely interconnected, the, the four more uh, crossly. And in this case, you cannot use acid very well. The four al alkaline pretreated uh, with calcium hydroxide uh, will be used mainly. It will take several weeks before, you know, it's, the cost will be higher. Instead of, you know, uh, one day, you have to wait not, sometimes up to 40 days. And uh, you need to, to destroy these cross links. Uh, these are the, the systems, I mean, uh, that we, we need then go to the next step, which it is the extraction. It's a hot water extraction. Uh, which you will, uh, when you produce your gelatin, more the temperature goes up, there is a, the, the gelatin uh, uh, molecule will destroy more, and therefore uh, will have the less gelling activity, which we will measure it by uh, a number called the bloom. Uh, we have the purification, which it is, could be a filtration, uh, we will uh, use the, sometimes we use uh, centrifugal separation. Uh, we have a resin filtration. And after that, we have thickening, which we will make a honey-like liquid. It's a gelatin solution concentrate, which normally we should do it under a vacuum. And then drying, which it is, uh, uh, the system is, they will, they should sterilize and cooled and, and dried and uh, resulted is a noodle, uh, jelly noodles like uh, uh, products, which then later you have to meal them to become a, uh, a something like a grain. One of the other issues which I would like to discuss today is the animal glue and recycled pharmaceutical gelatin. Actually, animal glue was the, uh, the history of gelatin goes back to animal glue. And the animal glue used in, in this industry very well, especially for making the 
books when those days there were no chemical adhesive. It's a very, very good adhesive. And um, at the moment also, uh, if you want to repair an old book, uh, you know, the recommendation is to use animal glue rather than you know, uh, a, a synthetic glue because synthetic glue after a while will destroy the papers. If you look at these uh, steps, you will see that you know, uh, the animal glue, or what we could call it industrial gelatins, is the same process of gelatin production with the uh, you know, uh, uh, differentiation, which well, we didn't have uh, uh, you know, uh, some, some of the neutralization and, and uh, uh, perhaps less purification. In the leather industry, in tonnery, what they will have, um, you know, they will produce, they will use um, hide, and they have to use uh, chromium sulfate. And this chromium sulfate, which it is very uh, dangerous, uh, it will make uh, uh, the, uh, the tonnery hide full of uh, chromium. We measured, if you produce gelatin from them, then the amount of uh, uh, chromium in your gelatin would be uh, more than 1,000 ppm. Normally, it is uh, almost nothing in, in if you do it uh, carefully. Um, what we'll do, they will buy this one. This is the waste. It will, uh, from tannery, uh, they will buy it almost just, just the price of they are taking it out because it's highly contaminated and it's very difficult to get rid of it. And with the same process, in a very traditional way, they make the uh, animal glue. And this is perhaps more modern facility which you can have the dryer and then make better uh, products. But Sir, are, you have two minutes left, thank you. Ah, I thought that you have 45 minutes. If you look at your program, but I will finish it soon. Okay. Then we have two types of capsules. You know, uh, we have a hard and the soft gel. One of the problem of them, when they, you produce the soft gel, there is a waste of gelatin. Sometimes the gelatin mixed with the drug, and sometimes it's not mixed with the drug. But in this case, you have to know that, that this system always has got some waste. And also, the, when you make a hard capsules, there is a lot of waste. And uh, these wastes are being used for animal glue in a lot of countries. But there is always, you have to be careful that they, are not, they shouldn't come back to our food. And this is our method, which we would like to discuss. If you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, we will, you know, we have uh, uh, one side, we, you know, the photonic uh, uh, light, it's one side it is UV, and the other side is infrared. After that, we have the terahertz, and then, then we have the electronics. Now we are trying to talk about IR. In IR, we have two regions. One region is, if you look at this, I hope that, is it working? No. Uh, uh, the first part, if you look, uh, we could call it functional group. And then the last part, which is the f finger region. What we did, we, we took a lot of gelatin from my friends, you know, some of them like uh, uh, Dr. Barbara is here. A, a lot of you brought, uh, Mufti uh, uh, Yusuf Khan brought me. Uh, we took almost more than 1,200 uh, samples from uh, more than 26 countries. And we, we, we did the, you know, we used with the FTIR system. And if you look at them, which it is between 2,500 to 15,000 nanometers, if you look at them, the results showing that this is bovine, porcine, and animal glue. If I make them like this, you can see that there is a difference between three types of, uh, um, uh, three types of uh, uh, chromatogram. And it, when we did the PCA score plot, now you can see that the porcine, bovine, and 
animal glue can be now distinguished from each other. And this is what we did to, to tr what we do, we, we try to train the system, therefore we always make it to 70% of data and then 30% we validate with them. Um, we used, in this time, we used 347, 200 bovine, 50 porcine, and 97 animal glue. And we will reach to the data of sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, and error rate, which the sensitivity means that, you know, correctly we identified uh, true positive, uh, and specificity means that correctly identified true negative. Um, and these are the data which we found, which uh, very promising uh, for we get the, you know, uh, very good up more than 98% in sometimes, and in animal glue it's almost 100. Um, let me show you one more thing that, you know, we did data splitting, uh, because in the IR spectrum, you will have some amid, amid A, B, one, two, three. And amid one and two, we, you know, we, which it is a more fingerprint part of the IR spectrum, we, we did the analysis. And now you can see that, you know, the pro true positive is 91% and true negative is 100%. And the same we did for porcine, and again, we find true positive 100% and 98.9% .9 true negative. Uh, we know that, you know, the, in, in OIC SMIC 1, 2019, uh, it talks about the validation and uh, method. And over there it says that, you know, halal authenticity conformity test methods are, which can be used for the purpose of halal food control, shall be three uh, characteristic. They should provide beyond the reason of doubt. Means that definitely, you know, the 100% true should be true and 100% false should be false. Objectively identify the halal source, non halal source, non, non halal and, and nudges free, which it is a ba risk based approach and fulfilling uh, the requirement of uh, slaughtering where possible and it should be a you know, preferably multi-lab validation through the collaborative uh, trial. Now you can see the, our FTIR method. It's, you know, it's, it will prove that it's a bovine. It will, um, you know, the risk is really the poor sign. I told you that the rest of them is 1%, therefore there is, the, the risk is nothing. Um, regrettably, we cannot talk about at the moment which you know, from the, our test, is it been uh, slaughtered according to Islamic Sharia or not? But there are some good, good work which we can do, on the meat at least. And then the issue of animal glue. And the next step would be we need to do this one at the uh, OIC level under a SMIC uh, a collaborative trial. One thing which it is will come, we, what we are hoping that, you know, these are the system of handheld infrared, therefore we are hoping that one day, very soon, we will empower our inspectors, uh, um, our uh, people are going to the, uh, as a CB uh, auditors, with equipments which, you know, uh, they are not only looking at the data on the paper, but also they can do some tests, and if they need some further tests, they can take a sample for that. بلغ الاولى به کماله کشف و دو جا به جماله حسنت جمیع خصاله صلو علیه و آله سلام علیکم و رحمت الله Thank you so much doctor for minimizing your deep treasure of knowledge within this limited time Now I would like to invite Mr Salih Shangezar expert from High Board of Religious Affairs, Presidency of Religious Affairs, Turkey. Welcome, sir. The stage is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسولنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Muhterem katılımcıları saygıyla selamlıyorum. Beni davet ettikleri için de organizasyon heyetine ayrıca teşekkür ediyorum. Bugün benim sunumum helalliğinde şüphe edilen gıda katkı maddelerinin gıda üretiminde kullanılmasının fıkhi boyutu hakkında olacak. İnşallah iki gün boyunca elde ettiğimiz bilgilerden hareketle ben çok daha özet bir şekilde geçmeye çalışacağım. Süreyi de aşmamak için elimden geldiğince özet olarak aktarmak istiyorum. Bu tabirleri birer cümleyle geçecek olursak helal tabiri malum olduğu üzere İslam dininin kullanılmasında, yapılmasında herhangi bir mahsur görmediği, izin verdiği şeylere kullanılıyor. Gıda katkı maddeleri de tanımları geçti. En genel ifadesiyle kendisi gıda olmadığı halde gıdalara teknolojik amaçlarla katılan maddeleri ifade ediyor. Peki şüpheli gıda katkı maddelerinden biz neyi kastediyoruz? Aslında fıkıh ilminin çerçevesinden baktığımız zaman şüpheli bir hüküm yoktur. Yani hükümler helaller belli, haramlar belli ve hükümler nettir. Bu açıdan buradaki şüphe Fıkıh ilminden ileri gelen bir şüphe değil, teknik belirsizliklerden ileri gelen bir şüphe. Bu belirsizlikler giderildiği zaman bu gıda katkı maddelerinin üzerindeki şüpheler de, fıkhi anlamdaki şüpheler de giderilmiş olacak. Peki bu şüpheler neden kaynaklı, kaynaklanabilir? Bunlara bir bakacak olursak, birinci şüphe, Gıda katkı maddesinin menşeinden ileri gelen bir belirsizlik. Bu gıda katkı maddesinin menşei haram bir kaynaktan olursa e, o zaman hüküm malumdur. Malumdur. Yine helal bir kaynaktan olursa hüküm malum olur. E, i̇kinci olarak da menşeinden elde ediliş şekli. Menşei helal olan bir kaynaktan helal olmayan bir usulle gıda katkı maddesi elde edilirse bu durumda da helallik hükmü ortadan kaltır, kalkacaktır. Dolayısıyla burada da bizim için bir şüphe oluşuyor. İkinci nokta, gıda katkı maddelerinin alındığı kaynağın temiz olup olmaz, olmaması. Ee, bunun tabi sıhhi açıdan temizliği değil, dini açıdan temizliği. Ee, çünkü her zaman tıpten temiz olan bir şey dinen temiz olmayabiliyor. Ee, mesela kandan veya alkolden üretilmiş e, ya da alkol kullanarak üretilmiş bir maddenin biz helalliğinde e, çok şüphe ederiz. Hatta e, istihale yoksa doğrudan e, helal olmadığını söyleyebiliriz. Üçüncü belirsizlik de gıda katkı maddelerinin üretimi aşamasında istihale veya istihdak dediğimiz e, olayların gerçekleşip gerçekleşmediği noktasında. Eğer gıda katkı maddesi üretiminde kaynağı helal olmayan bir kaynaktan olsa bile istihale dediğimiz moleküler yapısında bir değişme gerçekleşirse o zaman yeni bir madde olacağı için bunun da fıkhi hükmü yeni bir hüküm olacaktır. Ancak bu durum netleşmediği sürece bizim de o katkı maddesinin fıkhi hükmü hakkında net konuşma olanağımız yok. Dördüncü boyut ise maddenin zararlı olup olmaması bakımından fıkhi, fıkhi açıdan bir maddeye sırf zararından ötürü helal değildir demek e, genel fıkıh e, kanaatine bakarsak zararı faydasından galipse bu, bunun için bizim burada helallik hükmü değişip hara, kerahet veya tahrim hükmüne doğru bir yol açılmış oluyor. Ama burada zararın boyutu biraz daha önemli. Bir madde eğer o maddeyi alan herkese umumi olarak zarar veriyorsa ve bu zarar muhtemel bir zarar değil de kesin bir zararsa ve üçüncü olarak da bu zarar e, basit bir zarar değil, ağır bir zarar. Yani vücuttaki bir organın e, ya da organın fonksiyonunun yitirilmesine sebep olacak derecede ağır bir zararsa biz buna dinen e, haram diyebiliriz. Çünkü böyle bir maddeyi tüketmek, vücuda almak, e, intihar etmek anlamına gelecektir. Ama burada zarar umumi değilse veyahut da kesin değil, sadece muhtemel bir zarar varsa ya da ağır bir zarar değil, alerji gibi basit 
e, geçecek bir zararsa o zaman bir kerahatten bahsedebiliriz. E, benim gördüğüm ve bildiğim kadarıyla gıda katkı maddeleri arasında doğrudan zararından hareketle haram denilebilecek bir madde yok. Çünkü bunlar e, sağlık testlerinden geçerek bu noktaya yani gıda katkı maddesi onayı alıyorlar. E, ancak diğer e, durumlar söz konusu olduğu için zararından dolayı mekruh olduğunu, kerahat olduğunu söyleyebileceğimiz katkı maddeleri mevcut. Yine şüpheli yaklaşabileceğimiz katkı maddeleri mevcut. Kısa geçmek için bu detayları atlıyorum. E, bir tablo üzerinden sonuç kısmını aktarmak isterim. Ee, üretici ile tüketiciyi yan yana koyduğumuz zaman e, aradaki fıkhi hükmü ortaya çıkarmak için onların durumuna bakmamız gerekiyor. Birinci olarak üretici ve tüketici bu gıda katkı maddelerinden sakınma noktasında e, güç yetirebilir durumlar, durumda mıdır? Burada üretici bir ürün üretiyor ve bir yatırım yapıyor. Bu baştan yaptığı yatırımı bu helallik ilkesine uygun olarak yaparsa bunlardan sakınması mümkündür, onun takatı dahilindedir. Ancak bir tüketici bugün çevremizde o kadar yaygınlaşmış gıda katkı maddelerinden tamami, tam anlamıyla sakınması onun takati dahilinde değil. Bir maddeyi almaz, aldığı zaman gıda katkı maddesi yoksa diğerinde mutlaka bunun karşısına çıkacaktır. O yüzden güç yetirebilirlik açısından tüketici ile üretici arasında bir fark var. Malumunuz Cenab-ı Hak da insana e, takatinin üstünde bir yük yüklemiyor. Dolayısıyla bu noktada tüketicinin mesul tutulmaması ancak üreticinin mesul olması gerektiği kanaatindeyim. İkinci nokta katkı madde, maddesinin menşeini, üretim sürecini veya ortaya çıkacağı zararları bilme noktasında üretici ile tüketici arasında da bir fark var. Tüketici genel olarak bunları bilme bilemez, bilme imkanına sahip değil. Bir iki tanesini bilse bile binlerce katkı maddesini takip etmesi mümkün değil. Aynı şekilde bu katkı maddelerini tanısa bile çoğu zaman bunların fıkhi hükmünü bilme imkanına da sahip değil. Ama üretici her iki noktada da ilgili uzmanlara danışarak ya da üreticilere danışarak katkı maddesinin hem kaynağını bilebilir hem de fıkhi hükmünü öğrenebilir. Dolayısıyla burada da ikisi arasında bir fark var. Bir diğer nokta, ihtiyatlı hareket etmenin zorunluluğu noktasında. İhtiyatlı hareket etmek asıldır. Hem üreticiye hem tüketiciye bu tavsiye edilir. Ancak insanlar buna mecbur mudur diye sorarsak, üretici burada ihtiyatlı hareket etmek zorundadır. Çünkü kendisini aşan bir noktada başkalarına bir sunum yapıyor ve bu sunumun da o başkalarının e, gereksinimleri doğrultusunda olmasını gerektiğini onu temin etmek durumundadır. Dolayısıyla e, tüketici ihtiyatlı olmayan bir yolu tercih edebilir şahsi noktada ama üretici e, ihtiyatlı olanı tercih etmek durumundadır. Asıl olan ibahadır diye bir fıkhi kaidemiz var. Bu kaideye göre tüketici hiç bilmediği bir gıda katkı maddesini hakkında e, bir haramlık hükmü bilmediği gıda katkı maddesini asıl olan ibahadır diye tüketirse bu onun için haram olmaz. Ancak ee, üretici bu noktada araştırmak ve bunun netleştirmek durumundadır. Son olarak bir de mezhepler arasındaki e, iştihat ve hüküm farklılıkları var. Ee, örneğin karnin, karmin şellak gibi e, ürünlerde bunu gıda katkı maddelerinde bunları görebiliyoruz. Dolayısıyla burada e, üretici belki şahsi olarak bunlardan birini tercih edebilir. Diğer mezhebin görüşünde bu kullandığı katkı maddesine fetva varsa biz onun için bu helal değildir demeyiz. Ancak üretici nok üreticinin e, bu konuda hassasiyet sahibi olan tüketicilere sunum yaparken özellikle bunlara riayet etmesi gerekir. Burada ihtiyatı elden bırakmadan e, hareket etmesi gerekir. Sonuç olarak özetlemek sonuç olarak e, ifade etmek gerekirse şüpheli katkı maddelerinin Kullanılması, yani bu şüpheyi gidermeden kullanılması üretici açısından helal değildir, tüketici açısından helaldir. Ama biz yine sağlıklı olanı tüketmelerini tercih, tavsiye ederiz. E, bu noktada hem resmi kurumların, hem helal belgelendirme kuruluşların ve hem de e, biz ilahiyat çevrelerinin özellikle hassasiyet göstermelerini gerekli olduğunu düşünüyorum. 
Hepinize teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you so much, Dr. Sir, for your valuable speech. Now I would like to invite Professor Dr. Abdullah Öksüz from Necmettin Bakan University, Turkey. On his speech, analytic approach to halal food testing. Welcome, sir. The stage is yours. Assalamu alaikum. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما وفهما وألحقني بالصالحين Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen welcome to this session I am going to cover an analytical approach to halal food testing many of speaker mentioned about uh, what is halal. And we memorize this uh, verse of Quran. Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu, kulu min tayyibat ma razaknakum, wa shkuru lillah in kuntum iyyahu ta'budun. We all memorize and understand the meaning of this verse. So the time is to practicing this verse. So what is saying us? Uh, to eat the food which is halal and tayyib. The concept of tayyib means in Arabic, good, free from any negative qualities or traits which may be a kind of goodness, equal to pure, ethical, wholesome. The goodness or uh, tayyib, virtues of the food is not limited to it is health and nutritional aspect. So it covers wide range of sourcing, farming, trade, and trade, environmental and ethical production aspect that require to be free from any negative impacts. The concept uh, has allocated to welfare of human, animal, and environment long before the modern animal and labor acts and environment laws found in present. From commercial point of view and the majority of the majority of the consumer, the term halal, permissible, that can be, we can eat, we can consume, has been considered to equate tayyib. But in this verse, saying halal and tayyib, both halal and tayyib, there is a slight difference. So how we are going to know which food is halal or not? If you are living in a Muslim country or Muslim society, you shouldn't worry about uh, this term very much. But if you are living non-Muslim country as a Muslim, we will have so many difficulties. 20 years ago, I went to United Kingdom for my uh, postgraduate st study. It was the first day of Ramadan. I had the difficulties to find a break my fast, any food. And I broke my fast with an apple. And I always thank Allah, creating banana and, banana and fish that is very convenient food uh, in abroad, so that you can eat without any doubt. Certification is becoming more and more in important. And as a Muslim, if I see any label or logo on the, the package of the product saying halal, I would eat. But on that time, it was difficult to find halal food. I had a, a chat with my uh, friend, Dr. Hussein Nagy, he lives in the United Kingdom. He's a medical doctor, and I asked him, what about now? Can you find halal food uh, in the market? He said, Alhamdulillah, we can reach the halal food quite easily. So uh, it is because of the halal awareness in the, in the world, a uh, halal demand for the halal food. But we have to be confident what is, if it is written halal, it has to be halal. But if there is a frauding or cheating, 
it is a bit dangerous. Who's certifying the uh, halal logo or halal? It must be either from the, by local authorities and may not be accepted globally or recognized by certain localities. Some country, they don't accept, or some society doesn't accept the, the logo. There is an urgent need to harmonize halal standard globally and establish unified certification system to maintain consumer and processor confidence. Alhamdulillah, what we learn from this, this summit, CIMIC is doing this job. I'm very grateful to them. The establishment of halal HACCP system has been put forward as a solution toward the above goal. I look at the, the, uh, the literature about the halal concept, what is written and where. I checked the books and articles on halal food. This book was my first book when I, uh, attending, when I was attending the Madrasa or Quran school uh, almost 40 years ago. I bought this book, uh, which is Halal and Haram in Islam, written by uh, Sheikh Khardawi. But in this book, you cannot find detailed information about the uh, halal and haram food. You may, you may find in general, but it is difficult to find detailed information. Let's move on. And I checked the, uh, the, the name of the book, any book related to halal, halal food. I found halal food handbook. Very good. I, I look at the inside. It is really covering the nice topics. And the further, handbook of halal food production, which is very important. If you don't know how it is produced, you cannot be sure whether it is halal or haram. Food may be itself halal, but if it is processed in non-halal production line, it becomes haram. This book covers how to produce a halal food. And when I look at the, the date when it is published, this one is the recent one, this year published, the, the halal food production was published in uh, 2019. Last year it was published. This one published previous year, and the other one is the same year. All these related to halal food and preparation and processing about the halal food. This one, uh, Yone gave a nice speech uh, yesterday, and this is her book, My Halal Kitchen. And it is how to prepare halal food. The other one is the Halal Frontiers, which is written nine years ago. And if you go a bit further, search detailed, what about in journal, in article, in research? I go through the web of science, and there are nearly five, uh, 1,500 articles related to halal. I think it is not less. And I wonder when it began. If you look at here, between 1997 and 2010, not much article has been published, but it increased drastically towards the 2020. What I uh, recognize from this graph, there are a real concern about the food. That article may be published either by Muslim or non-Muslim or together. But this shows us there is a really great concern about the production of halal food or halal matter. Why all these books and articles? First is people are aware of the halal. And there is a, a concern about whether food is halal or haram or 
what makes the food haram? In, if you look at it from the research perspective, uh, we need to develop an analytic method to find out qualitative and quantitative uh, analysis if there is uh, any of the food ingredient or food present in, in, in there. And additive, and we need to find out how much is present and what is the source. Antibiotic residue, it is not haram, but it affects health. And if you use so much antibiotics, at the end it will, uh, if you consume the uh, food that contains antibiotic, when you need antibiotic, it won't work. Toxin, of course, the food has to be safe and not to harm our uh, health when we eat it. If there's a toxin in it, it uh, may affect the uh, halalness or haramness. Adulteration, which is common in our world, any food is valuable prone to adulteration, like honey, like olive oil, like other uh, food components as well. The, nowadays, uh, the consumer wants to know the origin of the food, where it is coming from, or social impact of the health, uh, halal lifestyle, halal trade, even the use of high technology tool to trace the halal food. All those books or articles related to these topics. HACCP implementation in halal foods. Uh, HACCP concept is not new. It was developed in 1960s for uh, the uh, airspace man uh, for NASA to, to provide them a secure and safe food. But when I learned HACCP uh, almost 22 years ago, it is openly hazard analysis critical control point. Uh, you can apply this concept in your life, in your kitchen, in your way of living. The basic idea is avoiding the hazard and making secure and safe the, the line. Professor, you have two minutes left. Thank you. I just started. <laughs> anyway, I will speed up. And uh, our previous uh, speakers mentioned about the HACCP and uh, in quality management system in uh, CIMIC has this uh, concept. You, we can def define the HACCP either chemical, microbial, or physical, but in Muslim point of view, halal is also, is, haram is also is a hazard in our, the, the system. I'll move forward. Uh, there are many benefits of the applying the HACCP in food system, enhance the food safety, avoiding the food wastage, which is the wasting is the food haram itself, provide self-confidence for the staff, proactive dealing with the problem earlier on. There is an expression saying, there is no use of crying over the spilled milk. If it happens, no need to be unhappy or being sad, but you have to be a proactive. I'll pass this one. Frauding is the main problem in our world. And last night, I was checking the news, what is going on about frauding. I come across, I put that one, okay. I come across with this news, and this lady is uh, serving a uh, fresh meat and might take uh, her house and cook to feed the, their family. Unfortunately, the news is saying cartel cracked down neither beef nor halal. So they are importing meat into X country, I'm not going to mention about the country, with trucks or lorries and they mix the meat and putting a logo or the label, 
certified as a halal meat. It is a cheating. And there is a misunderstanding about uh, halal food in our society, not non-Muslim society, non-Muslim, the Muslim who are living in non-Muslim society or non-Muslim country, they are more aware of the halal concept than the, the people are living in Muslim country. This is the, uh, what is the reason about the misunderstanding? Product need in Muslim country are not necessarily halal. Products sold in market owned by Muslim are not necessarily halal. Products that have their ingredient written in Arabic are not necessarily halal. The people, the Muslim uh, who, who's, uh, who doesn't know about the Arabic, if he or she sees any Arabic letter on a pack or anything, he or she thinks that the, the holy word, and it, he or she respect. But it doesn't mean Read, writing in Arabic, it, is, it makes halal. No. There are so many things to follow. But we have to be careful what is, the, what is present in our food, whether we are living in Muslim society or non-Muslim society. Because the world is becoming global village, and we are importing food and exporting food, and we don't know what is present in imported food. And vegetarian meal may not, be, may not necessarily be halal, and Jewish kosher meal are not necessarily halal. So we have to be careful. I'd like to touch a little bit about the frauding You read this news, and in this case, let's think a trade man trading meat in that country and obeying all the rules and getting the halal certificate, paying for it, and paying for everything. How he compete with the culture? So, living on that country, how you can trust halal logo? how Muslim can eat meat with a confidence. There is a beautiful saying, I would, rather, I would rather to lose my money than losing confidence of my customer. It says uh, Robert Bosch. So we shouldn't, as a Muslim, we shouldn't lose any trust. How we can overcome uh, the, from the food fraud, applying halal food quality management system. This includes certification, auditing, traceability, food testing, application of HACCP concept on halal food system. Why I put this uh, fish? Fish is halal, alhamdulillah. But you can see a, a clever label or QR code, and when you use your my mobile phone, it will it will tell you where this fish has been caught, when, how it has been handled. So we may need such a, a QR coding in our label so that we will know whether it is approved or not, whether it is halal or not, what, where, what is its source. All right. It is not enough to improve management system, but also we need to invest the quality of the human resources. How? First, trust and transparency. So we have to uh, raise or uh, invest a people. That person has to be trustworthy. We are the follower of Muhammad, peace be upon him. His second name is Al-Amin. Al-Amin means trustworthy, reliable, dependable, credible, secure. 
We have to obey all this. Many of you know how Islam spread, spread to Southeast Asia. Islam spreads via decent treatment, not via with Twitter or Facebook or anything else. Decent, fairness. The way you act, describe yourself. Can we determine the meat species, fraud, adulterated meat products? There is no problem. In analytical approach, in, in analytical chemistry, we can uh, determine whether product is uh, coming from the pork or the, uh, uh, the animal or from whatever. Because those food are the protein-based food. If you uh, apply PCA, PCR, polymer, polymerase chain reaction system, and you can identify the species of that uh, meat. Those are the uh, instruments we can analyze the food uh, authenticity and uh, uh, species, etc. What I what I found out, we ha we don't have any problem analysis of the food or testing of the food, whether it is coming uh, from the unknown animal or the ingredient, whatever. We don't have because at the moment. We have a sophisticated instrument that can analyze in very low level, even uh, parts per billion level. Professor, Our, can we summarize? Up? I'm, I'm finishing off. Uh, previous speaker mentioned about the gelatin. I will show you how we can determine the gelatin from the uh, from the cattle or from the pork. This chromosome shows A, A from the pork, B is from the cattle. So this one indicates clearly we can distinguish the gelatin from the pork and the cattle. This is the gelatin from the bovine. And there are so many published journals about the food analysis related to halal concept. And uh, if you look at the alcohol, This journal, this uh, article about the uh, halal food certification in some food, and here you are, they analyze even the type of the alcohol, not ethyl alcohol, and uh, the other alcohol as well. And in short time, we can determine whether alcohol is present in a food or in drink or not. I'll pass this one. Uh, do we have any alternative to gelatin? Yes, we have got. And we have gelatin from the fish. Uh, we have gelling agent from the uh, plant sources. This gelling agent made by myself, and it is sourced agar, and we made a quite uh, nice gelling agent. And uh, of course, there is a cost of the analysis of the food. And I put the, the, the price of the uh, analysis of uh, any, if you want to know the origin of meat, you have to pay about 66 euro. And alcohol, it is about 12 to 35 euro. Uh, GMP food screening, it is a bit expensive, almost 374, so and so forth. And alhamdulillah, CIMIC uh, has established a uh, protocol or uh, procedure for uh, general requirement for the competence of laboratories performing halal tests, and even a requirement for proficient, proficiency tests for halal food pur purposes. What I'm going to uh, summarize, we are able to analyze any ingredient present in food, drink, drug, or supplement with a highly sophisticated uh, instrument 
or able to develop a method determine them by an objective way, even a small quantity. But it is more difficult to know if a halal animal slaughtered in an Islamic way or not. Production line designed to process halal food or not. The product packed and handled in halal manner or not. All those things that I mentioned is related to human. So we have to invest our human resources so that we can be safe to eat any food. I mentioned about uh, uh, most of them, and what I'm going to point out, out in Majella, there is a rule, def-i mefasit jelbi menafiden evladır, means uh, avoiding from evil is better than attracting goods. So, uh, the main things what we need to, all this effort is avoiding from haram. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'd like to thank General Secretary of SEMIC, Ihsan Öğüt, on behalf of SEMIC organizing this event. Those are uh, joining this uh, session, either personally or virtually, and thank the organizing committee. And also, I, wa I, want, to, I want to convey my thank to Dr. Alahattin Behit from Otago University. Dr. Vesile Çetin providing me some uh, chromatograms, and also Şenay Alkan, the, uh, collecting some valuable information. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor, for your valuable speech. Now I would like to invite Professor Dr. Murat Şimşek from Karabük University, Turkey. His speech on evaluation of halal testing practices in terms of Islamic law opportunities and risks. Welcome, Professor. The stage is yours. Teşekkür ederim. Selamun Aleyküm. Herkese hayırlı programlar diliyorum. Öncelikle programı tertip eden başta Şimik Sekreterimiz İhsan Bey olmak üzere bütün ekibe teşekkürlerimi sunuyorum. Ben sunumumu Türkçe yapacağım sizlerle. Ben de helal deney üzerine bir sunum hazırladım. Onu şu anda şu an sizlere sunacağım. Helal test uygulamalarının İslam hukuk açısından değerlendirilmesi, fırsatlar ve riskler adında bir sunum hazırladım. Burada helal meselesine kısaca değindikten sonra bunun teorik ve pratik ile ilgili bir Burada sunumda ben Karabük Üniversitesi İlahiyat Fakültesi'nde İslam Hukuku yani Fıkıh Profesörü olarak çalışmaktayım. Özetle sunumun özetinden kısaca bahsetmek gerekirse helal birçok yönü olan bir meseledir. Helalin temelini de İslam Hukuku'nun temel prensipleri yani kuralları ve ahlaki kuralları oluşturur. Günümüzde de gıda sektörünün oldukça geliştiğini, hizmet sektörlerinin inanılmaz derecede büyüdüğünü görüyoruz, çeşitlendiğini görüyoruz. Dolayısıyla bu meselede uluslararası bir boyut kazanmış oluyor. Ee, tabii ki bu gıdanın sağlık bakımından değerlendirilmesinin yanı sıra ayrıca e, İslami açıdan da değerlendirilmesi zorunluluğu ortaya çıkıyor. İşte bu çalışmalarda e, bu zorunluluğun bir parçası ve neticesi olarak karşımızda. Bu sunumdaki amaç nedir? E, bu sunumdaki amacımız... Helal test konusunu İslam hukuku çerçevesinde ele almak, aslında testin uygulamalarına değinmek, özellikle gıda ürünlerinde uygulanan e, test yöntemlerinin gerekliliği, yeterliliği, eksikleri üzerinde durmaktır. Helal deneylerde bulunması gereken standartlar ve şu anda oluşturmuş olan standartlar ve uygulamadaki, belgelendirme uygulamasındaki portföylerle ilgili bazı e, uygulamalardan e, bahsedeceğim. E, bu konuda helal gıda konusunda ilahiyat bakımından e, sorduğumuzda, İslami esaslar bakımından e, sorduğumuzda bir nesne neden helal veya neden haram olur e, şeklinde bir soru külli olarak sorulabilir. Bunun cevabı aslında şudur, dini metinlerde doğrudan geçmesidir. Çünkü helali ve haramı tespit etme yetkisi Cenab-ı Allah'tadır. Cenab-ı Allah bu, bu yetkiyi Peygamberine de, Araf suresi 157. ayet-i kerimede verdiğini söylemektedir. 
Yine bu helal haram tespitlerine baktığımızda bir kısım helallerin e, e, gayesini, maksadını bilebilmekteyiz. E, e, sebebini tespit edebilmekteyiz. Bir kısmını edemek, edememekteyiz. Edemediklerimiz tahabbüdi olarak isimlendiriliyor. E, bir kısım temiz olan şeyler, tayyibat denilen şeyler helal. Bir kısım habais denilen habis ve nesil olan şeyler haram kılmıştır. Bunu da anlayabiliyoruz ve biliyoruz. E, bazı meselelerde de ise, meselelerde ise e, dönüşüm sebebiyle helale ve harama dönüşme oluyor. İstihale ve istihlak denilen kavramlar zaten bu helal konularında yeterince işlenmiş kavramlar olarak karşımıza çıkıyor. Bu konuda e, Simik'in helal gıda e, standartlarını yayınlamış olduğu Simik 1 2011 tarihi standarda baktığımızda e, helalden önce İslami kuralları tanımlıyor. İslami kurallar nedir? Kaynağını Kur'an-ı Kerim ve Hazreti Muhammed'in sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem uygulamalarından yani sünnetten alan ve Allah'ın Celle Celaluhu Müslümanlar için emrettiği bütün kurallar İslami kurallar diye isimlendirilir. Peki helal gıda bu anlamda baktığımızda ne olur? İslami kurallar dahilinde tüketilmesine izin verilen ve bu standart yani bu helal gıda standartta verilen kurallara uygun olarak e, uygun olan yiyecek ve içecekleri kastetmektedir. E, simik standardı bir de içtiği üzere. E, peki burada çerçeveyi nasıl belirlemek lazım? E, sunumun çerçevesi de şu şekilde. E, gıda tedarik zincirinde üretilen ürünlerin e, helal olmayan ürünler içermesi ve helal olmayan ürünlerle bulaşma dediğimiz temasta bulunma riski taşıması dolayısıyla bu çerçeveyi oluşturuyor. Yani bir ürünün tarladan sofraya ulaşıncaya kadar gıda maddesinin üretim veyahut da endüstriyel madde ise fabrikadan sofraya ulaşıncaya kadar ki üretim süreçlerinde yaşamış olduğu veya risk taşımış olduğu riskleri ifade eder bu çerçeve. Bunun için de tabii hem endüstriyel ve tüketicilere helal güvencesi sağlamak için standartizasyon, sertifikasyon, e, akreditasyon ve özellikle bunun bir parçası olan helal deneyle ilgili e, çalışmalar ve girişimler e, ortaya çıkmıştır güven vermesi için ve aslında e, temel itibariyle e, helal deney konusu helal belgelendirmenin de bir parçasıdır. Yani öz itibariyle helal belgelendirmede aç ve altyapı oluşturduğunu görüyoruz. E, helal deney e, meselesine e, bak, baktığımızda Özellikle akreditasyon ve standartizasyonla yakından ilişkisi olduğunu görüyoruz. E, helal yeterlilik testi, şartları, e, bunlarla ilgili gereksinimler, belirli uygulama alanları için teknik gereklilikler ve benzeri bunları belirleyen e, bir takım şartlar ve durumlara ihtiyaç oluyor. İşte bunları e, düzenleyen yeni bir çalışma Temmuz 2020 yılında Simik tarafından e, 36. E, Simik 36 olarak yayınlanan e, uygunluk değerlendirmesi helal amaçlı yeterlilik deneyleri için genel gerekli standardı diye bir standart inanılmıştır. Yine laboratuvarlarla ilgili olarak ise helal testinin yapıldığı mekanlar olarak laboratuvarlarla ilgili bir standart da hazırlanmıştır. Laboratuvarların teknik yeterlilikleri, tarafsızlığının ve bağımsızlığının gösterilmesi, objektifliğinin e, e, gösterilmesi ve laboratuvarla gü, laboratuvarlara güvenin sağlanması için e, bir takım şartlara ihtiyaç vardı. Bu şartları e, e, standartta bulabiliyoruz. Ee, yine uygunluk değerlendirmesi helal deneylerini yapan laboratuvarların yeterliliği için genel gereklilik adlı SİMİK 35. standartı da e, burada anabiliriz. Helal deney standartları aslında standartizasyonun bir parçasıdır. Peki standartizasyon nedir? Belirli bir faaliyetten ekonomik fayda sağlamak üzere bütün ilgili tarafların katkı ve işbirliğiyle belirli kurallar koyma ve kurallara uygulama işlemidir. Yine standartizasyonun Hakta yapılmış daha detaylı bir tanımı da bulunmaktadır. Helal aktivasyon tarafından, yasası tarafından yapılmıştır. Yine simit bir de acaba helal deneyle ilgili hangi bilgiler var diye baktığımızda 2011'de yayınlanmış olan gıda standartına burada mamülün kalitesini ve sağlığını etkileyen işlemlerde kullanılan ölçme ve deney cihazlarının yani bu işte helal deney dediğimiz kalibrasyonların yapılmalıdır, çek, e, kalibrasyonları yapılmalıdır şeklinde bir e, madde geçmektedir. E, 7-7D şıkkında. Yine 10. maddesinin 1. şıkkında e, helal olmayan kaynakların ve içeriğin değerlendirilmesi amacıyla yapılan muayene ve deneyler ulusal ve uluslararası düzeyde tanınan geçerli kılınmış ve doğrulanmış muayene ve deney yöntemlerine uygun olarak gerçekleştirilmelidir şeklinde e, bir madde bulunmaktadır. E, genel açıdan e, Simik'in gıda standartında. İşte bu Simik'in çıkarmış olduğu 35 ve 36 diye bahsetmiş olduğumuz standartların biraz içeriğinden de 
bahsedebiliriz hızlıca. E, Sivik 35'te e, laboratuvarlar e, için belirli genel gereksinimleri sağlamayı e, amaçlayan bir e, bilgiler vardır. E, amaçlayan bir standarttır. Bu standart özellikle teknik yeterlilikler açısından, tarafsızlık ve bağımsızlığın gösterilmesi açısından ve e, güven açısından laboratuvarların taşıması gereken e, şartları e, bu standartta bulabiliriz. E, bu standartın içeriğinden birkaç örnek vere, vermek gerekirse mesela Müslüman personel atanması, e, özellikle yöneticinin Müslüman olması ve laboratuvarda e, yap, e, bu işlemi yapan e, personelin de yine İslami değerlere bağlı saygılı olması, teknik personelin Müslüman olması ile ilgili bir takım şartlar içermektedir. E, bununla ilgili İslam kocasından bir değerlendirme yapacağım e, az sonra. E, laboratuvarda e, kullanılan ekipmanlarla ilgili mesela helal olmayan veya necis olan maddelerden üretilmiş veya onlarla e, bir şekilde temas etmiş olmamalıdır. E, e, yani gayri meşru İslam'a göre meşru olmayan e, ürünler içermemelidir e, yapılan testler esnasında. Yine temas konusuna dikkat ederek cihaz bakımındaki e, bakım materyalinin de yine İslami kurallara uygun olması gerekir. E, temas konusu özellikle vurgulanmış ve laboratuvarlarda e, İslam'a göre uygun olmayan, helal olmayan e, kaynaklarla aynı anda laboratuvarda kullanılmasının da uygun olmadığı açıkça söylenmiştir. Efendim, e, Simik 36 dediğimiz e, standartta ise e, daha çok e, deneyler için genel geçer olan kurallar üzerinde durulmuştur. E, burada ilgili taraflar dediğimiz e, bu e, şeyi belgelendirmeyi yapan diyelim kuruluş var, e, akreditasyon kurulu var, başvuran kişi var e, ve benzeri bunlarla ilgili yapılması gerekenleri e, burada görüyoruz. E, yine burada Müslüman bir personel yetkili bir Müslüman personel atanması ile ilgili bir şart e, görüyoruz. E, standartta teknik personelin Müslüman olması şartını görüyoruz ve helal konusunda bilgi sahibi insanlar olması gerekiyor. Helale çapraz bulaşma dediğimiz üretim, ambalajlama, paketleme esnasında diğer ürünlerle ortak olmaması, depoların ayrılmasıyla ilgili şartları görüyoruz. Teşhizatın bakımlı ve onarımı ve temizliği ile ilgili konularda yine helal şartlarına uygun olması gerektiğini görüyoruz. Depolama, depolama esnasında helal olmayan, malzem- helal olmayan malzemelerle karışmaması kirlenmemesi konusundaki şartlar, e, helale uygun ambalajlama ile ilgili şartlar ve yine Müslüman personel son noktada ürünün değerlendirilmesindeki Müslüman personel, personel üretim şartını da görüyoruz. E, Tabi burada işte tüm taraflar için bir e, politika belirleyen bir standarttır bu. Katılımcılar, e, akreditasyon kurumları, düzenleyici kurumlar veya katılımcı müşteriler arasında ortak bir konsensüs sağlamayı amaçlamakta bu standart. Özellikle tarafların politikalarını belirlemeleri, kriterlerini şeffaf bir şekilde ortaya koymaları ve e, bunu da e, başvuracak kişilerin anlayacağı bir şekilde e, sunmaları e, şart koşuluyor. Yine bir laboratuvarla ilgili bir şema seçmeleri gerekiyor bu helalle ilgili. Test şeması olması gerekiyor. E, zamanlama, konu, mumune, stabilitesi, dağıtım düzenlemeleri e, gibi e, bir şema. Ayrıca e, metrolojik izlenebilirliği ve katılımcıların gizliliğini koruması e, gibi konularda dikkate almaları gerekiyor. Yani ölçülebilir e, bir düzeyde yapmaları gerekiyor. Uluslararası standartlara uygun yapmaları gerekiyor. Yine katılımcılar tarafından katılımcıların sonuçlarını o şemadan bakarak baştan görebilecekleri bir e, çizelge halinde sunulması bekleniyor. E, Profesör, you have two minutes left. Thank you. Thank you. E, Akkadiyosan kuruluşlarıyla ilgili e, yine e, kuruluşların gereklilikleri ile ilgili 2019 yılında SIMİK 3 standartına bakılabilir. Helal deney test uygulamaları açısından baktığımızda aslında helal belgelendirme sürecinin bir parçasıdır. Bu süreci nasıl yapacağımız ve bu süreç içerisinde deneyin yeri nedir? Bununla ilgili iki örnek burada vereceğim. Kabaca yani hepsinin detayını vermemiz mümkün değil. Burada TSE'nin özellikle uygulamış olduğu köyü örnek alarak et mamullerinde helal belgelendirmede nasıl bir süreç takip edeceğiz ve nasıl bir süreç bulunmaktadır. Bu süreç içerisinde e, helal deneyin yeri nedir diye baktığımızda aslında bir belgelendirmede ana hatlarıyla 8 tane konu olduğunu görebiliyoruz. Belgelendirmeye esas doküman ve ürün tanıtımı, e, üretim tesisi ve prosesi gerekleri, dokümantasyon şartları, kalite kontrol gerekleri, numune işlemleri, e, denetim planı, deney planı, ve belgelendirme kapsamı. Buraya baktığımızda sanki deney sadece 
bir maddeyle ilgiliymiş gibi görüyor. Fakat öyle değil. E, deney birçok diğer maddeyle de yakından ilişkili olan aslında belgelendirmenin en temel altyapısını teşkil eden konudur. E, bu açıdan önemlidir ela deney meselesi. E, mesela bir üründe e, bu standart, e, simik standartını kullanan bir yapı olarak düşündüğümüzde ürünün adı, sınıfı, cinsi, tipi, türü, orijini e, ortaya konulmalı. Mesela et ürünlerinde sosis, e, büyükbaş hayvan etinden veya kanatlı hayvan etinden diye açıkça yazılmalıdır. Ve e, birçok maddede geçtiği üzere e, üretildiği ülkenin yasal şartlarına uygunlukta e, helal e, belgelendirmede şart olarak olmaktadır. Yine üretim tesisindeki proseslerin, tezgahların ve diğer şeylerin ölçüm cihazlarının kontrolleri, bakımları, analizleri, tehlike analizleri gibi dokumentasyon şartlarının da bulunması gerekiyor. Helal kesim, mesela burası bir et e, konusu olduğu için bu örneğimiz. Helal kesimle ilgili e, şartların yerinde tespit edilerek e, helal kesim usul ve esaslarına uygun olduğunu tespit edilmesi gerekiyor. Yine personelin e, bu konuda bilinçli e, ve eğitim almış kişiler olması ve hijyen, şart, hijyen şartlarına e, özen göstermesi e, şart koşuluyor belgelendirme için. E, muayene ve deneyler açısından baktığımızda bu e, belgelendirme esnasında standartlara yani kriterlerde belirtilen son ürün muayene ve deneylerini bir kalite kontrol planı çerçevesinde yapması gerekiyor. Belgelendirme kuruluşunun e, bu da e, standarda uygun bir şekilde yapılıyor. Laboratuvarlar açısından kendi laboratuvarları veya dış laboratuvarlar kullanılabilir. Bununla ilgili tabii bir takım şartlar var. Mesela eğer dış laboratuvar kullanacaksa alternatif bir uluslararası geçerli olan laboratuvar olmalıdır. Yani ee, mesela bir, Birleşmiş Milletler onaylı SE deney hizmet alınacak laboratuvar onay belgesi bulunan gibi belgeli laboratuvarlardan alınmış belgeler olması gerekir. Ee, ayrıca numune miktarı alınırken standart numune miktarlarının aşılmaması gerekir. Periyodun planlanması gerekir belgelendirmede. Periyotlar e, yıllık yapılır. Genelde tamamı bu şekilde yerleşmiştir. E, yıllık olarak 12 ayda bir periyodik belge yenilemesi, tekrar gözden geçirme, tekrar analizler yapılarak devam etmektedir. Yine laboratuvara ulaştırma şartları eğer hassas bir ürünse e, bu konulara da dikkat edilmesi gerekiyor. Bir tablo e, halinde örnek görmek gerekirse e, emülsifiye et ürünü olan salam ve sosiste e, en son sıraya baktığımızda kimik standartını kullanıyor. Riskli olarak karmik asit e, var. Bununla ilgili bir e, belge, helal belgesi gerekiyor ki karmik asitle ilgili SED'de e, simikte e, helal e, belgesi alınamaz. Bunun yerine alternatif gıda e, boyası tarzı şeyler kullanılması ve benzeri ve diğer burada kullanılan protein, yağ, tuz, nişasta, pH, rutubet, e, e, hidroksiplorin ve sodyum nitrit gibi e, şeylerin de denetimlerinin yapılması laboratuvarlarda isteniyor. Bunlar da yasal şartların bir parçası. Simek meyasını hızlıca e, uzatmadan örnek verirsek. Burada da 8 madde var ama ana hatlarıyla ürünün tanımı Efendim, muayene ve deneyle ilişkin bilgilerin bulunması, üretim yeriyle inceleme ilgili şartların bulunması ve belgelendirme usulüne ait bilgilerin bulunması şeklinde. Mesela ürün, ürün grubu gıda. Ee, ürünün kendisi gıda katkı maddesi yani maya. Kapsamı ekmek mayası. Ayrıca detaylı da verebiliriz. Ya da mesela diyelim ki TS, e, TS simik e, bir standardı alınmış olsun. Ee, yine laboratuvarlarla ilgili bu belgelendirme esasında onaylı laboratuvar şartı vardır. Ee, yine numune miktarlarının uluslararası standartlara uygun alınması gerekir. Üretim tesisine yönelik şartların sağlanmış olması gerekir. Bulaşma risklerinin kesinlikle e, bertaraf edilmesi gerekir. Temas, e, İslam'a göre helal olmayan üründe temasın engellenmesi, dezenfektasyonların çok iyi yapılmış olması ilgili denetimlerin de olması gerekiyor kritik kontrol noktalarının çok iyi e, tespit edilip kontrol edilmesi, üretim yeri inceleme, çoğunda yerinde inceleme olması bekleniyor. E, girdilerin helal gıda üretimine uygun olup olmadığı, şimdi fabrika üretimi ise, endüstriyel üretimse girdilerin de kontrolü gerekiyor. E, veya işte otellerde de benzer durum var. E, yine makinenin makinelerin temizliğinde yağ, kullanılan yağların helalle sorunlu şeyler olmaması gerekiyor. Personelin hijyeniyle ilgili sağ şartlar gerekiyor. Bir örnek tablo e, yıllık denetim e, şeklinde e, gözetimler, birinci, ikinci gözetim e, yıllık e, yapılması ve belgelendirmenin e, yıl, her yıl yenilenmesiyle ilgili bir örnekte burada 
görebiliyoruz. Numune alma e, üretimleri incelemesinin mutlaka yapılması gerekiyor her yıl. Helal belgesi testleri nelerden oluşur diye baktığımızda hepsini okumayacağım. Birçok alanı ilgilendiriyor. Bitkisel ve hayvansal yağlar, et ve et ürünleri, kakao, şeker, şekerlemeler, ağıllar, yumurta, süt mamulleri, efendim, hazır yemekler, çay, efendim, gıda katkı maddeleri, tuz mesela jelatin, normalde şu anda madde haline geldi, e, e, su, Bunlar gibi test analizler de helal e, açısından meşrubatlar, efendim balık ürünleri, baharatlar, nişasta, yağlı tohumlar, kozmetik ve benzer. Yani birçok bunu aslında laboratuvarla ilgili hale geliyor. Yani deney üzerinden belgelendirilebiliyor. Yoksa saf haliyle belgelendirilemiyor. Dolayısıyla belgelendirmenin e, içerisinde deneyin ne kadar önemli olduğunu da görmüş oluyoruz. İslam hukuk açısından değerlendirmesine gelirsek kısaca. Helal deney konusu aslında İslam ve bilimin kesiştiği bir noktadır. Yani e, İslam ve bilim e, ortak noktada insanlığın hizmeti için, e, başta inananlar olmak üzere ama tüm insanlığın hizmeti için ortak bir noktada buluşmuş olmaktadır. E, Müslüman bilim adamlarının hem fıtrata ve sağlığa uygun hem de dini inançlara riayetle yapacakları çalışmalar, e, Müslümanlar sadece Müslümanlar için değil, tüm dünya insanları için bir hizmet olacaktır. Helal ile ilgili şartlar aynı zamanda sağlıklı, temiz, yararlı ve insani olanı da e, içermektedir. E, buradaki e, helal logosu, helal işareti konulan ürünlerde e, şöyle bir neticeye ulaşmayı amaçlamalıdır bu çalışmalar. E, bir kişi Müslüman veya Müslüman olmayan bir kişi helal belgesini gördüğünde e, bu gıda gerçekten temizdir, sağlığa zarar, zararlı değildir. E, bu gıda yetmiştir diyebileceği güven verecek bir e, şeye ulaşması beklenir e, çalışmaların. Bunun için de deneylerin fevkalade önemi vardır. E, fırsatlar nelerdir? İslam bilim krizine e, bir çözüm açısından olumlu bir konudur bu konu. Helal deneyler sağlık açısından da güvenli sonuçları içermektedir. Helal e, diğerli şartlarda taşı, taşıdığı için bu açıdan bir fırsat olarak değerlendirilebilir. Yine helal ticaretinin artmasına yönelik e, büyük bir katkısı olup ekonomiye katkı sağlayacaktır. E, ayrıca İslam ülkelerinde özellikle de Türkiye'de helal deney yapılacak laboratuvarların varlığı ümit vericidir. Bunların geliştirilmesi ve bu standartlara uygun hale getirilmesi beklenmektedir. E, İslami kuralların standartize edilip insan sağlığına hizmet edecek şekilde hizmete sunulması son derece sevindirici bir gelişmedir. E, bu helal standartları ayrıca ekonomi alanında da e, etkiye sahip olmuş ve ekonomi konusunda da standartizasyona doğru gidildiği görülmektedir. Riskleri nelerdir peki bunların? Helal Sevgili deneyleri... hocam toparlayabilirsek teşekkür ederim. Hemen son iki slaytımız bitiyor. Teşekkür ederim. Helal deneylerin akadde olmadan belgelendirme kullanması risktir. E, gerek, ge, gerektiğince riayet edilmemesi İslami kurallara, standartlara veya e, bu bir risktir. Gayrimüslim yöneticilerin, yöneticilere olan şirketlerin hala büyük paya sahip olması. Bunu az önce bahsedeceğim dediğim şey buydu. Helal belgelendirme yapan e, kuruluşların yöneticilerinin Müslüman olma şartı e, sadece dini bir şart olarak değil Müslümanların kendi işlerini kendileri yapması kendi problemleriyle kendilerinin çözüm üretmesiyle ilgili e, temelde e, daha e, toplumsal ve siyasi bir konudur. E, yoksa gayrimüslimlerin ürettiği şeyler eğer helal açısından sorun yoksa e, dini bakımdan sorun teslim ettiği için değildir ama bu önemli bir politikadır. Ben de bunu destekliyorum. Laboratuvar denetim ve hizmetlerinde eksik denetim ihtimali vardır. Harama bulaşma riski vardır bahsettik. Yine cihaz temizliklerinde harama bulaşma riski vardır ve personel hassasiyetleri ve personel eğitim açısından riskler vardır. Son olarak sonunda e, şunları söyleyebilirim. Helal yaşam konusunda yakın tarihteki gelişmeler ümit vericidir. Özellikle bu organizasyonda da bunu görüyoruz. Helal alanında hem standartizasyon hem de akreditasyon alanlarında büyük atılımlar meydana gelmiştir. Helal deney konusunda olumlu gelişmeler devam ediyor. Simik de iki tane standart deney üzerine tekrar yayınlanmıştır. Buradaki temel dikkat çekmek istediğimiz son olarak husus helal, helal deney konusundaki teorik gelişmeler çok iyi, çok ümit verici olmakla birlikte e, uygulamadaki risklerin de göz ardı edilmemesi gerekir. Yani uygulamada e, bazı riskler olabilir. Uygulamanın takibi, belgelendirmenin takibi bu süreçlerde fevkalade önemlidir diyorum. 
E, ben de beni dinleyen herkese e, teşekkür ediyorum. Saygılar sunuyorum. Thank you so much, Professor, for your valuable speech. Now we are connecting to Malaysia. I would like to invite Dr. Mohamed Shirvan Abdullah Sani from International Islamic University of Malaysia. Dr. Salamat Datang, welcome. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Assalamualaikum uh, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Everyone, how are you in Turkey? Okay. Uh, uh, selamat malam as well. So in Malay, we call it selamat malam. Uh, Terima kasih. Okay, sama-sama. Okay. So allow me to share my screen. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming as well, uh, joining to hear my talk. Okay, so just a small talk, a simple talk. So for uh, today, okay, uh, in Malaysia now tonight, okay, uh, we are going to share, uh, we are going to discuss about food antimicrobials, yeah, uh, addressing the potential sources for halal food uh, preservative. Okay, so my name is Mohamad Shiran Abdul Lassani. So currently I'm the head of laboratories of International Institute for Halal Research and Training in the International Islamic University Malaysia. Okay, I will share this uh, PowerPoint later so that if you have anything to contact, uh, you want to share, you want to discuss, you want to make a collaboration. Uh, so in the future, okay, you can contact me directly to this uh, link and through my email, okay? So in the introduction, uh, I have to put it. Okay, so Islam has outlined that the guide uh, to the life of Muslim, okay, including uh, the need to find halal and toy food. Okay, so halal food is defined as permissible and lawful for consumption according to Al Quran and the Sunnah. So, as we all know now, uh, in uh, any country in the world now, there are so many food operators. So, food operators now are compulsory to follow the good hygiene practice, or we call it GHP, and as well as good manufacturing practice, or GMP. The aim of it to avoid uh, any food spoilage, okay? So, in order to achieve that, uh, generally food antimicrobial agents, or we call it FAA, are commonly used and uh, to incorporate it or to be uh, coated onto the uh, food, okay? During the food production, um, and then uh, the uh, it also can, uh, the aim uh, of it, uh, to eliminate the food spoilage and as well as uh, pathogens. Eh? So these antimicrobials uh, in animal origins are actually the biggest challenge for food operators in order than uh, to uh, incorporate the halal concept, okay, because there are so many doubtful of animal origin uh, food, uh, food antimicrobial agent, uh, which sometimes they may be uh, originated from uh, from, uh, from pig, for example, or non slaughtered animals, okay, or even from human or origin which are uh, filthy. Okay, so this discussion, uh, this sharing uh, for today is uh, to highlight the importance of incorporating halal and toyiban concepts when developing the halal food antimicrobials from animal source, and also to uh, this review, uh, this discussion as well to uh, present the challenges that food operators will uh, generally or usually face, uh, and then. We also can, uh, I also that uh, would like to share about the testing uh, on the uh, food, uh, sorry, food antimicrobial uh, assay, as well as on the halal testing uh, um, to confirm the uh, presence of non-halal uh, ingredient, okay? So generally for halal food antimicrobial uh, agents, uh, the FAA, uh, it is an additive used in food processing to prevent antibiological deterioration, which is classified as preservative. Okay? So the FDA, or we call it US Food and Drug Administration, uh, already defined uh, two categories of uh, food uh, antimicrobial agent. So the first one is antimicrobial agent that have direct contact uh, on food and as well as uh, the agent that used in water that have contact uh, with food or use as a food contact substances, okay? And um, for Malaysia, uh, we have developed uh, or issue a new Malaysian standard, which is uh, MS-1500 for food. 
uh, food production, the version is 2019, okay, where it's uh, state that the halal foods not only uh, should not contain najis or naj, which is referred to uh, pigs, dogs, and their descendants, but also it should be free from any poison, intoxicate. Uh, intoxication and hazardous material. Eh? This will include at any uh, stage eh, uh, of uh, having foodborne pathogens and eh, during preparation, processing, even until to distribution. Okay, so the, this Department of Malaysia who issued this uh, Malaysian standard uh, one thousand five hundred also state that. Uh, any kind of uh, food uh, originated from uh, slaughtered animal, according to Sharia, uh, should be considered as halal. Uh, thus, uh, because of some antimicrobial agent that used to preserve the food, sometimes we have uh, an issue of the uh, status. So it should uh, be uh, examined eh, on this thing. Okay. So uh, I've provide some example. Uh, this is the common one um, antimicrobial agent that being used in food. So you can see on the first uh, part, uh, we have lactoferrin. Okay, so lactoferrin generally it, it uh, it's a, a protein. Eh? So it can be uh, uh, coming from the eggs, eh? from mammals, and even from milk white blood uh, cells, even saliva, and tears from mammals, including the human. So the status of this lactoferrin, it, it is uh, if become not halal, if it is from human and uh, non-halal animals. However, it uh, have been uh, approved as, uh, as grass and eh, generally uh, recognized as safe eh, for human consumption. We also have uh, uh, other animal source, such as uh, kytosan. So generally, it came uh, from the shrimp, uh, crab, and also crayfishes. So this one is generally halal, but some um, uh, school of thought may consider that it's not halal, okay, uh, according to a uh, certain uh, school of thought. So, but uh, this kaitosan uh, is also has been proved as uh, grass and eh, safe for consumption. We also have uh, an example of uh, pleurocidine. This is a new one, okay. This uh, came from the uh, winter flounder fish, so the protein of it, okay. Uh, so generally it's halal. But however, there is no report yet regarding the uh, safety of this uh, uh, uh, antimicrobial uh, agent, the uh, pleurocidine. Okay, so for another one, we have uh, the common, um, uh, the most uh, use uh, use uh, antimicrobial agent. So we call it free fatty acid. This one can uh, can be uh, originated from plants as well as uh, from animals. Okay, but if it is uh, animals, usually it came from the milk. Okay even if the human having the uh, fatty acid. So it's become halal if the source are from the uh, uh, plant and even if become halal as well, if uh, there is use in, uh, uh, if it is uh, came from the slaughtered animal, okay? So in terms of this antimicrobial uh, agent, they have been uh, uh, uh, applied in certain foods. So you can see in the lactoferrin, it's been used in yogurt, powdered milk, okay, instant formula, milk desert, even chewing gum and drinking water as well. Sorry, drinking water has been uh, added uh, with kaitosan. Uh, for pleurocidine, it has been added to apple juice, okay? And also free fatty acid has been used in uh, uh, certain bread, for example and even any meat product, okay? However, uh, beside of the issues of the halal status, we have to remember that uh, when we talk about halal, it is come together with toyiban, which means it should be safe, uh, wholesomeness, uh, uh, having a good quality. So uh, in uh, producing, uh, incorporating the halal antimicrobial agent, they also need to address some issues. So I provide three issues uh, beside of the halal, we cover on Toyiban part as well. So the generally recognized as safe, or we call it grass, and the content limit of food antimicrobial agents. So this concept of halal not only confined to permitted food, but also its nutritious value and safety for consumption. Okay, so this is the, the, the comment on uh, Toyiban part. So this concept has led to the broader halal purpose in which halal and Toyiban should involve two elements. Halal means are justified by Sharia, while Toyiban means safe, healthy, nutritious, and good quality. Because of this, of issues of some antimicrobial agent which may be toxic, okay? So uh, the uh, certain body, accreditation body such as Europe, uh, European Union Commission, UEC, and as well as the FDA, they produce the safeguard list, okay? Which, which they list down the antimicrobial agents, uh, uh, the safe one for consumption. So uh, uh, for this time, the EUC has listed uh, food antimicrobial agent in everything added to food, 
okay uh, where the fda recognize the ingredient as safe for use uh, uh, uh, for uh, consumption in food okay and then another issue is about the toxicity okay so the application of food antimicrobial agent dose the dose itself should be based on the maximum use level and the toxicity value to comply the uh, comply with the manufacturing of halal and food products and reduce the adverse effects on consumers so in this case uh, we have uh, not only uh, looking on the capability of that antimicrobial agent to inhibit the growth of pathogen or bacteria you have to know uh, the uh, uh, investigate the repeat dose toxicity. You repeat a few uh, uh, concentration of that uh, antimicrobial agent and try to check uh, how toxic it is. Uh, you uh, analyze the genotoxicity and the casino uh, genetoxicity. Okay, so for doctor, repeat dose toxicity, doctor, it will be. Uh, come, come, other two minutes, terima kasih. Okay, thank you. Uh, the repeat dose toxicity address the type of effect, and then the genotoxicity uh, is uh, to establish the identify the toxicity effect from the interaction of the carcinogen that renders the DNA damage. Okay, and the last one is the organo organoleptic issue, such as uh, it may cause uh, if this uh, antimicrobial agent is safe, you have to ensure that it is accepted by the consumers. In this case, if they have a, a bad smell. Uh, deep, uh, very bad color change. Yeah, uh, so this is affect the quality of the food. So consumer may be reluctant to purchase uh, the food when some organoleptic issues uh, occur in their food. Okay, so I provide this well uh, uh, the the same uh, table so you can see the toxicity of this uh, uh, uh, antimicrobial agent. So uh, generally that uh, for pleurocidin is the new one, uh, antimicrobial agent has been reported, even though it's from fish, but they need uh, further study on the carcinogenicity uh, uh, and toxicity, and also repeat dose toxicity, okay? And um, for the organoleptic issue, uh, Kaitosan is tasteless, and so they doesn't have a very bad issue related to organoleptic issue. However, for fat, uh, free fatty acid, uh, it will cause rancidity because of uh, containing of trans and uh, cis uh, fatty acid. So, uh, this toxicity may uh, give some bad odor to your food. Okay. So uh, about testing now, I will share with you the food antimicrobial uh, uh, food antimicrobial activity assay. Uh, so we pro we need to perform some diffusion tests, uh, minimum inhibitory concentration, and time kill curve, leg phase, log phase, and growth rate uh, uh, of the antimicrobial uh, uh, extract uh, to check whether the what are the uh, concentration that which is very effective on killing the bacteria and then we also need to perform the halal test where we need to perform the test on the ingredient not at the uh, fi final product okay so this will cover on dna test with the specific primer you may also if you're dealing with the polypeptide you may use the lcq top ms liquid chromatography time of flight mass spectrometer where generally for protein or peptide uh, nowadays we have the uh, library uh, worldwide so that you can compare uh, from the spectrum and then for any fatty acid that uh, i've been show here uh, we can use gcms gas chromatography mass spectrometer equipped with multivariate data analysis which has been uh, discussed previously from uh, by the previous uh, speaker okay so this is how the antimicrobial uh, uh, test you can use this diffusion test uh, and then you may know the level of uh, how strong it is uh, based on the uh, inhibition zone here okay and then you want to know the concentration the effective concentration that able to kill the pathogen you need to perform the minimum inhibitory concentration test where any uh, percentage inhibition reach 100 percent that concentration will become uh, effective and MIC that able to inhibit the growth of the pathogens. Eh? So for halal testing, uh, uh, this is, uh, you can use the real-time PCR yeah, to analyze the DNA. Uh, and then for polypeptide, for example, you have uh, the uh, uh, uh, pleurocidine, okay? you can use the lc -Qtof. And GCMS for fatty acid, uh, equipped with the multivariate data analysis. So you, you can see here that uh, the blue color and the green color dot are dif clearly differentiated where the uh, blue color are having uh, uh, porcine uh, fatty acid while the green color is uh, the uh, halal one. Okay. 
the last but not least, okay, uh, remember uh, uh, now uh, for Malaysia, we have been uh, built, uh, what you call that one, uh, equip uh, or add in the concept of halal deal in in the production itself, which is if you are going to uh, produce a product, make sure you start from the earlier. Make sure it's already halal from the first stage of purchasing the ingredient. In this case, you need to test the ingredient itself at the first place, whether it's halal or not. Where uh, instead of testing it at the end of the uh, uh, production, okay. So the conclusion here, um, the concept of halal toyiban should be viewed holistically. Okay, um, it's not also halal, which should make sure it's safe for consumption, doesn't have a negative effect to the consumer, and then I need to have a further studies. Okay, on the other natural uh, product, uh, sometimes synthetic one. Remember some uh, uh, in some uh, cases, the use of uh, boric acid in. Um, Carbohydrate uh, uh, food such as noodle, it is uh, not allowed, it's banned because boric acid causes cancer, even though it's synthetic, but it causes cancer. So it's not toyib eh, in this case. And the last one, the concept of toyiban should be included in the nutritional aspect. Okay? Hence, it is crucial to study the food antimicrobial uh, level of toxicity and limitation to avoid the health issues since the food should not be only halal but also should be safe for the consumer. So I think that's all from me. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Terima kasih dan selamat malam, Malaysia. Now, I would like to invite General Secretary of CIMIC, Mr. Ihsan Övüt, for uh, our plug award ceremony. Welcome on stage, sir. We would like to thank our speakers who made the session 10 for their valuable speech. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Abdullah Öksüz. Thank you so much, Dr. Shojay Alibadi from Farouk Life Sciences Research Laboratory from Iran. It was a pleasure to have you on 6th World Halal Summit stage. And thank you, Mr. Salih Şengezer from High Board of Religious Affairs, Presidency Religious Affairs, Turkey. giving a break right now uh, just just a little announcement we are inviting all of our speakers at the end of the session for the next session it will be the last session for today and for the program um, we will have a, a photography session all together so this is a little announce announcement now we are giving break for 10 minutes then we will be back uh, after a while
to you. Welcome back. We are starting session 11, New Developments and Opportunities. For this session, I would like to invite our honorable speakers, starting from Associate Professor Yüksel Okşak from Uludağ University, Turkey, and Mr. Gökhan Dalgan, lecturer from Kütahya Dumlu Pınar University, Turkey, Ms. Saida Ahmet, founding director, Education Partnership UK, Ms. Iman Ali Liyakat, Research Analyst from Dinar Standard United Arab Emirates, Professor Dr. Irvan Dijasvir, International Islamic University of Malaysia, Mohamed Jinnah, Chairman, The World Halal Day, Singapore. Welcome to, uh, welcome to this stage. Now I would like to invite our first speaker, Associate Professor, Yüksel Okşak from Uludağ University, Turkey. Welcome on stage, sir. This, the stage is yours. Dear guests, welcome our stage right now. I prefer to introduce and uh, present my presentation uh, to main language Turkish. But first of all, I want to, I have a special thanks to Mr. Yunus Ete, who is organized this lovely and wonderful organization for us. Bugün, uh, kendi bölümümüzde küreselleşme, ekonomik büyüme, dış ticaret bağlamında helal gıda belgelendirme sürecine dair bir iktisadi çerçeve aslında çizmeye çalışacağım. Şöyle ki, bir kere işin en başına gidersek teknolojik gelişmelerin aslında dünyayı bir küreselleşme e, ivmesine götürdüğünü söyleyebiliriz. Yani süreç nasıl başladı ve e, helal sertifikasyon süreciyle ilgili e, bugüne nasıl geldik kısmı aslında e, işin e, ana çıkış noktasına bizi götürüyor. Yani e, özellikle e, sanayi devrimiyle beraber başlayan kitlesel üretim ve teknolojik gelişmeler önce küreselleşmeyi küreselleşme de peşi sıra kültürel dönüşümü aslında e, hayatımızın merkezine e, getirdi. E, bu da e, ciddi bir rekabet dünyasını aslında ortaya koydu ve e, toplumun tüketim alışkanlıklarının ciddi manada farklılaşmasını beraberinde getirdi. Bu evrilen süreç aslında e, daha gelişmiş, dünyanın daha gelişmiş bir kısmı olan batı kültürünü de e, aslında artan ticaret hacminin içerisinde helali nereye konumlandırdığımızı ve yerini biz e, tespit etmeye ve görmeye çalıştık. Şimdi kapitalist sistem tabii sürekli olarak e, yüksek büyüme trendi isteyen bir e, yapı ve formata sahip. E, yani üretimi olabildiğince arttırdığınız ve e, bilinen insanlık tarihinin belki de en yoğun e, büyüme süreçlerinin yaşandığı bir dönemde yaşıyoruz. İşte mesela basit bir örnekle söylemek gerekirse 71, 1971'de yaklaşık 5 bin dolar civarı olan dünyadaki kişi başına gelir düzeyi günümüzde yani 10 bin doların üzerine iki katından biraz fazlaya kadar çıkmış durumda. Yani bireylerin satın alma güçleri bu manada çok ciddi şekilde artmış olduğunu söylememiz mümkün. Şimdi bu ekonomik büyüme aslında beraberinde gelirinizi tetikliyor ve dolayısıyla dünya üzerindeki bireylerin birçoğu geçmişe nazaran, geçmiş yıllara nazaran daha farklı bir ekonomik güce sahip oluyor. Şimdi bu artan refah, peşi sıra küreselleşme ve teknolojiyle, e, artan teknolojiyle beraber bir popüler tüketim kültürü ve anlayışını bizim hayatımızın e, tam ortasına, merkezine getirmeye çalıştı. Bu tüketim alışkanlığı kazanılması e, Müslüman e, toplumlar, Müslüman bireyler üzerinde de dikkatle durulması gereken aslında bizim temel ekonomik konularımızdan biri. 
Çünkü bize dayatılan bu popüler kültürün getirmiş olduğu tüketim anlayışıyla İslam'ın bize sunduğu tüketim anlayışı arasında çok ciddi farklar var. Şimdi biraz bunlardan konuşalım. Mesela gıda ürünleri yine bu zirvenin belki de mihenk taşı konularından biriydi. Batı kültürü bu manada size bir empozizasyon yapıyor. Yani liberalleşen ve kapitalist dünyanın biliyorsunuz en büyük enerjisi tüketim. Tüketim olmadıktan sonra sistem çöküşe doğru geçiyor. Fakat İslam'daki kalıplar biraz daha farklı. Yani İslam bize ihtiyacımız nispetinde bir tüketimi ve e, öneriyor ve israftan da şiddetle kaçınmamız gerektiğini bize lanse ediyor. Dolayısıyla karşımızda aslında bir paradoks var. Yani birbiriyle çelişen iki durum var. Böyle bir durumda yani farklılaşan ürünler işte yeni dünya düzeninin bize sunmuş olduğu işte promosyonlar çocuklar üzerinde dahi aslında gitgide kat kat ayrışan işte oyuncaklar ve diğer ürünler eskiden bu kadar ciddi bir uzmanlaşma yoktu biliyorsunuz. Yani her ürün grubunda seçebileceğiniz ürünlerin sayısı bir ya da ikiydi. Ben girişimcilik derslerini falan anlatırken öğrenci arkadaşlarımıza onu söylüyordum. Yani bugün tüketici krallığının fethini yaşıyoruz aslında. Yani evvelden ne üretirseniz satardınız, bugün ne satarsanız onu üretmek zorundasınız. Çünkü karar verici tüketici. Öylesine yoğun bir rekabet var ki. Bu rekabet sizin tüketmeniz için her yolu deniyor. Reklamla, promosyonla ve diğer tüm e, algı, e, sizde algı oluşturacak her yol ve yöntemi tercih ediyor. Şimdi böyle bir durumda e, işi sağlık cephesinden de bakarsanız aslında gıda tüketimiyle ilgili konuştuğumuzda artık malumunuz dünyanın hemen hemen birçok ülkesinde obazite çocukluk yaşından başlayan çok ciddi bir problem olarak tüketim toplumunun bir sonucu olarak karşımızda böyle bir koskocaman bir problem var. Ee, çocuklarda yaşanılan e, obezite problemi. Dolayısıyla yani kapitalist sistem bize sürekli olarak büyüme trendlerini yakalayabilmek için inanılmaz derecede arttırılmış bir e, yapı e, sunuyor. Şimdi İslam hassasiyetleri yüksek, bireylerin daha fazla gündeme getirdiği ve helal olarak bizim aslında kabul ettiğimiz ürünlerin tüketilmesi konusunda farklı bir bakış açısını bugünün gündemine taşıması gerekiyor. Yani Müslüman kimliğini taşıyan birçok birey aslında e, tükettiği şeylerin içeriğini artık öğrenmeye, İslam'a uygun olup olmadığına göre daha da fazla artık yani algıda seçicilik olgusunun iyice yerleştiği bir uyanış trendi yaşıyor bana göre yani son yıllarda. Yani her şeyi de böyle kötü bir fotoğraf çerçevesi içerisinde anlatmak istemiyorum. Mesela iyi taraflarından biri de bu. Bizim genç nesillerimiz şu an bu manada bir önceki jenerasyonlara göre çok daha iyi durumda. Yani helal gıda piyasasının sürdürülebilirliği açısından bu yoğun rekabetin, kapitalizmin, küreselleşmenin bize getirmiş olduğu ve dayattığı argümanlardan özenle korunması ve manipülatif açıdan da bir takım reaksiyonlara tabi tutulmasının önüne geçmemiz e, gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Şimdi uluslararası arenada e, insan hareketliliğinin artışıyla beraber e, çeşitli ırklardan, inançlardan insanlar biliyorsunuz artık dünyanın her coğrafyasında yaşıyor. Koç kocaman bir köyden bahsediyoruz. Yani bugün bu salonda bile birçok bir ülkeden konunun tarafı olan insanlar birkaç günlüğüne hatta zaman zaman bir günlüğüne bile bir araya gelip tekrar yaşadıkları coğrafyaya çok hızlı bir şekilde dönebiliyorlar. Dolayısıyla insanların finansın ve emtianın inanılmaz derecede e, mobiliteye sahip olduğu bir dünyada yaşıyoruz. Şimdi Batı dünyasında daha çok ciddi bir Müslüman e, nüfus yaşıyor ve bu gitgide artıyor. Dolayısıyla yani İslami üsullere uygun gıda maddelerinin tüketimi talebi de hem batıda hem de diğer tüm Müslümanların yaşadığı coğrafyalarda gitgide artıyor. Bu durumda gündemimize neyi sokuyor? Helal gıda sertifikalı ürünlerin uluslararası ticaretteki durumunu. Ya bu pazar gitgide büyüyen ve artan bir pazar. Her geçen yıl artıyor. Şimdi bu bağlamda baktığımızda yani hem İslam coğrafyasında hem de batılı ülkelerde yaşayan Müslümanların e, İslami hassasiyetlere sahip, işte, popüler kültürün aşındırıcılığını da tabi Özellikle vurguladım. Bunu da dikkate alacak şekilde bireylere doğru, etkili, 
İslami anlayışı da bir manada geliştirecek ve bugüne regüle edecek eğitimleri ve sosyal politikaları da aslında bir taraftan oluşturmamız gerekiyor. Yani biz bu zirve boyunca örneğin e, helal gıdanın, helal kozmetin ya da helalin olduğu her alanla ilgili gelişmeleri konuşuyoruz ama çok hızlı koşan bir dünyada da biz gerçekten bu manada eğitim e, bireyleri eğitiyor ve onlar için bir sosyal politika üretiyor muyuz? Bir farkındalık yaratıyor muyuz? Bu da bu işin uluslararası ticaretinin gelişmesi adına oldukça önemli ve kıymetli bana göre. İkinci temel argümanımız bu tabi biz değinip geçeceğiz yani bir iktisatçı olarak daha çok e, ilahiyatçı hocalarımızı konusu ama yani İslam'da nasıl bir tüketim öngörülüyor? Birçok kez zikredildi açılış konuşmalarında falan da hatırlıyorum. Yani Enam suresi örneğin 145. ayette tüketimi caiz olmayan gıda maddeleri aslında grup halinde Yüce Allah bize bunların hepsini e, belirtiyor ve söylüyor. Aslında genel toplamada baktığınızda e, gıda ürünlerinin aslında çok küçük bir kısmı zaten haram kılınıyor. E, diğer maddelerin çoğu bizim için tüketilebilir durumda. Yasaklı olan gıda maddelerinin içerisinde çok küçük bir yer kaplıyor dolayısıyla. Yine e, tabii biz bunları birer meta olarak değerlendirdiğimizde gruplayıp ayırabiliyoruz. İşte hangileri haram, hangileri helal bunların hepsini e, madde e, zihniyetiyle baktığımızda ayırmamız çok net zaten mümkün. Ama diğer taraftan bu öğretinin ve anlatının içerisinde farklı da bir tarafı var işin yani. İşin bir de manevi tarafı var. Yani işte komşusu açken tok yatan bizden değildir diye bir hadis-i şerifimiz var mesela. Yani bu aslında bir işe bir de bu, bu tarafından bakmak lazım. Yani paylaşımcı olmayı ve ihtiyaç sahiplerine de yardımcı olmayı zikreden bir e, yaradanın elhamdülillah e, yarattığı bireyleriz hepimiz. Dolayısıyla bu anlayışı da gözeterek e, olaya bakmamız gerekiyor. Orta yolu olmak israftan kaçınmak. Bu manada tabii benim çok alanım değil, e, haddim de değil ya, ilahiyatçı hocalarımızın e, olduğu platformlarda ama bu ölçülere dikkat ederek Müslüman coğrafyasında aslında üretilen birçok ürün artık uluslararası piyasada var. Klasik bir sözüm var benim. İhtiyaçlar organlar doğurur diye. Zaten böyle bir ihtiyaç da olmasa değil mi? Helal sertifikasyon kurumu da, simiç de bu helal zirvesi de zaten olmaz yani. Dolayısıyla dünyada böyle bir ihtiyacın artması, uluslararası piyasalardaki değerini yükselmesi sebebiyle bugün hepimiz aslında bir aradayız. Ve bu konuları açıp oturup hep beraber müzakere edebiliyor ve tartışabiliyoruz. Şimdi burada bu uluslararası pazar her geçen gün artıyor. Birazdan bir iki rakamda vereceğim. Dolayısıyla peşi sırada helal gıda sertifikasına sahip ürünler de ne yapıyor? Gündemimizin Baş köşesine oturuyor. Bu manada da bu piyasadaki önemli bir ihtiyacı da e, helal gıda sertifikasyon süreci bizlere sağlıyor. Yani iktisadi tarafı neresi diye aslında merak edip sorarsanız şu, uluslararası ticarette uluslararası sertifikasyon süreçlerini tamamlamış her ürün, helal helal olmayan fark etmez, diğer tüm ürünlerde dahil olmak üzere bunların uluslararası ticareti çok ciddi manada hızlanabiliyor. El değiştirme hızı çok ciddi manada artabiliyor. Hocam iki dakikanız var. Tamam. Şimdi mesela birkaç rakam. Kültürel asimilasyon tarafı ve manipülasyon tarafında hızlı geçeceğim. Sürem çok daraldı. Mesela 2018 yılı itibariyle 715 trilyon dolarlık bir pazardan bahsediyoruz. Ve raporlarda 2 katrilyon dolara kadar çıkabilecek bir potansiyele sahip 2027 yılı itibariyle. Şimdi bu çok büyük bir pazar ve üzerine koya koya devam ediyor. Artarak devam ediyor. En fazla dikkat çekmek istediğim yerlerden biri bu sunumda bir manada bu. Bir diğeri ise kültürel asimilasyon. Helal hayatımızın içerisinde bu zirvelerle, toplantılarla e, helalin tarafı olan kurum kuruluşlarının yaptığı çalışmalarla kültürel asimilasyona karşı bence çok ciddi bir karşı duruş olarak da dünyadaki yerini bir manada alıyor. Bunu ben söylemiyorum. Birçok yabancı yazar da söylüyor. Bunların içerisinde Müslüman olmayanlar da var. Yani göçmenler için özellikle mesela kültürel olarak da asimilasyon olma endişesi taşıyan göçmenleri bir arada tutan bir unsur olarak da görülüyor. Mesela işte Midamar diye bir şirket bu örneği çok beğenmiştim biraz araştırma yapıp okurken. İşte piyasaya sürdükleri helal gıda bandrollü ürünler aracıyla Müslüman bireylerin 
Batılı kültürü içerisinde asimilasyonunun önüne geçiyor mesela. Bu çok kıymetli bir şey. Ya bana göre şu ana kadar konuştuğum tüm kelamların içerisinde en kıymetli nokta bence burası. Bir duruş. İşin bir de e, duruş ve manevi tarafı var. Bu manada baktığımızda aslında helal gıdanın uluslararası piyasalardaki dominantlığı arttıkça e, farklı kültürlerde yaşayan bireylerin içinde yaşadıkları kültürel asimilasyon önünde bir dik duruş sergilemelerine sebep oluyor. Dolayısıyla mesela Tabakoğlu Hoca'nın da çok güzel bir sözü var. Ee, bu asimilasyon ve küreselleşmenin getirdiği olgularla ilgili, ekonomik büyüme tarafıyla ilgili. Mesela diyor ki, dünyanın açlıktan ölenlerle aşırı beslenmeden ölenlerin bir arada bulunduğu bir yer haline dönüştüğünü belirtip bu duruma da çok ciddi bir eleştiri getiriyor. Üretim yönünden baktığımızda karşılıklı alışverişte üretici malının tüm yönleriyle eksikliğiyle açıklanması gerektiği gibi yine katılım bankalarının da bu süreçte çok daha aktif rol alması gerektiği gibi bir takım eleştiriler de getirebilirim. Neye eleştiri getiriyorum? Helal gıda ya da helal ürünlerin uluslararası piyasada biz ne yaparız da daha aktif olmasını sağlarız ha? getirdiğim eleştirilerden biri de budur. Katılım bankaları bu manada çok daha pasif durumda, çok daha iyi durumda olabilirler. Bu konuda gayret sarf etmeleri için çağrıda bulunmuş olalım. Sonuç itibariyle iki katı büyüyen bir iki katından fazla büyüyen ve hala daha içinde bulunduğumuz işte e, resosyeni süreç ve koronavirüs sürecine rağmen 2007 yılında çok ciddi manada büyüyecek bir pazardan bahsediyoruz. Kişi başına gelirin arttığı bir dünyada helal pazar gitgide büyüyor. Fakat buna e, ilişkin biz de sosyal politikalarımızı e, eşdeğer olarak götüremiyoruz. Biraz orada sanki zorlanıyoruz ve bu manada önemli bir yer edinmemiz gerekiyor. Biz bunu yaptıkça karşı duruşu ve asimilasyonun önüne de geçmiş olacağız. Bunu da belirtmek istiyorum. Yine uluslararası gıda ticareti sonucu dünyanın farklı coğrafyalarından gelen Müslüman coğrafyasında üreten birçok ürün bu söylediğimiz ekonomik büyüme ve dış ticarete ilişkin önemli eleştirilere karşı geliştirilecek politikalarla çok daha iyi yer edineceğini ee, düşünüyorum. Ee, herkese beni dinlediği için saygı ve sevgilerimi sunuyorum. Sağ olun, var olun. Thank you so much for your valuable speech. Uh, now I would like to give the microphone to Dr. Gökhan Dalgan, lecturer from Kütahya Dumlu Pınar University, Turkey. His speech on Turkey and the world economy in perspective COVID-19 pandemic process with halal cosmetics and halal pharmaceutical market and economic growth relationship. Thank you, uh, thank you, sir. In countries, in countries where the majority the uh, society consists of Muslims, the concept of halal uh, is an uh, important factor uh, for cost, uh, consumption and uh, economy. The concept of uh, halal uh, product has emerged as an issue that uh, Muslim individuals attacked more important to, especially in uh, recent years. This concept, uh, which manifests itself uh, in the uh, fields of food, personal care, cosmetic, medicine, pharmacy, travel, uh, media, f finance, and fashion, uh, has become more and more uh, effective in people's lives. Today, Muslim consumers are uh, faced with a wide range uh, of product and service in the halal cosmetic and part, uh, pharmaceutical in industries. These products are uh, offered to consumers by uh, many uh, different companies or uh, brands, national or international uh, areas. The production and uh, sale of halal products uh, preferred by Muslims in the economic growth target, uh, the countries increased uh, their importance every passing uh, time. Therefore, uh, the halal cosmetic and pharmaceutical market uh, continues in uh, increase in the world uh, compared to uh, the previous year. COVID-19 pandemic uh, actual process in the world and uh, Turkey halal uh, cosmetic cosmetics and in the pharmaceutical market has uh, affected the increase in the negative. Companies, with the uh, adaptation of uh, consumers uh, to the pandemic process, they had to develop uh, e-commerce and uh, digital marketing uh, to increase uh, spending in the market. 
The COVID-19 pandemic process causes consumers to save on their spending. There is a contraction in demand. Import and export uh, figure, uh, the world are failing to do uh, their uh, levels level in recent years. Therefore, it is expected that the economic growth rates uh, of the countries will uh, decrease and the economies uh, will contract. This means that uh, halal cosmetics and pharmaceutical expenditure uh, will dec decrease in 2020. With the uh, acceleration and vaccination to this uh, and the increasing importance of consumers uh, to issues such as uh, health and hygiene, uh, it is expected that the demand uh, for uh, cosmetic and pharmaceutical products will increase significantly. To uh, halal cosmetic and pharmaceutical markets in the future, the change uh, in the global Islamic economy, uh, halal cosmetic and pharmaceutical market uh, for the year uh, to, uh, 2014 uh, 2020 are included. Pharmaceutical spending by Muslims uh, increased uh, from uh, $92 billion uh, in 2018 uh, to uh, $94 billion in 2019. Uh, due to, to uh, the COVID-19 crisis, crisis, Muslim uh, spending is uh, expected to decline by 6.9% uh, uh, to uh, $87 billion in 2020. However, uh, recovery is expected the following years. Muslim consumer spending in the pharmaceutical uh, industry is uh, expect, uh, expected to reach uh, 105 uh, billion dollars in 2024. Turkey uh, with uh, on, uh, 10 million dollar uh, halal pharmaceutical expenditure uh, in 2019 uh, ranked first in the world. According for 10% uh, uh, of the world's halal pharmaceutical expenditure, uh, Turkey uh, has an important trade volume in, in, the, in this uh, area. Halal cosmetics spending by Muslim consumers increased from $64 billion in 2018 to $66 billion in 2019, with a growth of 3.4%. In 2020, Muslim consumers spending is expected to fall by 2.5% to uh, 64 uh, billion dollars again due to uh, the COVID-19 uh, years uh, crisis. Uh, Muslim consumer uh, spending uh, in the cosmetic industry is expected to reach uh, 76 billion dollars 2024. Turkey had a cosmetic spending uh, 3.4 billion dollars in uh, 2017 raised in the 2019 to uh, 4 billion dollars. One of the important markets for LR cosmetic and uh, pharmaceutical is uh, undoubtedly uh, Turkey. 99% uh, uh, the population is Muslim. Uh, Turkey both has uh, the crossroads of two uh, continents locked between the, uh, two, uh, two relations and civilization and uh, important uh, possession is a, a country. Three uh, developments uh, of Turkey's uh, halal cosmetic and uh, pharmaceutical score. Global Islamic economic indicators uh, created by the scores in the table uh, between the years 2014 2018 uh, are looked in Turkey and global score comparison. According to the Global Islamic Economic Index score, uh, Turkey indicator scores are uh, higher uh, than the Global Index in the range uh, score each year. Turkey states of the Global Islamic Economic, Re Economic Report uh, in terms of Global Islamic Economy indicators prepared uh, by scores, it was range uh, 15 uh, in uh, 2018, uh, 13 in the 2019 and uh, 12 in uh, 2020. Turkey's rise in the last few years uh, seems to uh, lawful score and important step. Turkey, according to the data in the table, 
uh, the, although it can find uh, itself in the pole position in the country rank rankings, it shows that it is is at a better level uh, compared uh, to the global indicators scores. When analyzed uh, in terms of the change uh, year uh, 2016, uh, began with uh, the rise of the Turkey has uh, continued in 2018. In this case, global halal market grows increasingly, such as that the, uh, in terms of both global and Turkey. Uh, global Islamic economic indicator scores uh, halal pharmaceutical and between the years 2014-2019 uh, created by a cosmetic industry with distribution, Turkey and global score are uh, presented in co uh, comparison table. According to the halal uh, pharmaceutical and cosmetic industry lead indicator of Turkey raised the scores than the global index score uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, while Turkey and uh, economic indicator points uh, 40, uh, po 40 point, uh, 40.6 halal cosmetic and pharmaceutical, uh, the global index score was uh, 30, 31.08. Uh, uh, Turkey's halal pharmaceutical and cosmetic index score uh, 14.6 uh, point, uh, point uh, in 2019 uh, uh, increased uh, to uh, 48 score point. Since uh, 2017, the rise in the LL pharmaceutical and cosmetic uh, industry in Turkey, uh, the rise in the uh, first uh, 15 countries has a, a great importance. For uh, comparison of halal cosmetic and pharmaceutical market growth uh, in Turkey, economic growth and uh, COVID-19 process, in the future, since uh, 2015, uh, Turkey's uh, economic growth rate uh, and the growth rate spending uh, halal cosmetic parallelism is shown. Turkey's economic growth uh, was uh, released in uh, 2015, a decrease compared to the uh, previous year. Turkey, 6.0% uh, uh, economic growth uh, in 2015, has grown. Uh, 3.1% uh, uh, uh, in 2016. While the, uh, the halal cosmetics uh, market grew by 3.7% uh, uh, in uh, 2015, uh, it grew by 1.7% uh, uh, in 2016. The halal pharmaceutical market on the other hand, uh, country to economic growth and cosmetic market, while uh, it grew by 4% uh, in 2015, uh, it grew by 6.4% uh, uh, in, uh, in 2016. During the years of, uh, of economic growth, increase in the growth in the cosmetic market has also continued. Uh, due to uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic crisis, uh, the world eco uh, global, uh, global uh, economy is expected to sink by uh, more than 4% uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, all in all sector, uh, there will be continued the halal, part, uh, halal product market uh, in uh, 2020 and uh, after. Sir, you have two minutes left. Thank you. Thank you. Consolation, the number of Muslims uh, that make up uh, about 24% uh, of the world's population it creates uh, an individual uh, large market for business. The concept of halal is also uh, a symbol for uh, business in terms of production, conception, quality, and lifestyle. Hal halal certified pro products uh, are not only uh, demanded by Muslim consumers, uh, but also by consumers of other relations, uh, as the level of knowledge and awareness uh, about halal product increases the demand of uh, consumers uh, of other relation, especially uh, Jews and cr cr uh, Christians against such product uh, than, and to increase. Muslims who avoided the conception of product uh, that they did not comply uh, with their standards in the past, they uh, now de uh, demand uh, halal certified product that comply with uh, their beliefs paying addition to health, hygiene, uh, cleanliness and quality issues. Uh, taken as uh, a whole, uh, the halal product market uh, has high uh, potential as a grow growing uh, market. 
The global uh, halal cosmetic and pharmaceutical industry experienced uh, its best uh, year of uh, sale before COVID-19 uh, outbreak, while uh, the economic reduced sales, uh, especially at retail outlets, consumer behavior is uh, also uh, changed due to social distance and uh, wearing face masks uh, with the consumers beginning uh, to adapt to Uh, pandemic environment uh, companies uh, are uh, striving to import e-commerce and digital marketing. Uh, some way, uh, with the uh, refusing of health service by governments due to the uh, epidemic uh, and increasing the awareness of uh, the public's health, the halal cosmetic and pharmaceutical uh, market uh, is uh, preparing for a major breakthrough uh, after the uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. It was a pleasure to have you on the Six World Halal Summit stage. Now we are connecting to UK. Uh, our ne next speaker is Ms. Saida Ahmed, Founding Director, Education Partnership UK. Ms. Saida, Salam Alaikum and welcome. The stage is yours. Saida, we cannot hear you. Can you please check your microphone? Thank you. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah, we can. We can hear now. Thank okay. you. Great to see you. So, first of all, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Um, it's a great honor to be here today to talk about the opportunities for the... Um, for the global halal economy, but also for the OIC countries. And what I would like to do is not just talk about the opportunities, but the change in context and the and the challenges and how we can utilize that to create new opportunities. Um, is it possible to have my presentation up at the same time? Yes, please. Okay. So if we can just um, maybe ask the, uh, the organizers to upload the presentation in the background. Arkadaşlar, yardımcı olabilir miyiz? They are assisting right now. Thank you. Welcome. Arka planı değiştirebilir miyiz diye rica ediyor Saida Hanım. Hello. Hello. They're you assisting me? out. Just just a few minutes. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Saida, you need to change your. So we are facing some technical problems uh, to connect with Ms. Saida. 
We are moving our next speaker. Uh, when we have time, Af after that, uh, we will be connecting with Ms. Saida again. I would like to invite Ms. Iman Ali Liakat, research analyst from Dinar Standard, United Arab Emirates. Ms. Iman, welcome to World Halal Summit stage. Hello there. Wa alaikum as salam, Ms. Uh, Sajida Tuba and everyone. Confirming you can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. Perfect. Um, perhaps I can share my screen now and we can, uh, uh, you can unshare the screen from your side. Sure. Okay. Perfect. Um, Okay, Bismillah. Sugar, spice, and everything nice. These were the ingredients chosen to create the perfect supply chain. But Professor Utonium accidentally added an extra ingredient to the concoction, chemical X. Assalamu alaikum everyone, this is Iman Ali. And no, I'm not talking about Powerpuff Girls. Um, I'm a research analyst at Dinar Standard and today I'll be talking with you about halal food supply security, devising food security amidst COVID-19 crisis. So to run you through the uh, outline for, for today's discussion, which is based on the conference paper submitted. Um, firstly, I'll be discussing what food security is and why is it important for us? Um, followed by the purpose of the paper is primarily to highlight these impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the food supply chain, which categories are affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, and also to assess the major uh, food suppliers and to what extent they are affected. And lastly, we will discuss the chemical X. Right, I was talking about the solution, which is the triple helix model, and we will discuss further how this could be used to uh, combat the food security issues. So to begin with a uh, context on the food insecurity uh, at a global and the regional level, I have a few data points in front of you cited from the paper that's submitted. And you can see from these numbers how, um, how much of an food insecurity is an issue around the world. Well, 265 million people could face acute food insecurity by the end of 2020. And this is almost double from the pre-COVID-19. These repercussions will also be uh, seen in the OIC region where you have many countries which belong to the low income categories. Food insecurity and poverty are the major causes of uh, undernutrition and acute insecurity, food insecurity. And you can see the level of food wastage, not just at a consumer level, but also at a production level. And that is why it's important to discuss how to secure the food supply chain, because that's where the provenance of food starts from. So what is food security? Well, well the definition by FAO states that food security exists when all people and at all times have a sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. And in front of you on the right side, you can see the four key pillars of food security, which are availability, accessibility, utilization, and stability. And these four actually began with the supply of the food. And that brings me to the next part, which is the impact of COVID-19 um, on the supply chain. So in front of you here, um, well, before that, let me give you uh, a context. So what we are witnessing uh, now currently because of the pandemic is the disruption of food system like the ones that were faced in the 1990s crisis. Well, I was not there around that time, but I'm sure for those of you that were there and because and, and from the studies that are seen, supply chains collapsed immensely. Those experiences showed that the impact were strongly heterogeneous, which means that depending on the nature of the food commodity or any other commodity for that reason, and the resource intensity of the system, the economic uh, was affected likewise. Now in front of you, there are top 10 halal food categories of the 24 assessed. 
and they are ranked by the imports um, to the OIC. And these 10 are uh, constitute 75% of all of these imports to OIC. Now, as per the World Merch, uh, sorry, as per the World Trade Organization, um, the world merchandise trade is ex is forecasted for the next for this year and the next year. So, for this year, WTO forecasts that the imports or the trade overall will plummet, will go down by 9.2. However, in the following year, by 2021, the world merchandise will increase by 7.2%. Um, though it's a good sign for us, however, um, the numbers will still remain lower than the pre-COVID. Um, next in front of you, um, let me tell you the context again. So in order to secure the food supply chain and ensure that, you know, we don't experience anything lower than what's expected and we do get some benefits uh, later, we must also assess the food supply markets of the key products. That's what the industry, food industry must do. Here in front of you are the top 10 halal food categories, but this time they are ranked by the potential severe impact of, on the imports. Now, let me tell you how this is done. So the top 20 countries with active COVID-19 cases make up 70% of the cases worldwide. That's correct. These countries are right on the screen, 20 countries, which make up 70% of the overall cases. The assumption for this analysis is that if these 20 countries are among the top five exporters to OIC, then there is a high risk of disruption to the supply chain. So right here, you can see that the top category, which is meat and edible meat offal, has most of the countries that are affected by COVID-19 and about 66% of the exports are likely to be affected. With that uh, industry context, let's move to the government policy in uh, context and to what extent does food insecurity touch the OIC countries. And for that, there is an, there's an interesting analysis that's been carried out. Um, the food insecurity of OIC is done looking at the food imports, the level of net imports, um, sorry, the level of imports that are there in OIC, and also the level of food security in OIC. So on the left side, you can see a, a map that shows the import dependency based on the net imports. And you can see most of the regions, OIC regions here are dark blue in color, um, entailing that they're highly import dependent. And on the right side of the screen, you can see the map where the, um, where the countries are, are colored based on the Global Food in Security Index, which, um, which assessed seven, 37 OIC countries, among some others as well. Combining these two uh, aspects, we have, um, we have derived this food security framework to assess the level of readiness and the level of robust food security of the OIC countries. So um, this is the frame, this is, this is the matrix that's used. And let me take you step by step. So the first two that I will be discussing now are among the best situations for the OIC. So number nine on the matrix shows high food security and low import dependency. And this in fact is the ideal state for any country to be in. And you can see very well that Turkey and Malaysia made it to here. Um, and the second best, which is uh, the eighth one on the metrics, you can see that uh, this one talks about high food security and low import dependency. Sorry, there's an error here. This is supposed to be medium food security. So this is not very high, but a medium food security. and low import dependency, which is still good. And Indonesia made it to this metrics. Following two will be about the um, high food security. However, it would either be uh, medium import dependency, or in fact, it's also medium food security. So most of the developing countries, as you can see here, um, they have a high food security. 
However, their import dependency is also high. And you can see most of the GCC re regions and also Kazakhstan uh, made it to here. Next group we have is the medium food security, but high import dependency. And here we have Egypt and Algeria. Now, where does most of the uh, OIC region lie are these two uh, categories. Most of the OIC regions have a low or medium food security and also a medium import dependency. And as per the analysis, it is medium to a little high import dependency. So you can see that number one, food security is relatively low than it's supposed to be. And also the import dependency is relatively high for most of the countries here. But the good news is that none of the OIC member countries made it to the worst scenario, which is lowest food security and a very high import dependency. However, OIC countries still need to become number one, self-sufficient, and they need to strengthen their international and inter-OIC trade to improve their food security and become global suppliers instead of importers and also become key contributors to the zero hunger uh, SDG goals. Okay, the last part of this paper was to recommend the solution and that was the ingredient X that I was talking about, the triple helix model. The triple helix model is a very widely used model for policies and what it entails is a, a trilateral relationship between three key economic parties, the government, industry and the academia for the purpose of knowledge creation and capitalization. Moving to each of those, so for governments, they play a key role as uh, facilitators among the industry and the academics. So some of the uh, strategies, and by the way, these strategies are midterm strategies to be uh, considered for the coming one to three years at least. So some of these strategies include number one, financial incentives for both industries and the academics uh, to strengthen regional international coordination, especially intra-OIC trade, become self-sufficient nations, um, emer support emerging startups and SMEs, because as, as a matter of fact, most of the co companies in the uh, OIC and developing co countries are the SMEs and they are the future and Ms. commercialization Iman. of IP, mm. which I'll discuss further. Miss Iman, you have two minutes left. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Second, we have the industry and industry must take care of the supply chain and the effect on the supply chain and look for alternate product sourcing, utilize the government and academic support and, and basically leverage those supports. Lastly is the academia. The academia, um, something that's that is the knowledge creator of the economy. And governments need, uh, require to develop national centers of excellence for food safety. They require to, to uh, create more opportunities for people to specialize around uh, food areas. Um, and then a very important part is the commercialization of IP, not just to um, increase the awareness of intellectual property rights, but also to commercialize it, which means to bring it to the market and that industries can only help them to, to market and to take them forward. So this was the impact on the supply chain and um, also the trade and how the ingredient X, which is the triple helix model, can be used uh, to, to create a positive and a strong food security. Um, should, you, should you have any questions or require any further de details, please feel free to uh, contact me. And before I end the session, I want to say my uh, last few favorite lines, which are sugar, spice, and everything nice. But Professor Utonium accidentally added an extra ingredient to the concoction, chemical X. Thus, the triple helix model were born using their ultra superpowers, government, industry, and academia have collaborated together 
to create a perfect food supply chain for OIC. Thanks all, and I hope you enjoy and found this useful. Thank you, uh, Ms. Iman Ali. It was a pleasure to have you on World Health Summit stage. Now I. Now I would like to invite once more Ms. Saida Ahmed, Founding Director, Education Partnership UK, if we have no technical problems. Ms. Saida, do you hear us? Assalamu alaikum, I hear you. Wa alaikum salam. Everything is perfect, right? Yes. Okay, let's continue. The stage is yours. Okay. First of all, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. This is round two. And what we'd like to talk about and I'd like to uh, discuss is the opportunities, the issues and the challenges linked to um, to the halal economy and, uh, and the OIC countries. First of all, I think we need to look at the context. And when you look at the context at this moment in time, there's major shifts occurring. COVID-19 and... Uh, and the impact of COVID-19 has transformed so many countries and so many populations all over the world. What we're finding that we took for granted as um, stable economies are struggling under this pandemic, as, are, as is their populations. This actually creates, um, this creates issues and a massive opportunity uh, for, for the for the future, the other areas that are currently um, the other issues that are currently um, um, we're, we're facing is around, uh, for example, in Europe and in the UK is Brexit, and um, and this what Brexit is doing is actually creating uh, a scenario where. Um, where it's not just affecting the UK, but it's also affecting trade with um, with, with Europe and with uh, with other countries that may be linked to Europe. Some of those countries are actually OIC countries. The other area that we need to talk about um, uh, and, and and and discuss is it possible to change the screen, please? Sorry. is um, internationally what COVID-19 actually made us aware of is actually the, the, the big gaps in products, services and approaches and particularly when you look at the halal economy and the issues around resilience and uh, to, to, to, the, uh, to the actual uh, virus and how so many Muslim communities all over the world have been affected disproportionately to, to, to other communities. This has been for those people who are from South Asia, but also from um, uh, the, the Muslims and, and, and the populations in the Horn of Africa and, and various African Muslim countries. So that the changing dynamics um, of, of, of what will be important from 2021 onwards is going to create both a massive surge in new products and services around health, around well-being, uh, around, uh, uh, uh, uh, around general new ways of doing things and new ways of living our lives. This creates opportunities for trade for economic advancement, social advancement and environmental stewardship, which is embedded within the world. Um, uh, it, it, it's embedded within the world halal economy, but also creates linkages to OIC countries, both uh, in terms of intra OIC countries, but also their trade and their relationships with the wider world and non OIC member countries. Is it possible to, uh, to to move slides, please? So some of the areas we need to look at, for example, are the areas around um, about how resilient and how ready are the OIC countries. 
One of the things that I have found is that obviously with the OIC countries, there's over 56 member states. Those 56 member states are diverse in their economic uh, profile, in terms of their geography, in terms of the uh, of what, what their challenges are, but also in terms of how agile they are and able to respond to, to, to, to needs in a timely manner. The other thing we need to look at is which countries are able to supply and which countries are needing products. So it's looking at, uh, similar to, to, to what Iman mentioned, looking at those needs that we have within the countries and those that, we, that exist beyond the countries that the OIC countries may be able to actually uh, fulfill. So it's looking at the resilience of the economy and the nation itself and how self-sufficient they are, but then looking at what they can offer to others. True growth and, and, and opportunity, being able to take opportunities um, and, and, and nurturing those opportunities require the responsibility of skills development and enabling local people and local enterprises to be part of the solution and also the benefactors from any economic growth because there's no point in a nation growing whilst the population itself is living in poverty you know when you look at the women the youth the the, the people that the businesses the micro businesses if they're not able to take advantage of those opportunities really what you're going to get is a skewed growth within a country rather than the the whole country moving together and i think that this is where you know trade agreements and how those trade agreements are negotiated how they're nurtured for the benefit of the respective countries is really important so that it can't just be about making trade agreements and economic growth but also looking at how um uh, how the the the sdgs um how certain aspects such as um, um, the, the environmental issues, social responsibility, the sustainable development goals, how they are actually embedded within whatever trade agreements take place. Again, it's about making sure that now that COVID-19 is giving us an opportunity that opportunity is being um, we're, we're going ahead with sustainable solutions and world class solutions rather than reactive solutions that were based on a on, on, a, on an economic model that is no longer um, relevant the the really important things that we need to look at and some of the growth areas and opportunities which are currently challenges is how do we prevent a pandemic that we're facing currently to actually, um, how do we stop something like this? How do we prevent something like this? Um, devastating nations. How do we protect the people by giving them health, well-being, you know, food and nutritional security. It's not just about having food growing, but how do you make sure that it's nutritionally balanced and it caters within the halal uh, context and, and, and halal tayyib? Is it possible to move to the next stage? And then, as, as I mentioned, the areas for, for enterprise, for growth around health, around well-being and SDGs, looking at Halal Tayyab and how that is a fantastic model of increasing the health of nations, but also economic prosperity and what that can bring. How do we enable the entrepreneurship, micro-entrepreneurship, SME and their growth and look at the role of financial institutions and academia in skills development and enabling that to happen? We need to have cross-sector opportunities and cross-sector opportunities um, and actually the, the, the trade that will come from those cross-sector opportunities that is different to what already exists at the moment. And the, the future has to be sustainable. It has to have environmental and social impact built within it.
So what we can't have is that old silo model and the unique opportunity currently, again, that we have is that there's a much greater interest in digital enterprise, you know, platforms, creating opportunities for dialogue. Because of the travel restrictions, so many of us would not even have been able to participate in this action, in this summit um, if, if, if we did not utilize the opportunities that technology and the digital economy was putting forward to us. So it's looking at what's available out there and what could be developed further to enable this virtual and real global uh, economy to, to, to benefit everybody. Next slide, please. So there's so what this does is it creates a space, a space for cross pollination of industry, of government agencies, of NGOs, of academia, of of technology experts, of innovators, of of uh, of civic. Uh, civil society to come forward, faith organisations. And one of the big areas that I'm working on at the moment is actually sustainable cities. And if you look at sustainable cities, it's about creating cities and towns and villages that take into account clean energy, take into account clean living, healthy populations and so forth. There's no reason why we wouldn't be able to look at, for example, a sustainable halal city, a space where people are enabl enabled to grow themselves, to grow organic food and to grow the cities. So, so we're, we're in a space that will enable us to actually be the pioneers and instead of playing catch up, to be leaders and to, to, to transform countries and the, the, the outcome that they're achieving. Ms. Saeda, you have two minutes one. left, thank you. Okay, I'm always open to, to helping to create foster partnerships and collaboration which promotes the halal economy, the wider ecosystem. And it's really important that we look at how we build those bridges and give everybody a role within there rather than actually trying to say that this is our area and, and to work in isolation. That's where the world went wrong before and that's what we must not do. So it's working together beneficially for the environment, for, for society, for economies, and, and, to, and to remember that we have a, a hakukul ibad or social responsibility principle, which would enable us all to benefit. Jazakallah khair, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ms. Saida, for your valuable speech. Now, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Irvandi Jasbir from International Islamic University of Malaysia. Welcome, Professor. The stage is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Confirming, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chairperson. Um, thank you for the, uh, thank you, organizing committee for inviting me to this uh, uh, event, World Halal Summit 2020. The topic that I would like to share with all of uh, you today, with all the participants, is uh, halal food forensic post COVID uh, 19. My name is Irwandi Jaswir. Currently, I'm a test international Islamic University of Malaysia, uh, International Institute for Halal Research and Training in HAL, yeah? International Islamic University of Malaysia. Uh, the outline of my presentation will be the uh, introduction to COVID-19. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit on food safety, and then halal food forensics. And then in the end, it's a concluding remarks. Uh, as we know, uh, COVID-19, 
sorry. Espero que anda ahí. Can I see this slide now? Lungs. Uh, it is caused by a virus called coronavirus. It is a big uh, pandemic that we are facing until now. Started uh, end of last year or early this year, and then all over the world. So every country is so facing this problem that may not only cause our health, but it's also give impact on the, the socioeconomy. So, uh, what is a food safety? Yeah. The term food safety describe all practices that are used to keep our food safe. Food safety relies on the joint efforts of everyone involved in our food supply. All along the food chain, from farmers to producers uh, to retailers and caterers, legislation and controls are in place to reduce the risk of contamination. And personally, we each have a role to play as well. So in the context of halal industry, and food safety is very, very much uh, relevant because it is a part of the Taliban aspect. Food poisoning is the implication if we do not take care of the food safety. Food poisoning, also known as a foodborne illness or food-related illness, is caused by eating food that has been contaminated by bacteria, uh, viruses, or parasites. Food can become contaminated by this microorganism at any time before you eat it, including at home, even uh, during this pandemic where the way of delivery of the food is a uh, new norm. The food is coming to our house. What are the causes of the food poisoning? Food poisoning can be caused by bacteria and viruses, parasites, malt, allergens, toxins like mycotoxins, bacterial toxins, and other contaminants such as pesticides, veterinary drugs, heavy metal, etc. So food safety uh, in the relation to the pandemic, the COVID-19 crisis, we can see the sum of the history. Yeah? We know that a previous pandemic like SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2 circulate mainly among the animals. Even if we realize in the, in the beginning of the pandemic COVID-19, uh, there are some uh, um, information that uh, say that um, it, it, it, it is started from the animals in the animal market, the wet animal market in, in Wuhan, China. And then some uh, suspected that, that it may cause by the animals. Some of these viruses are also known to infect humans. The virus is spreading from person to person, mainly via respiratory droplets, that people cough, sneeze, or exhale. The fourth food is not a routine of transmission for this relevant virus. However, transmission is possible if an infected individual touches a food, then another individual collects it and touch their eyes or mucous membranes of the mouth. So this is what we are worried much. Fresh foods may also be exposed to COVID-19 before being frozen, then the transmission may happen. Okay, um, some of that uh, information, current information said that uh, COVID-19 can be transmitted through frozen or refrigerated food, such as cold meat and salmon. 
and the handling of package should be followed by extensive hand washing or sanitizing in order to minimize any risk from touching food potentially exposed to COVID-19. So this is how uh, we see the, the, the importance of, of, of uh, food handling. FDA recommended the sanitizing, uh, sanitation and cleaning of services for food, restaurants, and kitchen. Uh, from uh, this pandemic, we can see that a lot of products are coming up to the market. So one of them is to improve, to enhance our immune system. So from the customer aspect or from customer's point of view, immune booster is one of the way to enhance our immunity so that we can we can uh, make ourselves a much more stronger yeah, against the virus attack. Now we move to the food uh, uh, authentication. As we know that uh, halal material is one of the biggest issues in halal industry, when uh, in in in in the sense of of halalness. Due to the breathtaking technological development today and the diversification of sources, uh, sources acquired globally for food processing and production, numbers, uh, numbers, number of uh, process of products are available in the market. And even there are some uh, new product coming up, like the qualities of future foods uh, and, and, and the meat that, pro that produce uh, in the laboratory, et cetera, et cetera. So this gives us a lot of issues nowadays. And as we know that the source, uh, the concept of halal in Islam is, is from A to Z. Now, after the pandemic, the Taliban aspect should be also included in this, in this uh, uh, concept meaning that uh, all the aspects here, yeah, the, the materials are processing and the way we, we identify the contamination should be uh, in place. There are three main issues, as I mentioned, raw materials, processing and authentication, and all these three need to get our serious attention, especially after the pandemic. Some of critical areas, of course, uh, ingredients derived from pigs and its byproducts that dominates uh, dominating the critical uh, points in halal supply chains such as a pork a lard or animal uh, pig uh, fat or gelatin or the protein of the pigs and of course some uh, others include the enzyme such as rennet or pepsin or trypsin whereby nowadays becomes a very, very important when the vaccines for COVID is, is about to be distributed worldwide. And then the question is whether the enzyme used for the production of the COVID uh, vaccines are uh, halal or derived from the halal sources or not. We know that this jar and then almost all the part of this animal have been commercially used in the market or in the industry. Uh, Professor, so, uh, you have two minutes left. Thank you. So, sorry? You have two minutes left. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so this one is an uh, example of that, how a Muslim country like Indonesia uh, rely uh, very much on the uh, uh, import products such as gelatin uh, from uh, other countries. And then Indonesia, they import close to 3 uh, million kilograms a year. Uh, however, these countries uh, got the potential to uh, produce locally yeah, their own uh, uh, ingredients such as gelatin, flavors, or resin, seasoning, enzyme, etc. And then we have conducted the entire uh, study in Indonesia and we found that the country got the potential. Unfortunately, it is not there in the, in the production stage at the moment. That's why R&D on halal authentication, authentication is very, very important. And I will I go through quickly what we have done, FTR for example, to detect and then electronic nodes and the molecular biology technique. Of course, uh, PCR is among the top priority here, RT-PCR, we study on this. And we published in one article 2017 
when we studied the uh, uh, uh, gelatin containing foods in middle one of the Middle East countries. We also uh, analyzed uh, the difference between alcohol or industrial ethanol and, and hamar or alcoholic beverages using gas chromatography. And then this is a trend in halal authentication nowadays. We should include three things. Number one is data science. Uh, number two, development of device uh, for rapid test because most of the time Muslim countries import yeah, from, from uh, other countries yeah, because we are not capable with, uh, to produce ourselves. And the last one is halal authentication of products in digital platform. And the role of universities is very, very important here because most of the university in Muslim countries still in the stage of, of uh, uh, university research is not yet in the business enterprise. I think that's what I, I can share today. I think uh, the rest is I, I, I make it go through. The last one that I would like to share with you is that um, we like we like to invite all of you to uh, submit your article if you have uh, article related to to halal. Uh, well, to introduce our international journal of halal research, uh, and it is an open access uh, journal. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Professor Terimakasi. It was a pleasure to have you on Six World Halal Summit stage. Now we are connecting to Singapore. I would like to invite Mr. Mohamed Jinnah, Chairman of the World Halal Day, Singapore. Mr. Mohamed, can you hear us? Yep, very much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Um, thank you very much. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. And I would like to sincere uh, gratitude to the organizer, especially with the respected brother, Hassan Ovid, and uh, the people who are organizing such a wonderful event. Thank you very much once again. And uh, I would like to start my presentation. I don't want to go through the data points, what you have been talking earlier. I'm going to be straight to the point. I'm Mohammed Jinnah from Singapore and uh, representing United World Halal Development. I'm a founder and uh, we do World Halal Day every year in uh, different parts of the world. So the topic today, I would like to emphasize and would like to share the data points halal industry and uh, customer Muslims behavior in COVID-19. I'm not going to talk about more data points because the earlier speaker has already covered most of the data points. I don't want to make you again uh, the same repeated uh, topics. Let's talk about what is a uh, Muslim's behavior into the COVID-19 situation. Many people think that halal means the Middle East market is the biggest market. But if you can see the geographical location, the Muslims are representing 1.83 billion, it representing only in Asia Pacific, especially Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan. If you see this number, it represents 1 billion Muslims living in the ASEAN countries, which is a huge market. If you see the the current scenario of OIC country and <coughs> or in the GCC country, the Muslim representing only very small numbers. But the halal segment, if you can see the halal segment, there are 58 million Muslims expected to be into the European countries in 2030. So that's a huge population living in ASEAN, also the huge population living in non-Muslim countries, which is a um, Europe or African region. So the success story, I want to talk about Singapore first. Singapore is not a Muslim country, but you can see most of the, I can say 100% fast food is in halal certified. We don't call it as a self-declaration, Kullu halal. If you go to any country in Middle East, especially Dubai, Saudi, or any country in the GCC, these people call themselves self-declaration Kullu Halal. Whether is it a halal, it's a questionable because a lot of ingredients, it's an open market in a GCC country. But if you come to Singapore, those who are visited Singapore, 
McDonald is 100% certified halal certified halal. What it means halal certification? There is a stringent auditing process will be taking place. The government is monitoring such a auditing process. McDonald, KFC, Burger King, Pizza Hut, you name it. All the international brand in Singapore as a certified halal. What is the population living in Muslims in Singapore? It's just only 14% we are representing. Then why there is a need of halal such a brands? Because the non-Muslim believe that halal is a safety standards. It's no longer as a religious aspect. Halal always representing in Singapore, in Asian country, as a mark of safety standards. That is the reason Singapore is attracting 22 million visitors every year into Singapore, especially ASEAN, Middle East, Europe. They come to Singapore, they enjoy the holiday. 90% of the food production line in Singapore, halal, one of the success story. If you see India, there are 87 to 100,000 products being certified halal. The revenue model in India, it reaching to $6.5 billion in 2017, which is a huge number we are talking about. If you go back to GCC country, India is the main supplier for the food industry, in which 80% of the product now exporting to Middle East and Asia, it's become a halal certified product. So the reason why I'm talking about the non-Muslim country success story, because the non-Muslims believe Halal is no longer as a religious aspect. Halal is a safety aspect. Thailand is one of the best example I can quote always. It's a $1.2 billion growth every year. 160,000 brands, they are certified halal. If you go to any supermarket in Europe, in Asia, you can find made in Thailand product. Why? Because the government feel that halal is a revenue model to the economy. It's a 30% of revenue come from halal certified product and also halal certified related products, whether it's a tourism or cosmetics or pharmaceutical industry. The third important segment in Thailand, they are introducing halal friendly hospitals, medical tourism. So in which they're attracting a lot of Muslim tourists, the medical tourists come to Thailand for Muslim services will get into the conclusion. The fourth one, I wanted to discuss about Australia. Australia, again, not is not a Muslim country, but you can find all the slaughterhouse, 90% the slaughterhouse become a halal slaughterhouse. Then the most important factor is not only for um, uh, meat slaughterhouse, also they are more exporting product about the milk related basis, which is a uh, milk, cheese. The, the product which they are exporting to Middle East which is a huge number. They're contributing 40% of their economy, which is about $670 million exporting milk-based product into the Muslim country. So these are the behavior. And the fifth country, which I would like to talk about, Netherlands. Netherlands is supplying to the meat and meat-based industry to the Muslim country, which is about 1.5 million by 2050, which is a huge market. So the post-COVID impact you now, in, even in Singapore for the past eight months, what I'm seeing, the China, also Korea, Taiwan, these country getting a lot of halal certified product from Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore. So the, the China main population believe that halal is no longer as a Muslim entity. They believe that halal as a standard and also food safety environment. So these are the interesting figures what we are, we are discussing today. Right? The, Okay, someone, someone, can you please mute your mic? I'm getting disturbance. Okay, so if you can see the map here, the Middle East region, GCC country, the consumer behavior, they're looking into the countries of origin, where it's come from. Is it made in Switzerland or made in Portugal, made in the uh, European countries? These are the things, the, the Middle East GCC consumer behavior. If you come to the Singapore and ASEAN country, people look into the product certified by halal. Which organization certifying halal? You can see the two different platforms. No, the consumer behavior is completely changing. Middle East, they don't bother about whether it's a halal, but they bother about which country made from. 
in asean they don't bother about origin of the country they are more concerned about is it halal certified product you can see the behavior of the consumers so we did a lot of uh, uh, analytical report in singapore and singapore based country the consumer behavior is completely different than the muslim country in a non muslim country so i, I would like i'm not going to take a much time i'm going to be end up my slide let move on to the the important factors here okay especially with the asean uh, central asean the people are a lot of muslim country they believe they need halal certified product but there is a huge vacuum into the central east asia huge demand but the supply is nil so we we need to consider why the muslim country and oic country not producing halal product where the non muslim country is producing halal second the behavior of the muslim countries they don't even bother about halal certified where they bother bother about what where is come from made in made of the origin of the country so these are the two behavior we can correlate and we can establish our products into those country there is a huge opportunity in asean country 1 billion people believe halal certified product is the is their meal per day also not only for muslim and the non muslim believe halal is a safety standard so thank you very much i'm not taking a much time because i wanted to give you a very clear um, uh, statement also with a clear identification what we have seen to the market today thank you very much thank you so much mr mohammed jina for being here at the world halal summit stage today with okay i'm losing this with 11 sessions participations of 65 speakers from all around the world physically and virtually we are ending the three days program with closing ceremony right now we would like to invite the secretary of general of simic his excellency ihsan övit ihsan övit to give his speech Mr. Abid please welcome on stage We would like to thank our speakers of the last session. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your valuable speeches. Associate Professor Mr. Yüksel Okşak from Uludağ University Turkey Mr. Gökhan Dalgan 
lecturer from Kütahya Dumlupınar University, Turkey. And also we would like to thank our virtual speakers who showed their presence at World Halal Summit stage today. Distinguished speakers, participants, uh, uh, Mr. Zafer Soylu, Head of uh, Turkish Accreditation Councils, Mr. Yunus Ete, uh, President of Council of the World Halal Summit, and uh, our dear brother and sister from different countries, and our participants from the on online from different countries. Uh, first of all, I want to thank to all speakers because they are do did a good job for us. Uh, they prepared a uh, very interesting speech and they uh, took a lot of time for us. Big thanks to all of them. And uh, during these three days, uh, only two speakers is not with us because one is from America is what's late time. For the next time, you should be careful about the time of the countries. Some country can be go to sleeping, but we're still here. Some countries uh, in the early morning, they could not attend. Uh, we have to be careful about the, if there is a still virtual meetings. Uh, another second one from Turkey has uh, said, uh, some health problems he couldn't attend. Again, thanks all of them for, for their uh, support and their uh, active participation and active presentation and inshallah we will benefit from them. End of day, uh, the, uh, today we will, have, we will have a declaration. Uh, Mrs. Sajide Barçin will read our declaration, Istanbul declaration for this year. Uh, for this year, we have 15 countries, different countries, the speakers, uh, between, uh, we can say, 60, 65, if you, we include the opening sessions. Uh, totally, I want to give some statistics. Uh, our work, Halal Summit, uh, followed by the 9,217 uh, followers from all over the world in 50, 55 countries uh, via YouTube, Zoom, and other social medias. Uh, it's big reach for us. Uh, thanks all uh, us, uh, active followers. I don't want to say the name of the country, but uh, inshallah in the final report, uh, the numbers will be shown in the report of the World Halal Summit. I want to special thanks to who active in the commission preparation the summit. Uh, first to Dilek Sulun, because she was responsible coordinator of the World Halal Summit. But uh, she is not alone. She has a, a good good bosses. Is Eileen Shengu. Uh, she support him her uh, very big support from Eileen. Eileen is here. Thank you, Eileen. We have a good designer, uh, Fulya Kibar. She, she did best. But they have a nice boss, Yunus Ete. Thanks to him. From SMIC, Yasin Zulfikarol and Mohamed Ali Sheikh did their best. But Dilek is the best. Thank you, Dilek. Are you here? We will see you next year, the better one. Because this year, this level, next year, we're waiting the high level for all organizations. But be careful about the number of the speakers in the sessions. Six speakers is long, because people are not concentrating and not, we didn't receive any questions because of 
many speakers. Thanks again for all of you. Thanks to Sajide for three, three days. She helped us. Now uh, she will read our declaration. After declaration, we have a family photo for all, all of you. And thanks again. Thanks for your coming and participating and following us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum once more. Now I am reading the World Halal Summit 2020 Declaration. World Halal Summit 2020, Istanbul, under the theme of Halal for All, Halal in All Aspects, from Production to Consumption, supported by leading organizations in their relevant sectors, brought academicians, researchers, stakeholders, professionals, together with policymakers and pioneers of halal industry in both online and offline platforms by the attendance of prominent speakers in halal field throughout its sessions, the speakers focused on halal market and halal quality infra infrastructure, halal standardization, new challenges and opportunities, OIC and CIMIC standards on conformity assessment, the role of Islamic finance in production to consumption, halal lifestyle, halal tourism, recent developments in halal technology, halal products in daily life, halal pharmaceuticals, halal and authenticity testing, and recent developments and opportunities in halal industry. As World Halal Summit Organizing Committee, we hereby declare, first, noting OIC and CIMIC standards in halal food cosmetics, tourism, conformity assessment, supply chain and other relevant fields, role of CIMIC in halal quality infrastructure, importance of the clear ident identification of the role of public and private institutions in halal issues, certification and accreditation practices as per OIC and CIMIC standards, fraud certificates problem in halal certification, importance, needs, and recommendations for capacity building in OIC and non-OIC countries in halal issues. Entirely promotes the collaborative work done under the Standards and Metrology Institute for Islamic Countries to produce standards on halal issues that relate to products services, certification, and accreditation for OIC and non-OIC region globally and invites all relevant parties to use and implement OIC and CIMIC standards. Two, taking into consideration the role of Islamic finance on investment, growth, and opportunities in integration between the halal economy and Islamic finance, the role of Islamic fintech in financial inclusion, sustainable halal ecosystem, and the role of Islamic finance, fintech-based financial inclusion, and bank risk-taking by looking evidence from OIC countries. Highlights the needs for financial inclusion by fintech technologies governed by the principles laid down by Islamic, Islamic rules. Supports the using of fintech for financial inclusion by all relevant parties and especially by actors of the halal industry. Three, considering the importance of awareness of halal lifestyle and growing risk of anti-halal movements in Europe, the role of halal food and the importance of halal earnings in halal lifestyle, new product development and safe tourism in halal tourism sector, expectations of Muslims from the Muslim travel market and new opportunities for halal tourism, impact of artificial intelligence on halal food inspection and certification, remote assessment and audits in field of halal, verification and authenticity of halal certificates, food traceability in agriculture and halal, underlines that the govern, growing interest to halal in tourism services and halal lifestyle with new opportunities, needs, trends, and tools 
bring the need for clear identification and standardization of the halal tourism products and services, supports the use of technological tools to improve the halal conformity assessments and activities, and continue the audits and assessments under the COVID-19 pandemic conditions, condemns anti-halal movements and Islamophobic actions against Muslim consumers and Islamic rules. Four, also noting needed standards to regulate the many different types of pharmaceuticals, stakeholders' roles in instilling respect towards informed decisions on halal pharmaceutical, multi-aware analysis on gelatin spe specification, evaluation of halal testing practices, food additives, and halal food preservative in terms of Islamic law. Put emphasis on the importance of the scientific studies as an imp input to the development of standards on halal pharmaceuticals, testing methods, and other relevant issues. Condemns any attempts to misuse the halal for any purpose. Five, recommends this declaration to political representatives, religious officials, producers, service providers, scientific and academic communities, halal certification bodies, institution accreditation, standardization, and financial institutions, trade and tourism chambers. Six, reminds halal is for all in aspects from production to consumption. Seven, thanks to all organizers, speakers, supporters, e-exhibitors, and participants for their kind contributions. Istanbul, December 23, 2020. Thank you. So we are ending the three days program right now. We would like to thank you all for your participating. Hope to see you next year in 7th World Halal Summit. Can we have you all for a family photograph session? We are waiting you next year, inshallah, uh, 25, 28, November 2020, 21, World Halal Summit and 8th Oise Halal Expo.
Power Events ekibini sahneye çağırıyoruz. Aile fotoğraf çekecek. Arkadaşlar, Discover olarak sahneye lütfen. Evet. VHS ve Expo Team. Hepinizi sahneye davet ediyoruz. VHS